Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. Hope you enjoy. Story number one: To Uphold Duty, written by JCB112. It was all over, but she didn't mind. A liar was an industry sector administrator. In this era of the near post scarcity, in this period of history where human prosperity reached heights previously impossible to even conceive of, this sector was but one of thousands, tens of thousands, more like it, devoted to the insatiable drive of the human industrial complex. Yet on this day, on a day seeming like many others, the administrator would see her last morning cycle. She volunteered for this. She wanted to send a message, a clear-cut declaration from humanity. A message that read similarly to the UN Declaration of Sapient Rights. Humanity shall henceforth, now and forever, stand against the forces of tyranny. To whomever approaches on the sanctity and the dignity of the sapient, know that humanity will not tire, will not stop, will never falter in our resolve to uphold these universal rights, which we hold as fundamental, irrefutable, and self-evident. Alaya wasn't in the military. She had no interest in such affairs. But in circumstances so specific such as this, she knew no one could do what needed to be done but herself. As every human was, she was willing to fight if push came to shove. This was just her way of doing so. She had seen the horrors of the Lacolades had committed on the aliens of Andromeda. The news feeds had just been released not a week ago. It was with this that humanity had collectively declared war on these cosmic horrors, even if it meant their sights would be distracted from the actions of Andromeda and every neighboring galaxy to focus their attentions on that of the Milky Way. Scientists have long speculated why the Milky Way was so devoid of life. Perhaps this was it. Perhaps the Lacolades had left it in this empty, lifeless state, and Earth had developed life far too quickly for them to come back and finish the job. And so a liar, a vintage music playing in the far distance of her lonesome station, stood in front of her massive view screens, her visage broadcasting to the rapidly encroaching Lacolades. This is Administrator Alaya Volkran of the United Nations of Earth and Luna. You are encroaching on human territory. This will be your one and final warning. Do not approach us, or you and your fleet shall be intercepted with the appropriate force. This is all. No response. She expected this. A part of her stirred, her heart shuddered in place as the miasmic clouds of inky darkness continued ever forward. She knew that on board were hundreds of thousands of aliens, all suffering, all long since converted and in perpetual anguish on board these organic leviathans, all of them having lost their right to self-determination ages ago. Now present for their sadistic satisfaction of the Lacolades. She'd lay them to rest today. She'd lay everyone who encroaches on the small chunk of human territory to rest. They were foolish to start this war. Perhaps there was a better way to approach this. Perhaps it was plain all dumb to suddenly act as the center of attention, distracting the Lacolades away from their current sadistic endeavors in the neighboring galaxies in the local cluster. But even if they were able to spare a single sapient, a single minute of torment from these sadists, it would be worth it. The sacrifice would be well worth it. She heard the announcements. The aliens were bruised, battered, and hopeless. They needed a new rallying cry. They needed an example to be set. They needed to see that the Lacolids were mortal. Little was known about the exotic materials that made up the Lacolid constructs. It was, for all intents and purposes, however, impervious to contemporary and conventional munitions, projectiles, and even direct energy weapons. Yet there was one weapon that the most exotic of materials could not hold up against. The power of the sun. Or more specifically, the power of the sun going supernova. And as administrator, she not only had the ability to do so, but the authority to do so as well. 
A liar. Another voice made itself known within a control room. Let the military handle this. Just give us the command keys and... No, a liar. I'm a civil servant of the United Nations of Earth and Luna. I have an obligation to remain at my post until I am dismissed. And unless you have an order from the Quadrant Overseer or the UNEL Department of Industry, then I shall remain at my post, fulfilling my constitutional obligations. I... The voice straightened up. Yes, Administrator. May the spirit of humanity be with you, ma'am. And to you, Captain. A single nod from the Administrator was all that was necessary. Before she flinched. Her voice cracked for a moment. Goodbye, Michael. I love you. Terminate connection. Darkness started to cloud at the very edges of the system. The view of Andromeda was clouded and obstructed by this unknown force. Her senses began screaming at her. The light flashed, the alarms bled, as the administrator let out a deep sigh. Her eyes strained, focused, dead set on a single command line she'd written up hours prior. Everything was ready. The Lacolette seemed to hesitate somewhat before approaching. Perhaps they noticed just how advanced their new prey truly was. An entire solar system turned into a forge of industry. Worlds gone, replaced with large stellar constructs of varying sizes and makes. Millions of ships varying cargo from one station to another in a series of long, unending lines, forming what can be superficially described as conveyor belts in the midst of space. The star itself was contained, placed inside of what seemed to be a massive stellar engine, one that powered the whole system, one that was one keystroke away from taking them all into oblivion. Part of a liar believed the Lacolettes would turn away upon seeing this, and they almost seemed to, until they didn't. As they began approaching, swaths of ships resembling undulating tentacles connected to a central miasmic mass of darkness. So this was it. United States Declaration of Sapient Rights, Article 5, Clause 2. All citizens of the United Nations of Earth and Luna shall commit to the defense of humanity should the need arise. For the sanctity of the sapient, for the dignity of humanity, for the continuation of the creed of civilization, no sacrifice is too great, no deed is too small in the upholding of the self evident truth. I am Sector Administrator Elijah Lee, UNEL National Identification Number 22412541. Today, the 21st of May, 2971, at 12.23pm, you now stand at time. I commit to record the fulfillment of my obligations to the United Nations Charter. Nothing was left of the system. Nothing was left of the invasion fleet. Nothing but the commitment of humanity, to the preservation of the dignity of the sapient. End of story. Story number two. Humanity's Soul, written by Cromper 69. Every creature in this universe has a soul. Some races devote their souls to certain fields, such as engineer souls, or doctor souls, or the souls of soldiers. Yet, when humans were discovered, their souls were an enigma. We soul-seers were able to see a race's souls and determine what they will be useful for. Yet, when we dove into their soul, we were scared. No, horrified. To explain why we were scared, we explain how our ability works. When we soul-see, we look back into a race's history and determine their future. For that done... We looked at humanity's soul. We saw fighting. Fighting from the earliest recollection of memory. For the fighting death was everywhere. Bodies and bodies stacked on each other. Leaders discussing war and insults hurled at each other. Yet, for every death, a life was saved by the kindness of others. Through all of their history, they hated and loved each other. Killed and married another. We thought it not possible from such a race. When we questioned them on their history, they gladly explained their entire history and their philosophy, or rather, different philosophies and religions. 
We are going to have a nightmare, a nightmare of politics awaiting us. Their soul, humanity's soul, is that of hate and love, an ever-changing relationship. End of story. The Big Mistake, written by AIS. In the year 2021, engineer Michael Porter finally got his new request approved to work on the ELINP project. The ELINP derives from extreme light infrastructure, nuclear physics, and, in simple terms, is the world's first 10 petawatt laser in the world. Two years later, he came up with a theory to use this big-ass laser as a way to send signals into space, but with such intensity that the beam would pierce the fabric of the universe and come out at the designated distance, faster than the speed of light. So extremely long-range, almost instant communications. The advantage of such technologies were obvious, so NASA got involved. Since the ELINP laser was built in an underground facility and not really meant for sending signals into space, NASA brought Michael Porter in Florida and put him in charge of building another big-ass laser, but this time dedicated to put his theory into practice. Americans, being American, decided to build a laser even stronger than the ELINP. So, the Extreme Long Range Extreme Light Communicator, or the ELRELI project, was born. The world's first 50 petawatt laser, equipped with an advanced targeting system that could compensate for Earth's rotation, for the target speed, and so on. It could send a beam that could hit a nickel placed on the surface of the moon. The most simple way to send data using the ELRELI was Morse code, but there were other options, like transmitting into binary simply by converting the on-off into 0-1. Decimals or hexadecimals were also possible soon. We had a way to communicate, but no one to communicate with. Sure, we used this to communicate to rovers on Mars, to space missions, but still, we felt like Alexander Graham Bell must have felt like. We had a phone, but no one to talk to. So the next step was the following. We built a receiver, like a big satellite dish, around the ELRELI. When the ELRELI was not used to communicate to our own equipment, like rovers and shuttles, it was pointed at all known planets we discovered, one at a time, and it would send a simple message, like, hello, in binary towards the surface, and we would listen for a response. We figured that if anyone would receive our signal, they would send back something similar to the location of the transmitting device. Two years it took to go through all planets we knew about. When we finished transmitting to all the planets we had discovered so far, we also started to transmit to locations where we only suspected planets might be. We also sent signals to spaces between the planets and stars, into the blackest void, aiming to reach beyond the observable universe. Years passed, technology advanced, other ELRELI devices were built, including one on our first colony on Mars. Smaller, similar devices were built, more efficient, designed for just communication between Mars and Earth or between Earth and space missions. The original ELRELI had only one job, to send our hello into space and to listen for a reply. It was in the year 2059 that the reply came back. It was a similar signal, an extreme light beam broken into segments. It copied the original signal that hello we sent in binary, and had some additional signal at the end. We translated it as two times two. Amidst the chaos and excitement that broke out, we finally managed to send back an answer. Four. So started our first communications with a race that called themselves the Mari. Right from the start, it was clear that their technology was leaps and bounds ahead of ours, but it was also clear that they were friendly and willing to share their knowledge with us. Communication was slow and frustrating via the ELRELI, but because we were different species, binary remained the only language that both civilizations could understand. We started to exchange information about us. Among the first things exchanged were the periodic tables from each civilization. As a result, we found out that they too were carbon-based life forms. Apparently, they were smaller than us, about a quarter of our mass, 
and a bit different. More legs, more arms. But their atmosphere was pretty similar in composition to ours. And, apparently, with their advanced medicine, they had a span of life of 600 years on average. This discussion led us to the first present we received from the Mari. They sent us a very complicated chemical formula, but only with elements from our own periodic table. The Mari were declared unconditional allies when our scientists discovered the formula was for a very interesting substance that would cure cancer, amongst other 20 or so diseases that still plague our civilization. After this came ideas for clean energy, formulas for new types of building materials, lighter, stronger, and more durable. They sent a map of the stars between them and us. They sent us ways to accelerate the terraforming of Mars. It was like they couldn't send us all that they knew fast enough, and we couldn't decipher all the information that was coming fast enough. We had thousands of scientists from all over the world working on all the information they were sending. The communications were slow, and the volume of information so large that many mistakes were made. From deciphering wrong to overlapping of projects, to missing bites caused by different cosmic events, one passing comet between Earth and their planet caused such a distortion of the message that instead of a formula for a material that could be used for spaceship's windows, what we received and deciphered was the formula for some type of biodegradable styrofoam. Ten years after we made contact by phone with them, we asked them for a way to make communications faster. We asked them to meet us. They responded that while they did have FTL ships, they couldn't spare one at the moment to make the journey towards Earth. Even with their faster ships, they calculated it would take almost a year for the trip between us. And apparently, they were engaged in a war. And all ships and resources were directed towards the war effort. The news about the Mari being at war got to the world's leaders in their mother of all turmoil. All talk about unconditional allies was forgot. All information transmitted towards them was stopped. The teams of scientists working on the data that we had from the Mari now all had at least two military observers each. Paranoia was starting to rise its ugly head. Alarmist questions and conspiracy theories were running rampant. What if we are next? It was a mistake to send that signal into space. They want us to develop the Earth, to do all the work. And after that, they'll come and take it from us. The cure for cancer causes autism, and so on. Thankfully, not everyone panicked. The chief scientist in charge of the project, ELRELI, sent back a simple question. Who are you fighting, and why? The answer that came back was... Expansive. Ten years ago, we were the first life form outside their system that they had ever contacted. Or, to be fair, that contacted them. They intercepted our signal by chance with one of their planet satellites. Then they made a device similar to our ELR real eye to answer us, and even copied our method of calling in the dark, searching for other civilizations. With their more advanced technology, they achieved results faster than us. In less than a year after they started broadcasting into the dark, they received an answer. But it was not a friendly hello. It was a fleet of hollowed asteroids. Inside, swarms of bugs-like creatures. On the surface of the meteors, giant plasma spewing bugs acted as ship-to-ship -ship weapons and propulsion. A race of unall-consuming roaches had found them, tracking their signal, and was set on devouring them. And everyone on that lived on their planet. All attempts of communication were rebuked by the bugs. They were merciless and implacable. Their preferred method of attack was to crash into the Mari ships, pierce their hulls, and swarm them with overwhelming numbers. Then, using those ships to land them the planets below and to start their cycle of eating and multiplying, until everything was consumed. After that, to break the planet into media-like chunks, and launched themselves again in space, in search of other planets. Now, about eight years into the fight for their survival, the Mari were down to a single planet, their home world. They will survive as long as possible, but their chances for them to repel the voracious enemy was almost zero. They will continue to send us all their knowledge, so that we could have a fighting chance if the bugs ever find us too. The message ended with a question. 
Would you like to know more? If before this message we were afraid, now we were afraid and ashamed. But now we had an enemy, and our unconditional allies were on the verge of extinction. The people that started a new golden age of science on Earth were dying for eight years now, and never asked us for anything. Instead, they gave us all they could. We asked them for weapons, ships, engine designs. We asked them for FDL. We asked for everything we thought that could give us a chance against those bugs. And we promised them that the first warship we will make by these designs will come to their aid, filled with volunteers. That must have elicited some bitter smiles from their part. They answered that they already lost close to 5,000 ships. One more would not make any difference. Stay safe, they transmitted. Stay safe, grow strong, and don't repeat our mistakes of trusting the universe is a kind and friendly as you are. Still, they began transmitting us all the data we needed for an FTL engine, for ship-to-ship -ship weapons, ship designs, formula for hull materials, air recycling engines, and whatnot. So much data that all other projects were put on hold. Everyone was working on deciphering the data needed for the ship. The ship that we were arrogantly named Cavalry. Thousands of contractors were hired to build it. It was a project that united the world. A futile gesture, probably, but a gesture to express our gratitude for all the Mari had done for us. The cavalry started to be built even before the information was finished coming through. Sure, errors were bound to happen. Like after we started building the hull, the airlock seemed too big and not compatible with our other ships and space stations. So we corrected them and made them smaller. Living quarters, again, they were too big and comfortable, a waste of space. Storage for weapons it is then. The main weapon of the ship seemed kind of weak, like it would take some time to pierce the hull like this, so we made them bigger. Maybe that's a human thing. There is no such thing as an overkill when it comes to bugs. So we added other types of weapons too. There was so much unused space all around the hull, ready to be filled with guns from a sleek, smooth-surfaced hull we made a hedgehog of a ship, bristling with weapons, railguns, missile ports, point defenses. Also, some nukes, because, uh, because, uh, thick bugs, that's why. Life supporting systems. We had basically to install like ten of them to ensure that it could sustain the crew. We knew that they were smaller than us and obviously consumed less air, water, food. But we had to install ten of everything that we'd related to life support. Air filtering pumps, water recycling, hydroponics. All these had to expand and multiply. Luckily, the design of the ship was spacious enough that we had room for everything. In six months, cavalry was launched. It had a crew of 1,350, all volunteers. Total length was almost 800 meters. With the hull from the new lighter material, it still had 120,500 tons. It had taken quite the toll on our resources as the planet. But there was not a human on the entire Earth and Mars that did not feel filled with pride as the cameras transmitted the launch around the planet. We watched with tears in our eyes as the cavalry galloped towards our friends, the Mari. Our friends said the trip between the planets would take almost a year, but the cavalry pushed its engines to maximum. The trip only took four months. Maybe the initial estimate was based on the older type of engine. Maybe our modifications made the engines better. The reason was not yet clear. But everyone sighed with relief when the cavalry finally arrived in the Mari system and found Mari ships still fighting around their home planet, facing what looked like a cloud of meteors. It was a strange kind of battle, with the sleek Mari ships constantly dodging the meteorites and their bug plasma spews while trying to coordinate their fire two or three at a time, against one single meteorite. Even if the Mari ships were clearly more maneuverable than the bug-infested meteorites, the sheer number of enemies was so great that the cloud of meteorites was actually chasing the ships and pushing them towards the Mari planet. The cavalry didn't waste any time or thought. 
It accelerated towards the meteorite cloud, all weapons hot. It reached weapons range in two minutes flat and began spitting missiles, real gun slugs, and high-powered laser beams like of the wrath of God. It took full advantage of the elements of surprise and drove straight through the cloud of meteors, getting even a point of fences in range and firing those guns too. It came out the other side of the cloud, after cracking three of the larger meteorites and countless other smaller ones. The space between the meteorites was now filled with debris, bugs, and various bug remains. No meteor had successfully crashed into the cavalry's hull. The human ship turned and made another strafing run by the enemy formation, this time keeping on the edge of the meteor cloud. A few plasma shots from the bugs managed to hit them though, but they did not penetrate the hull. It just corroded about half an inch deep on the surface. The hull was 20 inch thick, so it was no immediate danger. That did not mean that the captain was not pissed as hell that the bugs dirtied his brand new ship. He initiated a transmission on all available channels towards the Mari ships to stand back and gave the order to launch nuke number one, pet named Gaia. The missile with the nuke looked no different than any of the dozens of other missiles launched in the same instant by the cavalry. It beelined straight towards the biggest meteorite in the cloud impacted in a cloud of red fire and red dust, followed by a beautiful, visible shockwave that turned to dust all the meteorites in the immediate vicinity. Cheers went out on the human ship as almost half of the remaining enemies were pulverized or at least cracked. Not wanting to leave the enemy a chance to sober up, the cavalry charged once more into the fray. The Mari ships, invigorated by the shift of power, rejoined the battle and followed the cavalry's wake. This was when the human captain noticed that the surviving Mari ships were all small ones, barely corvette type. If even that, the cavalry would pass by the enemies, hit like a sledgehammer, cracking and pulverizing all the bigger meteors. And in its wake, the Mari ships would nimbly concentrate their fire on the still active enemies, giving the finishing blows with surgical precision. Two hours later, the meteors were all cracked and emptied of their foul contents, and for the first time in more than ten years, the human and the Mari managed to open communication channel with audio and video. After all the pleasantries were exchanged, in the excited discussions that followed, the humans found out with astonishment that a really big mistake was made. When receiving and deciphering the instructions for the ship due to our communication, switching from binary to hexadecimal and back, we ended up multiplying everything in the hull by 16. 16 times bigger, 16 times thicker, and from this everything about the ship was modified. This explained all the extra space inside, the need for 10 times more life-supporting systems, all the space in the hull for extra weapon pods. Everything made sense now. A big mistake, an expensive mistake, and in the end, a happy one. The commander of the cavalry just made a series of grunts from which the crew managed to understand that, Ha! Huh, I guess size does matter. End of story. Story number one, Throwing a Very Human Ability, written by Stumpy Jim. Why are human arms so small? Traxon turned to look at his friend, his long arms draped over the table in front of him. He followed his gaze and saw that a human just entered the pub, hands in pockets. Of all the bizarre things humans have, resist, do, live, or whatever, why is it that they have the shortest arms of all the GR? I don't know, Traxon huffed as he turned his eyes to his own arms, dangling low to the ground. He scanned around and found that everyone else had to have long arms. I would pity them for having difficulty reaching for things, but then they jump so well I doubt they would even have that as a problem. Yeah, Traxon rubbed his head. Wonder why that is. The two went back to their drinks off for a time, relaxing until the stool stood next to their table and up hopped the human. Hello, the human beamed and placed a long straw to his mouth and sucked on it for a time. Heard you were talking about me. Traxon frowned for a moment. How do you know we, we were talking about you? Human hearing, the human chuckled, sucking on the tube straw again. Right, right. 
Traxon's friend's eyes narrowed, then looked around the table to see what the straw was attached to. Traxon was too curious about the odd straw, so he leaned over the table for a peek. He blinked with disbelief when he saw the massive keg the straw was feeding out of it. Yeah, the stuff you've got here is a bit weak, the human shrugged, but I guess you can't help it. When beer is classed a grade B controlled substance, so uh, I make do, right? Traxon and his friend stared at the human, shocked. That brings the drink notorious for binge drinking with the youth was being drank by the keg by a human, and said human, thinking it was too weak. What were you talking about? The human asked. Oh, Traxon's friend cleared his throat. Right, I was wondering why humans have such small arms. Small? The human frowned, glancing at his arm. I suppose it is small, comparative, but there is a reason to it. What would that be? Well, uh, it goes back to the hunter-gatherer days of humanity, the human began. As you know, unlike most other predator types of sentience of the GR, we humans are endurance predators. Chase prey all day until they're exhausted, able to keep from overheating with sweat glands and so on. Right, right, everyone knows that, Traxon nodded, taking a sip from his glass. But what do the short arms have to do with that? I'm getting to that, the human smirked. All of us sentients evolved to have similar features, to use tools and advance, right? Well, the primary tool humans used in the beginning was a spear. You mean pointy sticks? Traxon's friend scratched his nose. Why would you need that? Spears were used for hunting primarily, and war when needed, using them to stab and kill our prey after we corner it. Makes sense. But you see, in a lot of cases trapping our prey was very difficult, since most of the time they congregated in large open areas. They would just run away far enough so that we could do nothing to them and for the carnivore to attack us instead. What does any of this have to do with your small arms? Traxon's friend asked impatiently. I'm getting there, the human smiled. You see, a good advantage of a spear is reach, a long stick and a stick them into the pointy bit. But what's better about them is that they soar through the air faster than we can run, even better with fletching, which then led to the bow and arrow. So what we would do as hunters was throw our spears at our prey to impale them with the spears, getting them. Traxon and his friend looked at each other, then the human. Sorry, uh, throw. Traxon worked the strange word in his mouth, finding the oddness of the human language working in his mouth. What do you mean? Right, sorry, the human laughed. I guess you wouldn't know that, since your bodies aren't really built for it. It's the reason why darts aren't in these places. Man, I miss playing darts. Can you explain then? The human frowned for a moment, then left Traxon and his friend. Later, he came back with a knife in his hand. It's really better with a demonstration. Would you get up, hold this knife, and chuck it as hard as you can at the headboard above the counter where you are? Traxon, just as he was told, stood up from the chair, taking the knife in hand. Right, so what you want to do is to try and make it stick in the wood, okay? Traxon didn't believe it was possible, not from where he was standing, even with his long arms. There was no way they were long enough to reach the wood and make the knife stick. Pulling his arm back, he moved his arm forward and letting the knife go. As expected, it didn't go far, clattering to the ground. Good try, and, but don't feel bad. You and many of the other sentients don't have bodies built for such a maneuver. The human said, and he went to pick up the knife on the floor. He came back and faced the wood board about the counter, where he told Traxon to throw the knife. I'm fuzzy on the exact details, but human arms are built for explosive output, adding the maximum amount of energy when throwing something. It's reason why humans can throw things that can go 100 miles an hour, like a baseball. I believe that's about, uh, 367 ulls. No way. Traxon's friend shook his head in disbelief. Over three times the urban road speed limit applied to an object that you throw? Yeah, the human nodded, his face calm. I can show you. Traxon and his friend watched the human, along with the rest of the pub, since the little display a few moments ago, wind up his arm, holding the knife by the blade. Then the arm blurred with a frightening speed, expended outwards, knife no longer in his hand when it stopped. At the same time, there was a metal shuddering sound coming from the counter. There were gasps of shock and awe when everyone saw that the knife was stuck in the board tip first. See, human arms are built to efficiently transfer power into objects. So that if we throw something, it can go far and fast. 
the human said as he went to take the knife out the board, tossing it up in his hand. It's not exactly the best thing to throw. The weight is weird and unbalanced. Now you can imagine how much damage a spear can do to an animal or some other living creature when thrown by a human. Traxon and many of the patrons of the pub looked at their own large, long arms, shuddering at the thought of being impaled and killed by a long stick. Humans! The audible sigh came from the crowd. They're so weird. End of story. Story number two. The Ape, the Alien, and the Underappreciated Reptile. Written by Louis Le Diamond. My nerves were screaming at me as I boarded the human transport. A human frigate patiently waited outside to guard me from the aldrich and unknown horrors of the universe. It was my first day as the Vierda ambassador to Earth. I was more than qualified, but these humans were new, unknown, even with my animal friend Feda and my closest friend Jupia at my side. I could not help but feel isolated. Feda was a flying reptile from my planet. Nobody understood my connection with her. An animal and a sentient, bonding. It was practically unheard of. But something about this reptile was friendly and inviting. A complete lack of judgment and expectation filled her heart. With the first contactor having made a stellar introduction to the humans, it was now my job to secure a peace deal and act as an ambassador and diplomat to these strange apes. The journey to Earth was long and uneventful. The horrors of the cosmos were sufficiently deterred by what the human technicians described as their massive fuck-off cannons, as to decide to simply watch our every move and not drag us into the unending void. Well, it wasn't entirely uneventful. On the first day of the journey, I was woken by Jupiter for breakfast, and what the funny apes called coffee a delicious beverage that made electricity course through my body. As we enjoyed this exotic beverage, Jupia's voice filled my ears. Kelty, I still don't know why you brought that thing with you. She gestured cautiously at Feda. Feda was a Tadari, with her twin wings as long snout and her beautiful colors on her scales. The humans hadn't even questioned her presence. I could only hope their silence was born of fear. That thing has a name... I brought her because she brings me comfort, and frankly, these primates are fairly poorly understood. I'm nervous. But you're not scared they might eat I, uh, her? If they try, I'll firmly stand my ground that they cannot. I'm more worried she might fly off into the Earth's skies, to be honest. As my final words lingered, the hiss of the door to the small mess hall opened, and the same human technician who described the fuck-off cannons to me stepped inside. He was young for his species, with hair that looked like furry sand and eyes that matched the waves that would wash over it. His name, as I recalled, was John. And a second round of red fruits they called apples. He took one of the apples and offered it to Feda, who gleefully dug into it and ripped it apart. He rubbed his hand gently over her scales, much to her delight, as she tore into the fruit. Jupia looked at the ape in confusion as he continued stroking Feda's colorful scales, this is a beautiful, uh, bird thing you have, Mr. Kalti. What's its name? Um, her name is Feta. You don't plan on eating her, do you? No. Why would I eat your pet? Jupia broke her veil of silence. His what? Well, I assume she's his pet, right? I mean, she seems to stay around him, and he has a name for her. Now you're saying you've seen this sort of behavior before? Well, yeah. Just about everyone on Earth has or has had a pet before. I have an overly dramatic husky back home named Juniper. Wait, everyone has an animal that they just befriend? Yeah. Doesn't the rest of the galaxy? Human societies are practically built on it. They even do jobs for us. No, nobody does that. Galti had to fight off the government to smuggle this reptile to the ship. Suddenly, my journey's isolation and my fear for Feda seems much less. If all the humans on Earth could understand my love for this animal, maybe... This job would be way more interesting and fun. End of story. Little bird buddy, Jimmy, Agent 007. Nothing quite wakes you up from a bad dream, like a human kicking down your door in his underwear while brandishing a wrench that weighs more than you. 
I could see his predatory eyes searching the room for a target before finally settling on me once he was sure nothing else was in the room. Are you right? I heard screaming. The intensity in his voice was palpable. I'm okay. I hopped out of bed, the nest pouch hanging on the wall, and stretched my wings. I just had bothersome thoughts while asleep. I'm sorry if they woke you. Sometimes she must study humans for a long time to pick up on the subtle shifts in their demeanor. This was not one of those times, as the tense body language ready for action softened into an almost delicate grace. He leaned the door back on its frame before nearly sitting on one of my chairs, remembering the door wasn't the only thing not built for humans and stopped. Don't apologize for your nightmares, my little bird buddy. The deep, soothing voice was almost enough to put me back to sleep. Tell me what's wrong. Humans don't usually have nightmares unless something is really bothering us. My son is in the hospital. He needs a transfusion, and I'm the only compatible donor. A treatment we learned from human doctors, as it was explained to me. But the next transport isn't for another week. It was hard to say out loud. The warrior felt almost choking the words. Seeing such concern and alien eyes for a life so disconnected from him was strange. Will he be able to hold on until then? Doctors say it's possible. My voice told him that just how bad the odds were. The problem is, uh, the government office said that they can't send an unscheduled transport for a medical emergency if it's not for someone at the outpost. I already tried calling to get them to make an exception. I pointed my beak in the direction of the comms unit. Those stupid pieces of... He almost choked himself with anger before stopping and going to the comms. I didn't see how he would get anywhere with them, but I wasn't going to try and stop him. Humans had a way of doing things different and getting results. This is Manny O'Malley. I need an emergency transport sent to Mining Outpost 457. Send it immediately. His blunt order took the operator by surprise, but they soon recovered. I checked your comms unit code. We are aware of the emergency you're referring to, but the government procedure hasn't changed. We can only dispatch emergency transports to a location of the emergency. The operator jumped back in annoyance. Manny sighed with a heavy breath. Then he took a deep breath. Listen here. Either you send us a transport or you can schedule one for yourself. Because if anything happens to that boy, I am going to hunt you down and pluck you bald. Then deep fry you in 15 different secret spices and feast on your carcass in front of your co-workers until... The line was cut and the operator squawked in fear and hit the button. I never wanted to know what else would have been said had the conversation continued. I uh, overdid it. Manny grunted in disappointment. He was worth a try. I would have let out a long, sad whistle had Manny not whipped his head around at me to glare into my soul. We're not done yet. Get your bag off the wall. Meet me in the landing pad. He stood up and shoved the door aside to let in the first rays of daylight. You'll get your ride. I wondered what he had planned. Humans were known to be quite adept at building vehicles from scrap. But something that could fly to the city would probably have taken until the regular transport arrived to build. I'd never find out. When I got to the landing pad, I saw Manny dressed in work clothes. He was wearing a tool harness covered in pouches hanging from his chest. On the ground was the back harness for mining equipment, but the mining equipment has gone, leaving only the metal frame. What is going on? I asked as he pushed bottles into holsters in his rigging. The warning labels in every language but human one explaining how toxic it was. Getting my emergency drinks ready. Manny took my pocket nest and attached it to the rig. Get in. I did as instructed, and then I hoisted up into his back. I wondered if we were going to jump on a passing transport or something. Take this. He handed me a navigational display. Humans tend to veer off course over long distances. The display was set to the beacon of the main colony. Wait, what? Hold on, little bird buddy. I've got this. Manny shouted as he started to move forwards. The pace kept increasing as I bounced in the nest on his back. And suddenly, the plan dawned on me. He was going to run. Run a distance that you would need a satellite to track. We left the landing area and were off to the mining area. As we got close to the edge of the pit, I was puzzled as to why we weren't diverting to the ramp. Then I became terrified a moment before he leapt over the edge. Even with the lower gravity, I was sure he couldn't make the jump and was technically correct. He landed on one of the cranes that weren't visible from the outside. 
and I noticed all the cranes were lined up, connecting us in the far side of the pit. While I held on for dear life and bounded from crane to crane, Manny waved at all of those crane controls as we passed. How did you get everyone awake and into the mines in so little time? I asked once we had finished crossing the other side and were running along the open grasslands. I may have mentioned something about his secret spices, he chuckled to himself. He was right about needing to be corrected as he ran. There was a subtle shift towards this dominant side that I corrected every so often as I bounced in my nest on the back while clutching the device. We didn't stop when he wanted to eat or drink. He just ate the meal bar while running and followed up with a long drawer of one of the bottles he kept. When I mentioned that I would need something, he opened more pouches to give me what I needed. I was eating a bag of freeze-dried blueberries when he spoke up. Ah, the trees, finally! His pace quickened a bit. I couldn't see them, not for a while at any rate, but his course didn't need correction once he had a fixed point to focus on. Of course, it wasn't the trees of the colony city as they finally came into my view. That's the wild jungle they planted years ago. It's overgrown and uncivilized. I realized he wasn't changing direction. We're going through it, aren't we? That could be an Amazon rainforest and it wouldn't stop me. Before or after we regrew it. Nothing in there I need to be worried about. I suspected he might be right, given it was only dangerous by my standards, and humans tend to enjoy things even though they consider them hazardous. Generally, my people don't do much more than glide short distances, having traded long-distance flight for intelligence long ago in our evolutionary ladder. I had flown between trees before, though. It was a good exercise and sharpened your reactions. On the other hand, Manny bounded between the trees with a speed I couldn't have been able to match. As the brush thickened, I got concerned. Our lines might be rather strong, even by your standards. Try not to get caught up in any. I halted as I saw him running right into one that was suddenly separated in a flash of metal. You were saying... Manny brandished a massive flat blade as long as I was and continued to slice through anything that got in our way. Like the ancient deities of our world, you humans got over your warring phase before first contact. I commented in between continued corrections on our heading. You and me both. We are making way more friends this way. But you better believe we haven't forgotten how to fight if some race comes along looking for a fight. He sheathed the blade as we arrived at the river. I knew the dangers that lurked in the water. They would be from our whole world, and half the reason our species evolved fight was to keep away from them. I kept my mind off that thought, hoping they hadn't yet been seeded onto the world. Like the Kotak swarms, I asked as he lifted my nest and me off his back to hold over his head as he forded the river. Ah, they were nice enough today and once you talked to the Hive Queen instead of the drones. He wouldn't believe how sorry they were once they realized non-Hive species were intelligent. That was the last thing he said before his head went under the water. He was still walking along, so I tried not to get worried. But I knew humans couldn't breathe underwater. When he did emerge, he kept talking like nothing happened. We were the only ones who could get through to them because of how humans can coordinate things. They saw a pattern in how our ships and fighters moved. He looked down at himself and made an interested noise. I looked down and saw a number of aquatic predators that I'd feared clung onto the humans' exposed flesh. You know that you are being attacked, right? Am I? He countered as he kept walking. I looked again, and while there were red marks and attempts had been made, everything that had been trying to bite him had failed. They fell off as he left the water, and they couldn't survive without letting go. Oh, I remarked. Quitters, he rebuked dismissively. I decided I never wanted to go to Earth. I didn't even need to read a book about what kinds of animals lived on it. I, if I ever did, the nightmares would never stop. I watched as we left behind the most dangerous creatures our world had, writhing on the ground because they couldn't even hurt a human. We pushed through the jungle until I suddenly ended a few dozen meters from a cliff face. It looked like an almost vertical incline. I wondered if he had taken time to check the elevation map before he left. What's that? I asked, distracted from asking if he knew what way was the shortest around. Magnesium carbonate, he stated flatly as he dusted the powder over his hands, as if that was the only explanation I needed. 
Before I could ask my original question, he moved up to the bare rock and started climbing. I looked up the two dozen meters we would have to climb and balked at the idea that the heavy human could ascend directly even in lower gravity. You think you can climb this? I asked. It's not even totally vertical, let alone an overhang. I'll be fine. Then his response seemed to be like he found the question amusingly silly. Should I try flapping my wings? I thought he needed my help. Yeah, that would make it a bit more challenging. Go for it. Such insanity shouldn't have surprised me coming from a race that invented flight before remote controls. But it always did. I stayed still as we quickly made our way up and over the cliff's edge, where we could see the setting sun go down over the horizon. I was exhausted. Should we rest for the night? I asked, seeing that Manny was taking a moment to catch his breath. You can go ahead and sleep. He chugged an entire bottle in one go. I'm a hair under the toxic dose of the good stuff. I'll be fine all night. I didn't want to know what he drank. Whatever it was, reading the warning label alone would have probably killed me. He took a navigation device from me and let me crawl into my nest and get what sleep I could. It wasn't easy doing so on the back of the human, but I managed. When I woke, Manny was still running. Poking my head out of the nest, I could see the city in the dawn light. We made it, I exclaimed, so full of excitement. You betcha, little bird buddy. He seemed to pick up his pace as we approached the forest. All our facilities will be in the trees. We need to get up there. But moving around will be difficult since we don't have a vehicle and you don't have wings, I explained as we approached the outskirts. Elevator, right there. It'll get us up there. He ran into the open doors and slammed his fist onto the button. I was grateful the equipment was rated for human use and started moving us up. Manny detached most of his gear except for my nest on his back and left it on the floor. Then he pulled out a small tube and examined it. What is that? I was curious and excited to be so close to our goal. It is something that has a warning label written in human, he smiled. It's going to get us over the finish line. No, I can't let you put your life in danger. I, it frightened me they would risk himself so casually. Relax, his warning says it's only dangerous if I make a habit of it. Or have a heart condition. Besides, we are literally on our way to a hospital. It's a multi-species, right? Yes, but... Then relax, I'll be fine. He slammed the tube into the side of his neck, and his whole body shook before settling down again. He burst out of the door with new energy, and we found ourselves at the city level, but no vehicles were parked in the lot. We could see the direction we needed to go, but with trees, branches, and vines in the way. Well, uh, this is going to be interesting. He tensed up like he was getting ready to jump from branch to branch, but they were too far apart, and the colony infrastructure was still being built. Do I need to remind you that humans did not evolve from birds? I asked, wondering if the injection he took impaired his judgment. He turned to look at me in the eyes with either a manic insanity or a childlike glee. No, we evolved from monkeys. I didn't have time to ask what a monkey was as he bolted forward and leapt from the platform. The only thing close to us was a vine hanging from the trees, and I had to conclude monkeys evolved through brute force stupidity. Manny grabbed onto the vine and swung, using our momentum to the next vine and the next. Occasionally, we landed on a branch to adjust our course, but only briefly, before leaping onto another vine. The entire time, he pillowed a strange primal holler. I didn't even realize that we were here at the hospital until we rode the vine to crash through the front door. We're here. Quick, find out where we are going. Manny brought me to the clerk, who quickly told us where my family was after I explained that we weren't there to attack the place. Manny seemed more comfortable in a structure laid out for most races to get around in, and bounded up the stairs faster than the internal elevator could take us, skipping most of them. We got to the floor where my family was, and we were soon bursting through the door. There, in the medical nest, was my son and wife comforting him. Their expressions looked a lot like mine probably did when Manny burst through my door. I leapt onto his shoulder before gliding down to be with my family. You! Manny pointed at the doctor, who had been in the room checking on his patient. Transfusion! Now! The doctor got to work without any need to mention a secret spices, and I was soon hooked up to allow my blood to flow to my son. Satisfied that everything that needed to be done had been done, Manny collapsed on a chair that thankfully supported his weight. I heard a new man burst in here. Is everything okay? came a new voice, 
I noticed another human came in, a doctor according to the card pinned to her coat. Only this one was smaller than Manny, with long red hair and a differently shaped chest. It reminded him of the pictures Manny had in his locker, only with clothing. Manny reacted to the sound of the voice like he had taken another stimulant. Shut up to his feet. Just fine, doctor. Had to give my little bird buddy a ride. Did you take a stimulant? She examined his neck, where the injection mark was unmistakable, before looking at the attempted bite marks and the rest of him. Just a few energy drinks and electrolytes and such, then a dose of um, a party favor. Have you fine, though? Manny didn't quite look fine, even from my perspective, but the doctor looked interested rather than he concerned. He ran all day and night just to get me here in time to save my son's life, waded through an infested river and fought off the predators that would have killed me, climbed up a vertical cliff face and swung us the rest of the way using the vines. It was hard to muster the energy to convey enthusiasm with my blood being drained, but the doctor's eyes widened at my story. That's amazing. Are you sure you're all right? I could check you in the room next to your friend here. The doctor seemed genuinely impressed. Well, you look like you were on your way home. He gestured to a coat in her arms. I don't want to keep you after a long day of work when I'm just fine. But if you insist, don't be silly, Manny, I interjected, hoping that I read the right signals. I'm sure the doctor can monitor your health at her place. No need for paperwork or medical bills. Both humans turned their eyes to me for a moment before turning to each other. I can certainly keep on top of your condition from the comfort of a human bed. The human said with a subtext I wasn't familiar with, but could take a guess. I always follow doctor's orders, Manny replied with a happy grin. The doctor turned to leave and Manny turned to face me, sticking his arm out with a closed fist except that it was extended thumb. You are the best wingman, my little bird buddy. Manny left the room and my wife finally spoke. What just happened? I think I just secured him a mate. End of story. Speaker for the Depressed, written by Grenadier42. Vasim Saskriti was nervous despite his best efforts. He had volunteered to be a speaker for the Depressed, for the newly discovered species on the fourth arm of the galaxy. If his argument was well received, the Assembly would vote on how many resources were necessary for the uplifting. If his argument was not well received, then it would either be tabled for later discussion, or conversely, a motion for containment would be discussed. It was entirely up to the speaker, and the speaker alone, therefore, to make sure that everything was properly dressed. Saskriti picked up a data pad and looked over his speech. He huffed in amusement, knowing the response to his words was going to cause confusion amongst the other races. The Vasim were not known to be a species of speech givers who wove words to make others cry. They were a species who valued the ability to put complex ideas into small words. He felt his speech captured this beautifully, and it was the philosophy that had driven him to volunteer in the first place. Closing out his speech, he maneuvered through the mess of data in histories, wars, philosophies, and even the bathing habits before he found the piece that had inspired him. Laconic phrases. He attempted to mouth the unfamiliar word while listening to the translator's best attempt at rendering the proper pronunciation. The philosophy around them spoke to him from across the stars and ages, and he had known in that moment he had to speak for them. Pausing, he glanced at the clock. He was expected in the chambers in 200 heartbeats. He breathed for a moment, holding the breath while feeding the joy of being, before breathing out and standing. The moment had passed, and the next approached. Gathering his data pad, he strode confidently out of his office, startling the Zithrithi that had come to collect him into a chittering mass. He ignored the poor insect, striding confidently down the glistening halls adored with the portraits of each previous successful speaker. If he succeeded, his would adorn the halls after this, as his words would have uplifted an entire species. If he failed, he would return home in disgrace. He smiled briefly as he thought about the Olympics, when men wished to either win or die to avoid the humiliation. A fascinating species. The hallway he walked down did not curve or veer in any direction, as it was set up solely for the benefit of the speaker. The room he had occupied was just for him as well, to prepare his speech. Once he had finished, they would return to the vacancy until another depressed was disclosed. 
The hallway would remain lit so the diplomats would come and admire the works of what the Republic considered the greats, but generally it sat well lit but empty. Reaching the end of the hallway, he finally turned and began ascending a small set of stairs that took him to the center of the assembly. He began climbing up the spiraling stairs, giving him ample opportunity to not only observe, but be observed by every sentient species in the galaxy. Every member needed an opportunity to remember the faces of the ones speaking. Finally reaching the top, he turned and looked to the full grandeur of the assembly house. At the time of its construction, there had been 48 members, and each had been involved in the design. The house was round with a central podium to show that no one, not even the current speaker, was more or less important. No one sat out front, as there was no front, nor was there a back, it merely was and is. Each member had constructed a single segment of the house in their own world style, making the entire building a kaleidoscope mess of different clashing colors and design choices. The final builders had managed to put together into something that didn't completely assault the eyes, but first impressions were always that it was ugly. However, second and third impressions always showed that the beauty of the joint effort began to show through, until each species grew rather fond of the horrid building. Siskritti breathed again, taking in another moment. He held the breath as he placed the datapad on the podium in front of him, before releasing the breath and awaiting the next. He nodded to the announcer and snicked named Liss, who began the formal introductions. Ten full cycles ago, the depressed species was discovered on the fourth arm of the galaxy. Per protocol, a full collection of all their histories, writings, works of art, and mannerisms was compiled and given to each of the ninety-nine members of the assembly. Liss said. This council meeting is to discuss whether or not to uplift the species that calls itself humanity. Liss then looked over to Suscriti, who could see the nervousness on the other species' face. One cycle ago, we began accepting applications to be the speaker for the depressed. In a rather, she paused, seemingly struggling to find the true word, surprising situation, the first applicant was of a seam, not the Kalrai or the Plercha. A low murmur broke out across the assembly at that point, as everyone had now received confirmation of their suspicions. The speaker was not announced until this moment in order to prevent bias warming, and the snicked had spoken true. A Vasim had never even requested to be a speaker. In fact, ten of the last twenty speakers had been Carlyle, eighteen, if the Plurcha were included. Some believed that this rarity was the single reason that they had been chosen. In accordance with the rules, Vasim Saskriti will have one full station rotation to make their arguments, at which point questions can be posed by the attending members without limit, Bliss said, having recovered from her own surprise. Now hereby present Vasim Saskriti, Vilar censored. Polite applause, grunting, and other signs of approval rippled through the attending members, but Saskriti could hear the nervous tension. He hummed internally, taking in the moment, before politely brushing his fur and stepping up to the podium. He breathed, howled, and then made the first part of his speech. They bury their dead. He stepped back down and sat in a chair that was made of available for speakers in case of a long debate or, in rare cases, outbursts. Liss looked at him, the horror on her face evident and mirrored by the quiet drone starting to grow in the assembly house. Instead of listening to it, he leaned his head back and looked at the vote, a giant conical mechanism that was suspended over the central tower. Displayed across its surface was the vote, the tally of agreements and disagreements that each species would make in relation to a topic. Right now, no votes were being shown, but he was confident that that was going to change. Almost on cue, a light flicked on, showing that Vasim had just voted to uplift Suskriti hummed in satisfaction. Even if he failed here today, at least he had been granted the blessing of his people. The laconic phrase had spoken to his delegation in the same way it had to him. And so, even if he failed, he could return home safe in the knowledge that he would not be exiled. The noise of confusion and alarm began to steadily increase, growing from a low murmur to a cacophony of shouting. Swearing, chittering, banging, and expletives 
they were impolite for the gravity of the situation. Suscriti let it continue. He was in no hurry to correct anyone, as he felt the phrase spoke for itself. This was all part of his speech. He had wanted to debate the rage so that when he finally explained it, the simplicity of the argument would speak for itself. After nearly two-thirds of a rotation had passed, Suscriti finally stood and retook the podium, much to the relief of Lys and to the rest of the assembly. The Vasim were definitely known for being concise, but even this had been almost insulting to the entire process. However, he was back with an explanation, and as he waited patiently, standing still and keeping his fur flattened in a sign of poor resignation, the noise in the house slowly decreased until it died altogether. Do you not understand? Suscriti asked condescendingly as he swept the assembly with his gaze. They bury their dead. He looked around again, taking moments to look at each of the ninety-nine members and seeing quiet discussions among several of them. What purpose does land serve if you put an ancestor into it? He asked, looking back at his data pad. None. You cannot farm your ancestors, you cannot harvest their spiritual energy, nor can you gain some sort of tactile benefit from placing them into productive soil. In fact, placing remains into the soil can poison it. So what benefit does it provide to these humans to bury their dead? At this point, he pulled out a small hollow device and activated it, causing a series of diagrams to appear above his head. He pointed up at the diagrams. I compiled the death rituals of every species assembled here today. And if you look at one on the surface, it appears incredibly varied. Cremation, weapon forging, ritualistic consumption, fruit planting, etc. He looked back at the assembly. But what was the point of all of this? He waited, watching the realization slowly slink in across a few species, and confusion settled in to even more. He sighed, a sound not unlike a growl, before closing his eyes and placing his hands on the podium. He breathed in the moment, the quiet murmur of slow realization, before breathing back out. They believe in something greater than themselves, just like these humans do. They believe that there is something more, something outside their own understanding and capabilities, and they want in, he said. His eyes still closed while he breathed. Every species here has funeral traditions, because we too once believed in something greater than ourselves, and we wished to tap into that, to be a part of it, and to hope that existence was not meaningless. Opening his eyes, he looked back out across the assembly, casting his gaze across the architecture of the 48 founders that adorned the walls and ceiling. Is that not what this place is about? Is it not a place dedicated to the ideal? Then there is something greater than we should all be striving towards. Is this not a monument to the idea that it takes more than art or science or war or philosophy to be considered one of us. He reached over and turned off the hollow device, and deactivated the datapad as well. He collected them into his hands before glancing over at the clock, showing that the station had almost finished its rotation. He hummed and breathed in the moment of silence that now hung across the assembly as each species considered his words. Breathing out, he added finally, Is it our place to deny them? After all, there is something more. He picked up his data pad and hollow device, turned around and sat back down in the chair that had been provided. He placed them on his lap and continued to breathe, taking in the moment as the assembly descended into chaos once again. Four rotations later, after a long series of questions and answers, the assembly overwhelmingly agreed to uplift the new race of humanity and accept them into their fold. It was agreed that the Vasim would be the vanguards in the uplifting effort and that the phrase, there is something more, would become an official motto for the project. Humanity had been found worthy. End of story. This Strange Encounter, written by I.S. Zox. Timalma was hunting. He groped his spear between his six-fingered hands and used his six legs to move through the forest. Thanks to his many eyes, he had a superb vision of the surrounding forest. The trees already began to losing their leaves, and he would need the meat of a, a disvelver or something similarly sized to get his family over the winter. Luckily, 
the crunching orange leaves of the trees created the perfect environment for tracking and hunting large animals. He raised his carapace that closed his torso and waited for a sound to come to his ear. He waited silently for minutes, nothing that indicated any animals nearby. This close to the village, he would have been lucky to catch anything. Yes, he would have to search over the hills, between them and the large, salty lake. After he had moved over the hills, Timalm swept the area with a Zvelva or a Telblek. He was about to give up when he stumbled through the forest and saw an unknown creature standing on a clearing right next to a tree. The unknown was like anything Timalm had ever seen before, with only four limbs. It used two of them to stand upright and apparently the other two to eat, seeing as it removed a few of the red leaves from the tree it stood next to. It had no carapace. Its entire body was covered beneath black, flexible skin. He couldn't see any eyes or ears, so it was likely that it hadn't spotted him yet. Timon was fascinated by the creature and would have observed it for hours, but the fading sun reminded him that he didn't have much time. Could he hunt the creature? Surely he could. It might be taller than him, but it didn't have any defenses like a carapace. He stepped onto the clearing, careful not to make too much noise. Apparently, he failed, as the creature turned around and looked towards him. Timon decided to rush his prey. He ran towards the strange thing, when some kind of shiny rock appeared in the upper appendages of it. It didn't look sharp, so Timon ran further and almost reached the creature, when the sound of thunder reached his ears. Pain erupted in his body. He looked down to see a hole in his clothes, whatever this was. He would survive it. He closed in on the target, then another thunderous sound reached his ears. The pain in the side of his body massively increased, and he looked down again. Cracks appeared in his carapace. Tamal knew that a broken carapace meant a slow and certain death. He tried a last-ditch effort to take down the creature, but it was fruitless. He crashed down, and the impact did the rest to his carapace. He looked upwards to the creature standing above him. It had attacked him from a distance with lightning. He could only be a god or another kind of supernatural creature, and he had foolishly attacked it and was now dying from it. These were his last thoughts before he fell unconscious. Timalma woke. He laid on a bed, one much softer than his one and home. Where was he? How did he get here? What had happened? Then he remembered his encounter on the clearing, the strange supernatural creature and his cracked carapace. He had fallen unconscious from pain, which meant that he should be dead. Was this the afterlife the elders had spoken of? So why did he still feel pain? His arms and legs were held together by a long, thick string, and he was completely unable to move them. He looked down to the crack in his carapace. It was no longer there. Only a small bump that ran along the entire former position of the crack was visible. The crack itself was sealed. How was this possible? Fully broken carapaces could not heal. He observed his surroundings. He was in a room with walls and that had a color of snow. The material was made neither of rock nor from wood, or any material he knew. Maybe it was similar to the weapon the creature had wielded against him. But he wasn't certain. The hole suddenly opened in the wall and another two-legged creature entered with what had to be a snow-colored clothing. Its looks were strange. It had a completely different head to that from the ground. Also, its fingers looked different. They looked at him, then looked at the flat plate made from the wall material. It shakes its head around, then left the room again. He had to either be in the afterlife or the domain of the gods, he concluded. If the god he had met could injure him with lightning then there should be one capable of healing his carapace. But why? He had attacked a god. Shouldn't it be an offense punished by death? Had they perhaps only healed him to make sure that he would survive to meet their judgment? He shivered. He had to get out of here, even if it meant that they would only kill him later. Timon concentrated. Now he could see the fine lines that indicated the passage in the wall. Then the passage opened again, and the god of storms, the one that had attacked him, appeared in the room. It looked at him with its eyeless face, then grabbed him at his legs and threw him over his shoulder. Timon panicked. He was not prepared to die so young. 
He could only look backwards as they moved further from the bed and through the passage. They marched through the gigantic house, with magic lightings and openings that didn't let anything through them. There was nothing to see when he looked outside. Tamam saw a few additional gods, all of them looking strangely different from another. Then the one carrying him moved through another passage, into a small room with two seats on either side. They flung him into the seat on the right, secured his body in position with flat, white strings, and took place on the left. Then a large clunking sound ran through the room, and Tamam was suddenly weightless. He used the time to look out the opening right next to him and saw a large half-moon-shaped ring of colors of water, leaves, and wood. It slowly became bigger as he kept looking at it. Was this how the gods saw the ground? Then he turned left and saw the one touching the wall of lights and differently colored protrusions. Suddenly, he was pressed into his seat. The sudden weight left him without breath, and he struggled to regain air. This continued for about ten seconds before he was weightless again. The next minutes were silent. Tamalm couldn't talk to his neighbor and wasn't even sure they would respond. So the two just sat there, silently. Tamalm began feeling the little bit of weight and was slowly pressed into his seat again. He looked outside to see flames raging around the room he was in. He screamed. Instantaneously, a hand rushed over to his mouth and pressed it shut. Tamalm tried to remove the hand, but his arms were still bound. He was forced to watch as the flames became stronger and stronger, and he was pressed more and more into his seat. He was rattled around. The force pressing became stronger and stronger, and Tamalm wondered whether the flames, the rattling, or the force would kill him first. After what felt like an eternity, the flames subsided, and he began feeling lighter. The hand was removed from his mouth, and he could fully breathe again. He looked left and saw the creature stare focus on the wall of light. Then, the same force pressed him back into his seat, and he was rattled around again. He caught his breath rather quickly, then looked back left. Why, when they're so tense? Then he heard a loud rumbling from below. It almost sounded like thunder, but continuous and louder. They became louder and louder, then it suddenly cut, and everything became still. He lay on his seat and was back to normal weight. His seat neighbor also looked much more relaxed than before and turned around to look at him. They moved from their seat to the middle, pulled him from his seat, then pressed on a light at the board. The floor below them sank downwards and the walls were replaced by strange round objects of many different sizes. Then the way downwards stopped and they stepped from the piece of floor now hanging just above the ground, which looked as if it had burned recently. They put me back on their shoulders, ignored the hot surface, and moved forwards. After a short time, he saw a massive object with a snow-colored upper side and the ash-colored lower side. He couldn't estimate how high it really was, but it surely was high. Behind it was a large surface of water, which was typical coloring and small waves. After being carried even further, he recognized where he was. The large object had stood on the shore on the large salty lake over the hills and he was currently on his way towards the hills. Did the god of thunder really bother to carry him personally back to his village? Then his carrier suddenly stopped and put him onto the ground. He immediately recognized the clearing they were in. With a strong pull, he was flipped upside down and his weakly protected underside and joints were exposed. They pulled out a knife and made a shiny material which looked really sharp then moved it towards Tamam's underside. Please, don't hurt me. Please, don't hurt me. But Tamam's thoughts, before he closed his eyes, had expected a cut at any time. The pressure holding his limbs together disappeared. He opened his eyes and saw that they had cut the string holding his limbs together and had moved a little bit backwards. He turned himself upside down and stood up. He pointed his right hand at himself, then told the god his name. Tamam! They pointed one of their fingers on them and said, Human, to him. They picked up his hunting spear and flung them through the air into his hands. Then they made a gesture with their hand. He interpreted it as to come closer. They continued, then turned around and stepped into the forest. Tamalm followed. They were a little foot faster than him, but occasionally waited for him to catch up. After a medium amount of time, they stopped and switched to moving very carefully. Tamam closed up with careful steps himself until he was directly next to them. They pointed into the forest. Tamam followed their finger and saw a disvalva in the distance. 
Before he could sneak close to it, they raised their weapon at the animal. A large booming sound, which almost pierced the ears of Tamalm, ran through the forest, and the disvolver dropped dead on the ground. Tamalm moved to the corpse and began picking it up. He held it in his hands and offered it to the god. They declined and helped him put the disvolver on his back. He imitated the gesture that had used to tell him to follow and began marching back to his village. After a while, he turned around to see if they had kept pace with him, but he saw no one. He moved back to where they had hunted the Zvalva, but he found only footsteps into the other direction. He followed them and ran back to the shore. The large object was still on the sand, but the floor panel that hung on the lower side was gone. The flames lit up on the lower side and the loud rumbling was back. Almost as if it was weightless, the object began moving up into the sky and became smaller and smaller. Tamam looked after it until it became too small to see. Then he turned towards the hills and walked, with his hunting prize at his back. He had a story to tell. Sarah took off her helmet. After the atmosphere had stabilized back to earth levels, she untied her braid and flung her red hairs all over her shoulder. She unmuted the radio and hailed the UNS Pioneer 10. UNS Pioneer 10, this is Star Fox 1, do you copy? Star Fox 1, this is the UNS Pioneer 10. You are loud and clear, over. Pioneer 10, do you have me on radar? We have you on radar, calculating necessary maneuvers now. She thought back to her encounter with the strange semi-arachnid down on the planet and had a chuckle. What's so funny, Sarah? Her radio cackled. You know, Zhang, this is the first encounter between humans and another sentient species, and the first thing that happens is a shooting. What a terrible way to encounter one another, she laughed. Well, you shot him. You could have sat back. The surveyor suits are resilient enough to stave off pistol fire. Well, exploration protocol states that the life of the surveyor goes first, and that shooting is a valid way of self-defense. Also, he gave us valuable probes and some insights into formation of conscience. That should be at least worth the efforts of the Giorgio put into bringing him back up. Yeah, you definitely owe Giorgio one of your cake rations. I've only got two of them left. I have to save them already. You know, that we still have two months left on our mission. Giorgio, you heard that. One cake ration from Sarah for you. Zang, you bast... She sighed. All right, one cake ration for Giorgio. She paused again. There's the navigation plan finished. Lee is going through it, but she should finish it in a few seconds. Yep. It's ready, sending it to you now. Sarah waited a few seconds before her control display blinked, and she was greeted by an orbital map with trajectories and maneuvers necessary to redock the Pioneer. Let's see, four hours until rendezvous, so about five hours until I'm back. Would you please fill out the report with all the things that happened on the Pioneer, darling? All right, love, I'm going to do it, but only if you're going to have some fun tonight. Thanks, darling. I wanted some yesterday already. Sarah... You know that all of this goes into protocol, and this time around someone is actually going to read it. Of course I know. That's why I said it. And everyone's going to know that you cheated me out of a cake ration. See you in five hours. See you in five hours. Sarah closed the radio channel and focused on the maneuver list in front of her. Next maneuver in 40 minutes. That was ample time to start filling out the documents. Planet Spectre 1746392B Inhabitable, yes. Suitable for colonization, no. Reason for classification, inhabited by primitive sentient species. Further indirect study needed. See attached first contact report. Signature, Sarah Witt. She looked at the maneuver list again. Fifteen minutes until next maneuver. Computer, open first contact report. Opening first contact report. First contact report, P10-1. System of first contact, species nickname, species homeworld, Species Biological Data, Technological Level, Course of First Contact, Future Diplomatic Outlook, Additional Information. She carefully filled out the data, describing her encounter with the alien in great detail, until an alarm ripped her from her recollection. The first maneuver was due in 30 seconds. Sarah watched the automatic flight control system execute the maneuver, then looked back at her report. She finished the protocol, then relaxed back in her seat. She still had about two hours until the rendezvous. One week later, Sarah sat in a mess hall of the Pioneer 10 together with the entirety of the ship's crew. New orders had finally arrived from Earth. Did we get uh, concrete orders? She asked. No, just uh, proceed at your own caution order, Captain Clues answered, 
So to all of you, what do we do? I would definitely like to survey the planet more, Zhang said. But we're not supposed to interfere in the affairs of primitive civilizations. Our previous actions might have already caused some trouble already. Sarah, what do you mean? Well, I love fieldwork, but Zhang is right. We could cause massive trouble if we continue with ground missions. The guy we kidnapped probably already thinks that he's met a god. If more people report things like this, we will create a mass religion about us. So our consensus is that we should stop ground missions. I would then suggest that we deploy our sentinel satellite and keep watch. This is going to give us orbital pictures and radio data once they advance technology. That's probably our best option, Sarah replied. Let's do it. Zhang, you agree? Zhang nodded. Lee, Pierre, Giorgio, Peter, you agree? All except Lee nodded. Lee, what do you mean? I want to add that we should probably install an asteroid defense system in the system. We don't want to return to some time to see them all dead like the dinosaurs. We don't have a portable asteroid defense around, so we would have to ask back on Earth. We will keep it to the Sentinel for now. Anyone else disagreeing? Everyone shakes their head. Sarah, Peter, you go outside and move the Sentinel from outside Cargo Bay to the Star Fox Cargo Bay. Sarah, you take the Star Fox into the polar orbit and release the satellite. After you return, we'll survey the other planets in the system and then head back home. Why do I have to do this? You know that the whole procedure takes three days, Sarah complained. Peter has much less deployment time than me around here. That's an order, Sarah. Besides, you're the one who handles loneliness the best, and you know that we installed a copy of the video game library for you. Rock, paper, scissors, Sarah, Peter told her. Whoever loses has to deploy the satellite. Rock, paper, scissors, they yelled. Sarah pulled her hands into a fist, only to look at Peter's flat hand. Ah, all right, I'll do it. Told you so, Clus remarked mockingly. Sarah was back in the small orbital shuttles of the Pioneer 10. She looked at the console of Star Fox 2, then sighed. The orbital maneuver that would increase her inclination by 90 degrees was almost complete. She put the helmet on the NBCS suit on, made a pressure test, then she regulated the atmosphere of the cabin to zero. After the maneuver finished, she left the Star Fox through the side hatch and opened the external cargo bay. She took a large satellite from the cargo bay, connected it to a cable and flanged it away. Then she used her EMU to follow it until she was stopped by a cable. She extended the solar panels, deployed all along the antenna, checked the FTL communication system and extended the radar shield. Sarah activated the automatic orbital maneuvering system, releasing the satellite from the cable and returning to Star Fox 2. Back in the cockpit, she took one last look at Sentinel's satellite before activating the RCS and maneuvering away. The Sentinel would maneuver itself into its final orbit. Time to return to the Pioneer 10. Tamalm looked into the night sky. He was thinking about what had happened to him several days ago. When he returned home, he had been shocked to find that he had been away for three days. Most had initially called him a liar when he had talked about his encounter, but he had wisely taken the godly string with him. After realizing that it was uncuttable, and after seeing the bump on his carapace, all of them changed their mind. Now, he was pondering, when would human god of thunder visit him again? He didn't know. He only knew that the gods lived in the sky, somewhere up there, amongst the stars. He looked there every night for a sign, even a small one. Come on, give me a sign, he thought to himself. He stood there for a while until a small star ran over the night sky and disappeared below the horizon. Something clicked in his head. He understood now. They wouldn't come back. Not for him. But somewhere up in the sky, human, the merciful and general god of thunder, had a watchful eye on him. End of story. Story number one. Once more with feeding, written by Discordant Sky. The shrill call of the base's alarm woke me with a start my flailing spilling me from my meager cot. I screamed, not in rage, but in terror, not caring for the looks of my comrades. No, 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 I babbled to myself. I was dimly aware of the mutterings of my fellows, most dismissing my ramblings as shell shock from the last engagement with the humans. I untangled myself from my thin blanket and jumped to my feet. I took the barest moment to decide what to do before bolting it for the door to the barracks shoving my commanding officer out of the way. I felt the muffled cramp as a point defense gun opened up, 
No, 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 please, no. My hand touched the door end. The shrill call of the base's alarm awoke me with a start, my flailing swelling me from my meek cot. Words were lost on me. The only thing to escape me was a wail of agony. This is a nightmare, I thought. I've died and gone to the underworld. From my spot on the floor, tangled in my blanket, I felt the cannon fire and... The shrill call of the base's alarm woke me with a start, my flailing spilling me from my meek cot. I was silent, ignoring the concerned calls of my comrades. I've gone mad, I sobbed. Make it stop, please. A muffled cramp sent a tremor through the base as a point defense gun opened up. Madness seized my broken mind. I grabbed my sidearm, put the barrel to my mouth, and... The shrill call of the base's alarm woke me with a start, my flailing spilling me from my meager cot. I laid there, sobbing and wailing uncontrollably, until the base's point defense guns opened fire and... A hand on my shoulder softly shook me awake. Hey, Malak, a familiar voice said. It's your rotation. I blinked a few times, my flayed mind not understanding what was happening. I simply sat up a little, little in the cot and stared at my comrade. It didn't happen, I said to him and began to cry. What are you talking about? He asked. He puzzled look at his face. Come on, it's your watch rotation, man. I want to get some. The alarm, I shouted. The point defense guns, they... A long burst of small arms fire made everyone in the barracks jump, most driving towards weapons. Contact, contact, contact. A muffled voice screamed somewhere outside. East side. A chill ran through my soul as I knew what was about to happen. Come on, my comrades began. We've got to... A hand on my shoulder softly shook me awake. Hey, Malik, a familiar voice said. It's your rotation. It was different, I said, sitting up. It was different that time. What? My comrade said, shaking his head before asking. Weird dream. I leapt from the cot, shoving him out of the way. What the feck? He yelled from the floor. I sprinted towards the base's alarm switch on the wall next to the door and slammed my fists onto the large red button and screamed into the transmitter. Hostile contacts! I screamed like a madman. A rough hand grabbed my shoulder and tried to pull me away from the transmitter. A quick glance told me that it was my CEO. A look of rage on his face. Stand down, he said. I put my shoulder into his face and screamed into the transmitter again. East side! East side! I said. Hostiles! I shoved my way off the barracks and looked to the east, even as four of my comrades shoved me to the ground. I saw them then, just as the floodlight snapped on. Humans. Five of them. All standing by the chain link fence, one holding a large pair of bolt cutters, who looked to be halfway done cutting a large hole in the fence. The sudden flare of light had scrambled their adaptive camouflage, and it had yet to change from the smoky black of their night camouflage. I knew the uniforms they wore. Special ops troops. Save one, who was redacted armor of the likes of which I'd never seen. Taller than the other four by a head, and whose helm was featureless, angled the shape, looking right at me. I screamed and pointed, my comrades following my finger and raising weapons. Four of the humans, the normally armored ones, dived for cover. The fifth simply stood there and bore his gaze into me. Open fire! Someone called from behind. In the same instant, the strangely armored human seemed to shimmer, his outline blurring, and an inky blackness seemed to seep from his armor. Just looking at it made me feel as though the universe was coming apart around the strange human. The roar of dozens of small arms filled my ears and... A hand on my shoulder sharply shook me awake. Hey, Malik, a familiar voice said. It's your rotation. 305. The number updated in my HUD as I said a curse that my armor didn't vocalize. All right, everyone, form up new update from command, I said. How do you update a snatch and grab up? Jake grumbled. Stow the belly aching, I said, glowering down at the man from behind my helmet. New objective. We've got new intel that there's an HVT in that base, and command wants him alive in addition to those star maps that they've got stored there. I ordered as I sent a picture of one of the aliens to each of my squad mates. Remember, that alarm goes off, they'll delete the data. In and out, like we were never there. What's so special about this one, Chief? Chris asked. I leaned out and around the tree and looked at the base kilometer away. 
It had taken this many tries just to get this close without tripping any alarms. Now this new problem. He remembers, I said absently. That's new. The whole squad looked at me like I'd grown two heads. He remembers what? Jake asked. What are you talking about, sir? Crap, I groaned internally. Sir, he asked again, placing a hand on my arm. He remembers what? I activated the armor and the feel of familiar tug on my mind, and the chill ran along every nerve in my body. 306. All right, everyone, form up. New update from command, I said. How do you update a snatch and grab up? Jake grumbled. Stow it, I said, glowering down at the man from behind my helmet. New objective. We've got new intel that there's an HVT in that base, and command wants him alive in addition to those star maps that they've got stored here. I ordered as I sent a picture of one of the aliens to each of my squad mates. Remember the alarms go off, they'll delete the data. In and out like we were never there. What's so special about this one, Chief? Chris asked. That's above your pay grade, I said. Let's go. Approach from the west side and keep your eyes peeled for the HVT. I thought the brief said coming from the east, Cody said. Change your plans, I said, shouldering my rifle. Keeps him guessing. Gonna be hard getting one of them out unnoticed, Jake said, forming up behind me. We'll figure it out, I said. We've never failed yet, have we? A chorus of approval all around. Once more, with feeling, I think to myself with a sigh. End of story. Story number two. Emotional, written by underscore sky underscore underscore. Sir, shouted the young cyber archaeology student, his tentacles twitching in shock. What is it? His mentor rushed closer. What did you find? Well, uh, this, this uh, I think it's a video. A fragment of a video record, at least. The mentor exhaled with a heavy sigh. Human videos are perfectly encrypted. You'll never get any. Yet, the mentor was interrupted by a student. But this one is only partially encrypted. Huh? What? Yes, sir. Look at it. It even has ID data specified. The student's tentacles were now positively shaky with the weight of the emotions. It says, uh, YouTube, Potential History, published on August 10, 20 XX. Human parts of audio files are missing too, but there is still a big stretch of functional audio. By the ancients shouted the mentor. Historical data from human internet. We barely pulled anything before. Indeed, sir, I accidentally stumbled upon it. We maybe even derived the location from their home planet. Well, finding their home planet is a bit of a stretch, but what is on the video? I do not know, sir. I, I have not seen it yet. The mentor's eyes widened. By the mercy, play it. This must be the greatest archaeological finding to date. We must figure out what happened to the humans. It is crucial that our species doesn't make the same mistakes. Yes, sir. Thus the audio record started playing. First a dozen seconds were nothing but static snow that was part of the obviously encrypted. However, in what seemed to be the 20th second, the picture of the color emerged. Then, out of nowhere, a strange avian creature appeared on the screen in a black and white color accompanied by the sound of what seemed like the testimony of a human soldier. The human voice. We thought this was going to be a simple job, in and out. Of course, we had no idea what was waiting for us. While the avian-looking creature was skillfully moving around as if looking for prey. Then a change in the screen, followed by the sound of a loud whistle, gunfire, and the sight of two avian creatures charging forward, likely because they have located their target. Video turned in slow motion. Voices of humans screaming and yelling echoed from the speakers, quickly mixing with the incoming sounds of the machine gun fire. What the hell is this? The mentor's tentacles stiffed with Tara. I, I guess uh, humans fought this against these uh, avians. The video recording blinked into black just for a second. The scenery changed, aging, from a few avian creatures to a dozen at first followed by the sight of the entire column of avians marching down the human-looking road. The same human voice from before spoke. There were thousands staring at us down. So many targets you could hardly pick on in the heat of the moment. The scene changed again to only two avians charging down the human residential compartment. The sound of the gunfire echoed and one of the avians fell. I still sometimes see the flashes of the bloody feathers in my dreams. The voice of obviously shocked soldier continued. It seemed to reference some kind of war. Nothing unusual, really. A lot of data indicated that humans fought many of those. 
so it was only to be expected. Yet still, very little was known about the nature of human warfare per se. The recording went on for another three minutes with the occasional static or black screen. Not everything was clear, but it was obvious beyond the doubt that this recording was talking about a long-ago fought war between two species. At one time, a map with the simplistic deployment of tactical troops' movements indicated there was significant fighting happening on one of the minor landmasses. Enemies presumably painted red, friendly blue. The mentor assumed the avians were invaders and that they had tried to set up a planet landing base there, followed by a colorized picture of the avian leader, and even some grotesque scenes where the avians were pillaging and taking food from human civilians. By the ancients, this must be it, screamed the student. These avians are probably committed a genocide on the humans. That is why there is so little of threats left of them. And it perfectly explains why they tried so hard to encrypt any information they had, just in case, replied the mentor. With shaking tentacles and broken voice, the student raised the question. What, what, what about the aliens? I think, the mentor swallowed a lump, we need to inform the army about what we found and prepare for the worst. The student blindly stared at the screen. We are not alone, and neither were humans. These tentacles again, trembling in fear. What if they come for us? I do not know. I uh, do not know, answered the mentor. But knowing what happened to humans, we might at least stand a chance. What in fact the student and the mentor failed to understand was the true nature of the fragments of the YouTube video they found. End of an emu story. A broken machine written by Sure I'm Not a Robot. Humanity had imagined many enemies. But one of the earliest fears was the tools in the hands turning on them. From axe colts in the Mesolithic to ghosts hiding in the newfangled gaslighting, the electricity and its invisible, mysterious and lethal power. Nothing compared to when a man mixed everything together and created electronics and a whole new type of threat was foreseen and new fears arose. They never came to pass. It turns out that people are better at bonding with their fridges and their own kind half the time. By the time they could have become an independent threat, they were us and we were them. We gave them bad jokes and awkward relationships, and they gave us immortality, and everyone seemed happy with the arrangement. We just made humanity bigger. We had new choices, augmented by our finest work to live out in the galaxy that was slowly unfolding in front of us. New nations, new peoples, and almost no reason to fight. But when had we ever needed a reason? It was our planet, we built it. We have the plans for every square meter of it, and I'll be damned if a bunch of fecking icicles are going to take two bloody continents. Not even one, not even a bloody embassy, but full independent settlements on two out of the five. And what do we get? Nothing. I'm useless ice walls that even they can't be asked to live on. I vote no, and I'll go further than that. I'll dismiss any of you idiots to vote for it. The room was filled with dappled light. The air filled with a gentle breeze. The rage rang heavily against the carefully contrived piece. The people listening were more than a little shocked and intimidated. The speaker had been the leader of the whole settlement. His work on merging Terran DNA into their own wondrous new forms carried a lot of weight but one still sought to find her voice. Speaker, this is a negotiation. They are offering us much that they value, even if you don't. It is in good faith. Her voice faded as a growl of opposition grew, and it took her a moment to steady it. Speaker, counsel, they ask for lands that we will not be able to terraform for generations, if ever. Your plan is not carved in stone, not ordained by the gods. It is just a plan. The people, she emphasized the word, that made this offer are simply looking for the same opportunities that we are. Those ice balls are the work of our finest artists, not for habitation, but veneration. They honor us with our offer, and I doubt that many of their people will be content with such a bargain. To the surprise of none, the row continued along into the night, even as their new sun disappeared below the horizon. The Terran Quorum ship, Wisp, was sitting in a low planetary orbit. Its two inhabitants were listening to the slow drone of politicians making a mess of things, both sure that they would end up trying to fix it. 
They were close to the Terran baseline except for the build tech. Medical and at-boss stuff that came with the job. Except that one of them didn't seem to have it all activated. The man looked elderly, a thing almost unheard of now and completely unnecessary. What are the twigs arguing about anyway? The icicles will pay for those dead continents ten times over, just to have a space to grow. That fell into dead air. After a pause came the reply, Envoy Tolan, I will remind you for the last time to not use slurs. The Arboreals and the Chionet are their preferred terms, and a single use of those insults will destroy our credibility. Please remember they are human and have the same rights and abilities that we do. The younger-looking man nodded at the comms, for instance, listening to things that they are not supposed to hear. Am I clear? Tolan snorted. Take your head out of your ass, Silver. What are they going to do? Silver, Inkman had already lost his sense of humor with his fellow envoy. Figured they had pried him out of some office and inflicted him on the greater human space out of spite. He just wasn't sure who they were trying to piss off, him or Tolan. Apparently both. He gave his colleague a dead look and said, They will read my report when I ask for your removal as a threat to our mission, and you will be back fecking about with treeware on Mars Orbital. Again, am I clear? Tolan sneered. Who are you to threaten me? I could report you just as quickly. I should have known you'd be a fan of those bloody weirdos. Tacked up until God himself can't find a human soul. Why all the silver, huh? Just wanted to be better than the rest of us. Silver smiled to himself. That he was one of the god botherers explained why he'd been packed off to the wilderness. Also... Aging in case his terrifying little god wouldn't recognize him when he died. The common clay of earth, you know, a moron. Well, I inherited a silver tea set from my grandmother, but I don't drink tea, so I decided to plate my augments instead. It seemed to cheer them up. Tolan looked confused. That's bullshit, isn't it? What? Silver turned to the console and burst code into the system. Envoy mission specialist inkment override. Envoy Tolan dismissed for cause slash audio attached. Confirm. The report hit Earth quickly and was spared through the system until it arrived at the Quorum Diplomatic Director's office. He listened to the audio and summoned the project manager for a new settlement. When she arrived, he had nothing and simply replayed the long list of sneering insults. There was an awkward pause and then he snapped, How did this uh, relic get anywhere near this mission? She seemed to squirm before coming to some conclusion. Sir, those relics still have political power. I am constantly under pressure to include them in our projects. They feel they are missing out on all the new worlds. Tolan has been dead weight in every job he ever held. I thought we could afford to carry him on this one and buy some room for the next. How can he feck up a simple treaty like this? She stopped. Certain things were unwise to say to a director. The director snorted. Of course they are missing out. They won't take any of the augments that they would need to live in the new worlds. They can't sit around Sol and bitch about it because it changes nothing. Do they want to pay for a terraform? Nothing stops them. That's what everyone else does. Oh wait, I forgot they're afraid their guard won't get their forwarding address. He growled. Confirm the dismissal. It's a one-man job now. Send Tolan somewhere miserable. He waved her away. Go. And next time warn me that when you need to send dead weight out there, I have better methods. Good try, though. The project manager pulled the door closed behind her and resisted the urge to lean against it. She walked quietly to her office, another relic that A had hold on to for some reason, and made a call. Inkman, Forest Planet 8A, now. As she grabbed a coffee and waited. Tolan got the termination notice while he was bitching about being stuck on here with a bunch of perverts. Silver grinned when the tirade suddenly ended and the ship flashed him a new code for the embassy. Looks like he was going solo. He cut all of Tolan's privileges and purged his personal data. A quick skim revealed the hell of a lot of trash that he didn't want to open. Trust the idiot to not know how to clear his history. He set course for the nearby refueling dump. He knew it was mean 
He could have taken him right back to Earth, but, as the saying goes, feck him. It took an hour to get there and five minutes for the ship to chuck his ass out of the platform. He probably had a coffee machine, maybe even a food replicator. None of those pervert humans, though. Then the call came through. He picked up. Hi, boss. How's Earth doing? Worse than you. Now I have to place that idiot somewhere else. Couldn't you have kept him in his room for another week? Sobel asked. Boss, if you'd seen the stuff that guy had been watching in there, you wouldn't want to go near it. I've already got a level 6 decon running. Just find him somewhere without all of us perverts and weirdos under a heavy rock. There was a pause. Do you have copies of those files? Because I need to push back on those idiots who made me carry his ass. Silver silently forwarded the purge files. I don't recommend you watch them without serious supervision. I'm guessing about half of it is illegal deepfakes. At least, I hope it's deepfake. I was waiting for a call before I burned it off the ship for good. Who could hear the swearing as she read the file names? And we're the weirdos. All right, I'm giving you the wisp. Don't break her. When do you expect to land Tolan? I'll have security waiting. Silver shrugged. He's sitting on a refueling dump until someone collects him. I already threw him off the ship. He could hear the weariness enter her voice. Fine. I don't really blame you. I'll send a truck to go get him. Take him somewhere uncomfortable. From you, all I want is an update and a proper bloody name for that planet. Go settle them down and promise them whatever you need to. I don't want ghetto planets on my watch. Two variants on an absolute minimum, and I don't care who paid for it. Get that done. I'll call you when I've picked up the trash and, uh, don't feck up solo, Silver, or I'll post you out for tolling with life. Sure, boss. End of story. Story number one. I am Hell, written by Haina. The ashes of the dying planet swirl through the air, mingling with the embers of a city, reduced to ruin. The last bastion of resistance was coated in the remains of a fallen empire, one last holdout against the Inferno. Ten solar years ago, to the day, the once mighty Janelle Empire declared war on a species that had just entered the galactic stage. They numbered but a few minor systems, and although they had some interesting biological features, they were otherwise unremarkable. Several different shades of skin, very little fur covering on their bodies, nothing noteworthy, at least to the burgeoning mass that was the Jernal Empire. It was to be a short, victorious war, designed and planned to boost morale of the Empire, which had been locked in galactic conflict for ages. Aside from that, the species, these humans, had what looked to be a very profitable asteroid field within their solar system, all ripe for the taking. With all the force of a tempest, the Empire descended upon the humans. Their military was small, comparatively. Their technology primitive. As with many races, they fought furiously when cornered. But it was not enough. Their brittle bodies couldn't overpower the larger forms of the Jan'nal soldiers. Of course, as is the way of the universe, things change. Their military was small because they had devoted resources into something else. Something that wasn't ready when the Empire bore down upon them. Their usual technologies were primitive because they had poured so much time and effort into another branch of sciences. Something unheard of in the galactic community. Now the highest ranking member of the Janaln military present on this planet, Bernaln, stood impassively as a lone figure approached his barricade. The figure was armored, humanoid, and terrifying. On the faceplate, a grinning human skull was carved, mocking the once pride to renowned soldiers. Stopping a dozen paces away, the figures removed its helmet, revealing the face of a human, or what looked like one. The AI looked eyes with Bernal, machines staring into the flesh. This was mankind's true gambit. For some insane reason, they were obsessed with creating AI. True AI not the pale imitation that assisted aboard starships. Where others had failed and simply stopped trying, the humans preserved. Now, manufactured bodies swarmed across the vast expanse of the Janal Empire, fighting where human flesh could not, all controlled by one of three AI, named after the beings in the ancient, bloody pantheons of humanity. 
The fourth horseman smiled a terrible human smile, bearing the artificial teeth housed within a skull of alloy and plastic. If machines could have a soul, this one was a black abyss. Then it spoke the damning words breathed at the end of every planet it touched. I am the tattered cloak of innocence, hanging over the pale, emaciated form of fury. I am violent skin form. I am given thought in order to act on humanity's darkest desires. I am the seething blackness of the heart of Earth. I am hell. Bernal's rifle roared out, splitting the machine's uncovered head into several different pieces, slicing but one of many. Throughout the ruined city, the millions of forms occupied by the AI spoke as one. I am hell. End of story. Story number two. Humanity's Spark, written by na 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 catman You have taken much from us. When you arrived at Earth, we were a fledgling species, barely able to reach our moon. When we saw your ships in the sky, we were hopeful and excited. We were not alone in the universe, and you might have all the answers we have been seeking. But when those hopes turned to ash alongside New York City, all that remained was a cold lump of fear. You delivered an ultimatum, surrender and slavery, or resistance and death. We resisted, of course, and you took Beijing, Paris, Mumbai, and Los Angeles from us. Our most powerful warheads didn't even scratch the paint on your fleet, and in short order, we were out of options. Humanity surrendered. You took our freedom. Earth temperatures were not suitable for you, so you loaded us as cargo onto your ships and let us watch as you glassed Earth. You took our home. You wanted to drive home that we were not humans. We were slaves. But a shared planet was not what made us human. You brought us to your home planet to work as new exotic servants. But you saw that the loss of our home had not broken us. You showed us the other slave races and gave us power over them in some attempt to make us accept our place or to foster resentment between us. But we were not cruel and abusive as you thought that we would be. We empathized with those fellow unfortunates. We reminded those broken races how life was supposed to be and slave revolts began to crop up across the planet. Your response was swift. You took back the power you had granted us and began sending us to the arena. There, we were forced to fight to the death against one another, against wild animals, and most importantly, against the other slave races. You were no fools, and things began to develop exactly as with our troublesome races. We saw aliens killing our own, and the other races saw humans killing them. We grew to resent the other races, and the revolt stopped. You took our compassion, our mercy. But compassion and mercy were not what made us human. You tried once again to ship us out as slaves, but you quickly discovered that we would band together the moment they had a chance and overpower our jailers, betray our masters, steal transports, whatever it took to escape together. So you took more from us. You put us in slums and gave us insufficient rations, we had to fight amongst ourselves to fight and not starve. Brother against brother. You took our unity, our families. But unity and families were not what made us human. You had taken so much from us. Our freedom, our rights, our home, our compassion, our mercy, our families, our unity, our lives. You left us with nothing but a lump of fear from first contract. Charred and forged into an unbreakable diamond of hatred by the fires of your injustice. That, and our humanity. We bowed our heads, and you thought that you had tamed humanity. You caught a glimpse of humanity's power. What makes us human is our spark. Call it what you will. Passion, fervor, soul, insanity. Humanity is defined by that spark which drives us to pick a goal and pursue it tirelessly, endlessly, through whatever harm and pain may come. Humanity 
is a spark that drove historians to smuggle our past on board when we left Earth, that drove them to keep our culture alive through our old tradition, so that our home would never fade from memory. Humanity is the spark that drove Valtani Cooper to refuse to kill his opponent in the arena 12 times in a row, despite them being executed immediately afterwards, and despite the fact that he himself was executed after the 12th match. His sacrifice inspired the Chitari revolts of 15437.67. Humanity is the spark that has driven us to excel in every field you have placed us in, as scientists. Bodyguards, captains, engineers, laborers. Humanity is the spark that drove my mother to starve to death so my sister and I could survive. When you saw the spark of humanity, you should have gathered us up and launched us into a star. Humanity is the spark that can burn worlds to ash. Humanity is the spark that drove our scientists to risk igniting our atmosphere to win a war. Humanity is the spark that drove dictators to kill millions in pursuit of their beliefs. Humanity is the spark that drove countries to amass enough nuclear warheads to glass our planet ten times over. The things you took from us, compassion, mercy, unity, family, those are not humanity. Those are the yokes we put on our humanity to harness that spark for a better future. But you stripped them all away. And so humanity became the spark that drove our energies to find and create backdoors in your fleet's power core control units. Humanity became the spark that drove our scientists to invent selective nerve gas in a kitchen laboratory. Humanity became the spark that just turned your home planet into a toxic wasteland and your fleet into an enormous fireworks show. Humanity became the spark that drove us to pander and submit to suffer your indignities in order to get close enough to stab you in the back. Now, if we were the humans you picked up from Earth all those years ago, I would be declaring war on you. But you took our unity, so that hardly feels appropriate. I would tell you the rules of combat to spare your civilians, but you took our compassion, so they will find no relief. I would tell you to surrender, but you took our mercy, so it would do you no good. I will tell you one thing. It is time for humanity to start taking back. Pray that we find what you took before humanity burns this entire galaxy to ash. Excerpt from Richard Staver's Declaration of Human Independence. End of story. The Tropper, written by Mean Gator. This is it. The battle was about to begin. If we lose, this would be the battle to end all battles. If we won, the onslaught will be continued without ending on the horizon. Parseval wasn't genocidal. A slave of civilization needs its slaves. If we lost, we would survive as a species, but what makes us human would not. We would be slaves with crushed spirits, bred to serve our conquerors. We fought each other like demons. But the slavers were more numerous, though slightly less advanced. We fought them, as no one had fought before. We earned their respect, but they couldn't allow us to win the fight. It would mean the end of their way of life. So we fought, system after system, planet after planet, moon after moon, asteroid after asteroid. It was a numbers game, and we just haven't them. Slowly, and on and on they pushed. They paid an unholy price for every inch of space taken away from us, but they kept pushing. Their losses were immense, but they had numbers we didn't. They kept pushing until there was no other place to go for us. Their invasion fleets were devastated, but so were ours. Their jumping technology was inferior. They couldn't jump deep in our sun's gravity well. They jumped at Pluto's orbit, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars were on the other side of the sun, and that was both good and bad for both. They have superior numbers, but not enough to attack us from both ways of the ecliptic, so they jumped to a distance of Neptune's orbit vertical to the ecliptic plane. On the side of Earth, we couldn't use Saturn's, Jupiter's, and Mars's fortifications, but we hadn't to worry for them either. They couldn't jump deep in the sun's gravity well, but we could. 
If needed, we could support defending them, but this would divide us, and the numbers were bad. Really bad. In the end, the R. Savar's fleet decided to attack Earth directly. If they won, the rest of the intersolar colonies would have no other option than to surrender or go in a suicidal boom. But humans, in general, don't do that. Dumb Spiro Sparrow, as long as I breathe, I hope. Do you know the story of Pandora's box? Actually, it wasn't a box. It was a pythos, a large jar. Pandora opened the jar and all the evils spelled out into the world. Frightened, she closed the jar, but it was too late. Only Alpus, Hope, remained in the box. Have you ever questioned yourself about the real meaning behind the story? I had, and to me the answer was very simple, very straightforward. If hope is something good, then why was it placed in the jar with all the evils? For me, hope is the evilest of all the evils. The Arsavar won, then what makes us human would be forever crushed. We would survive as a species, but we wouldn't survive as humans. Our fleet yards would work day and night to build more ships, not only to make our last stand, but to continue to fight. Arsavar weren't fools. Their lines were stretched to their limits, but their war machine wasn't set on idle. Even if they failed, they would have numbers to restart the fight. We devastated their initial evasion fleet, but at the end all we had were one carrier with 200 fighters, one hastily repaired battleship kept by duct tape and the wool of its crew, three battle cruisers, five cruisers, and 30 frigates and corvettes. In the end, we revived something from our history books, a gunship. Having the triple size of an attack bomber carried with the speed of a fighter and the punch of a frigate. One, one, one. It hasn't a chance in hell against an enemy ship larger than a frigate. But they were relatively cheap to reduce and they could stand the punch of enemy fighters and bombers. Truth is, we need more than 30 of them to take down an enemy super battleship. But their role was not to take down capital ships, was to devastate the enemy fighters and to weaken the larger enemy warships. We built thousands of them. They gutted the enemy and fought the good fight, but in the end only 150 of them were left. The Arsavar have three super battleships, 10 battleships, 15 battle cruisers, no heavy or light cruisers were left, and about 200 frigates and corvettes. Their carrier have not survived the invasion, but all of their ships were equal or larger to a battle cruiser, hosted its share of fighter squadrons, all what was left of them. Their troop carriers waited in the conquered systems three jumps away. Human ships could jump further than the enemy and have the ability for intra-system jumps. So, it was not safe for troop carriers to be near the battle, should the unthinkable for the enemy happen. As I said, the Arsava were no fools. It was bad. It was very bad. Without the gunships, we would stand no chance in hell, and even with them, our chances were just slightly larger than infinitesimal. We, the crews of the gunships, bombers, and fighters, knew that we were a cannon father. We would fight and give our lives just to harass and weaken the enemy, just to buy time for our warships. Gunships would gone first to protect bombers and fighters from what was left of the enemy fighter squadrons, and then split. Gunships to attack their super battleships and battleships, and bombers to attack their lighter warships. It was a good tactic as it could be. Their frigates and corvettes couldn't stand the attack of the gunships and the bombers, and used concurrently as cannon fodder to protect their heavy ships or what was left of our heavy ships. We'd go first, take as many of the ships with us as we could, and die in the hope that we've thinned the enemy fleet enough so that our heavier warships have a chance to win the day. A slight chance, it was better than we could hope. A gunship have a crew of five. We knew that we would die, but there was no chance in hell to go quietly into the night. We would draw blood until we couldn't. Guys, are you ready? Gunner 1, go. Gunner 2, go. Gunner 3, go. Engineering, go. We waited the order, each one lost in his thoughts. We have said our goodbyes. We've kissed our wives and children, and we went to fight. In ancient Sparta, the mother or the wife of the warrior gave them a shield, saying, With it or on it. We knew that we wouldn't survive the fight, and even if humans won, there would be nothing of us left to bring to our homes by our comrades. We would die as humans in order for the rest to survive as humans. 
I got the order in my comm line. This is it, guys. It's really an honor. Same here, Cap, said Johnson. Gunner number one. Lewis, it was indeed a beautiful friendship. Masterson, Gunner two, an avid Casablanca fan. We would always have Paris at Peppers and Estacio, Gunner three, and also an avid Casablanca fan. Play it again, Sam, I ordered, smiling our engineer. He pumped up the volume, and on we charged. You'll take my life, but I'll take yours too. You'll fire your musket, but I'll run you through. So when you're waiting for the next attack, you better stand, there's no turning back. The bugle sounds as the charge begins, but as the battlefield, no one wins. The smell of acrid smoke and horses breathe, as you plunge into certain death. The horse he sweats with fear, we break to run, the mighty roar of the Russian guns. And as we race towards human war, the screams of pain as my comrades fall. We hurdle bodies that lay on the ground, and as the Russians fire another round, we get so near, get so far away, we won't live to fight another day. We get so close near enough to fight, when the Russians get me in his sights, he pulls the trigger and I feel the blow, a burst of rounds takes my horse below. And as I lay there gazing at the sky, my body's numb and my throat is dry. And as I lay forgotten and alone, Without a tear, I draw my parting groan. End of story. Story number two. We did it ourselves. Written by a British tea company. Me are most impressed. Emperor Sefriel commented as he walked through the skeleton of a proud city undergoing its rebirth. There are few things that I admire more than determination or the sheer will to battle on against impossible efforts. Your efforts of defeating those loathsome colonizers, even with the odds stacked against your people, shows little but your true underlying strength. I am glad you approve, General Edward said as you casually leaned against the wall. Twenty years, twenty goddamn years that we fought against the alien freaks. Glad that we can call Earth our world again. It does me proud knowing that our boys were willing to lay everything on the line to make sure we got our dues. Your men lack nothing when it comes to character. To say that they could measure themselves against our own warriors would be an excellent statement to make in regards to their ability. What bothers us, however, was your choice in this conflict. This war has cost many lives. In the beginning, we had told you about the depths of our power, we had demonstrated towards you the limitless power and the eternal army, and the infinite ability of our personal self. Why then, did you refuse the aid that we could easily save countless lives and won you your war? When you first appeared out of the portal, some of us here thought that you were a second coming of Christ. Well, the second coming of Christ, who is perhaps a bit more metal than the first time around. Normally, when someone tells me that there is some immortal space wizard, I tend not to take them very seriously. Of course, given the circumstances which we met, I understood you meant every word that you said. I get that you're some space wizard who's a god emperor of some empire in another universe where humanity is the top of the food chain. Chances are, I'm willing to bet that you could have just lifted a finger and erased most of the aliens from existence. It is well within our capacity. What is not within our understanding is your stubborn refusal to our power. Was it honor that motivated your actions? You had spoken about it during your battles, as respectable of a trait as it happens to be. There are times when ideals begin to cost lives. It costed lives, I know that. If I had taken your help, I could have had space wizards and space dragons rampaging all around the planet until you finished off the last of the aliens. The thing is, once I take help from you, what then? We won the battle against the aliens by ourselves. Not because we asked ourselves from a possible future to stomp them into the earth. We won our war on our own sweat and our own blood. I think when I tell my children in the future about how we took on their fancy death rays with our slug shooters, we'll have more to live up to and aspire to than if I told them how we got a few space wizards to magic them out of existence. End of story. Complacency. Written by Dino Maillard. Grangval walked into the Emperor Thunken's throne room, trying to stop shaking at the thought of being executed after presenting his report. 
He looked at the members of the Emperor's entourage and saw them averting their eyes, knowing his fate. As he approached the Emperor, he knelt and waited for permission to speak. Speak, announced the Emperor impatiently, as he has been waiting for this report for several cycles. Die have completed the investigation into the failure of the sole conquest, your eminence, Kragvar said without looking up to face the emperor. It is about time now. Who do I blame and are they still alive so that I can execute them? The emperor said angrily. There is not a single individual to blame, your eminence, but it was multiple failures that all seemed to be due to complacency. Kragvar meekly said, hoping to get the chance to explain before being killed in a fit of rage the Emperor is known for. Explain, yelled the Emperor, suppressing his rage at the first failure of his species in thousands of generations. As you know, the subjugation of the humans went as planned, and without any surprises. Our ships entered orbit and destroyed all major cities and military complexes, resulting in the destruction of half of the population as per the standard invasion plans. This is where the first point of failure occurred. Point of failure, the emperor erupted. It was a complete success. The humans capitulated when they realized that they were no match for our superior might. They fell in line and were used to for 20 of their solar rotations without any significant resistance. How was there a failure? We destroyed their military complexes, but we failed to destroy all of their weapons. Kragvar said, knowing that correcting the Emperor usually resulted in immediate death. The report said that we destroyed all the weapons they used against us. Are you saying that General Mragran lied on his reports? No, Your Eminence. We did destroy all weapons that were used against us. My finding is that they had so many weapons that after the first ones failed, they did not try any others. Their weapons were useless against us, so what if they did not destroy all of them? The Emperor said as he leaned back and waved his hand as if to brush aside the notion. They did not use them against us directly, but found other uses for them. How do we not detect that what they were doing? The emperor asked, becoming curious as to how such a primitive species could get the upper hand on the great empire. That leads us to the second point of failure. As you said, the humans capitulated quickly, and we were able to send down an exosuit plasma drillers and ore haulers to get the deep mining started right away. There was only one major counterattack in that first solar rotation, and it was quelled quickly, and as required, we executed 100,000 humans as punishment. They seemed to learn the lesson, and there was no more resistance. For five solar rotations, everything was proceeding as normal. Yes, yes, I know all this. Get to the point of failure. The Emperor said, exasperatingly. As with all of our conquests, there are always pirates and contraband peddlers that will evade our detection and expropriate some local goods to sell. Usually just rare items, wanted to fill some rich connoisseur's collection, or some kind of local food or drink that is part of the latest fad. There are these fruits that cause a burning sensation and can cause death in some cases, but the young generation are willing to chance it, to try and one-up one another to see who can eat the hardest. Kragmar looked up at the Emperor and saw that he had placed his hand on his mace. He realized he better get to the point quickly, else his death would be near. Because it is common, most of these incursions are ignored. But in one instance, it was noticed when the ship left the plasma driller. That is not unheard of, but rare. So, it was reported. A new one was requisitioned, and everything continued on. It was twenty cycles later, before the ship was apprehended, and they found the transponder of the plasma driller embedded into the contraband they had aboard. Their failure was that they did not notify General Mirakran, and they only found the transponder, not a complete driller, so he did not know why humans had it. Why did we not detect the humans using the driller, and where were they storing the material they removed if they were using it? The Emperor asked. Without a transponder, the drillers are hard to track and the humans tunneled deep under a large deposit of uranium, which interfered with our scanning signals. This showed a third point of failure. Once a vein of ore is mined out, we never scan that vein again. The humans were able to put the material they were removing into the old veins, so we never found it. Is it too hot for humans to survive in that depth without an exosuit? And they only had one, so what good did their digging do? That's the fourth point of failure. 
We take some of our basic technology for granted, but the humans did not have access to it before, and it allowed them to advance their abilities. Something as simple as a cooling system we use is far advanced from their current capabilities. Same for the magnetics that we use in the plasma control systems. With these advancements, they were able to create a tolerable environment to work in. Even so, what did they do with the tunnels? Not just tunnels, but larger caverns that they set up manufacturing equipment and even a foundry. That brings up the fifth point of failure. We carefully watched the humans' construction projects and any equipment that was created to make sure where they went and what they were being used for. But we failed to pay attention to the parts they were making. The humans were having parts made all across the planet, and they were being smuggled into the tunnels to create equipment. I do not have the exact time frame, but I estimate that it took five solar rotations to create all the manufacturing processes needed. What were they manufacturing? First, they created more plasma diggers, although their design was primitive and not as durable as our design. They were able to create them quickly. But the diggers, they created deep tunnels all around the world to move supplies, deeper than our scans could pick up. Using our designs for the exosuits, they also created an army armed with the railguns that they were able to create with our magnetic and cooling technologies. They mined uranium and created aluminium projectiles with uranium tips and cores. I've estimated that they built these weapons for ten solar rotations. Even with that kind of weapon, if they attacked, they would be destroyed from orbit, so it would do them no good. Yes, which leads us to the sixth failure. Craig Voss said, extremely surprised that he had not been killed yet. Despite our protocols, our orbital patterns were predictable over long periods, and the humans figured them out. They dug deep pits below large rock formations at strategic locations, lowered the nuclear weapons we failed to destroy into the bottom of them, then filled them with water and set off the weapons, sending our rock formations directly into our ship. We would have detected the detonations, and our shields would easily stop them. How did they fail? The Emperor asks, growing weary of excuses. For twenty solar rotations, there was no activity, and the captains grew complacent, so there was no officers on the bridge of four of the ships during the attack, which would be the seventh failure. The fifth ship had only one officer on the bridge, but he was not close enough to familiar enough with the shield's controls to activate them in time exposing the eighth failure in making sure all officers are fully trained on all equipment. How was he an officer without being trained? He was promoted because of nepotism. His father was the captain. The only ship to survive was the General MacGrand's flagship. He had a full complement on his bridge, and they got their shields up in the time and moved partially out of the way. But they still incurred damage from the hit that restricted their movement. By protocols, he should have ordered a full evacuation and started glassing the planet yelled the Emperor. He did, Your Highness. This gives us the ninth failure. The humans used the army they created to take over several of the shuttles they managed to fly them to the general's ship. Our systems are so easy to use, the humans did not need any experience to fly them, and we did not have any safeties to stop them from using them. Let me guess, the next failure was that we did not detect them in the shuttles, the Emperor said, being pretty sure he knew what was coming next. Correct. That was the tenth failure. They managed to get on board and expose the eleventh failure. Usually, there are enough guards in the landing bay to handle any kind of incursion like this, but they had gotten lax, and only a minimal number of guards were on duty, and they were quickly overwhelmed. Then the humans did something we had never anticipated, exposing the twelfth failure. They used the plasma cutters to weld the doors shut. When the rest of the guards arrived, they could not get in until they could get the doors cut. But it was too late. The humans had used the plasma cutters to breach the engine cores and the shuttles and detonated them, destroying the ship and the general with it. Suicide mission. At least they died as warriors instead of cowards. That I can respect. As for the rest, we will send a new fleet and destroy the humans. As the emperor was giving orders to ensure the same mistakes were not made, Kragvar received a new message on his datapad. Your eminence, this is one more failure to report. Who could be responsible for another failure if everyone is dead? The Emperor asked in a resigned tone. The failure would be mine. It appears I led the humans here, to our homeworld. As soon as he finished that statement, a blinding flash was the last thing they saw when one of their freighters, fully loaded and with mined material and ore, slammed into the planet at maximum speed. End of story. Gods Among Men 
written by Hull's Kitchen Sink. I confess, Emissary, I do not quite understand. Oh, the chosen diplomat of humanity's god smile, leaning back. Please, please, uh, share your concerns with your grossness. Well, your form, it confuses me. Really? The god drained one of the small bulbs of fluid, leaning back. The heavenly vessel hovered in the aether at the edge of the system's world. A small parcel sat in his lap. The gods of the system had offered it a gift, a symbol of their intentions. Tell my fellow Kachak, the endless devourer. I swept my hand towards the corner of the room. The room ended abruptly, cut off by a line of absolute darkness. On the world of Tenpik, the psychosynthetic dwellers are ever ambling creatures. Their high metabolism requires constant exposure to sunlight, and so they wander the great central band continent in a never-ending trek to avoid nightfall. Characterized by the sharp definition, thanks to the thin atmosphere of the world, those who slow fall behind closer to the dividing line between life and death. He is what the Tenpec fear the most. Hmm, very impressive, said the god, scratching behind one of his ears, trading his fingers through his brilliant red hair. It was long, shaggy, and hung across his bright blue eyes. I mean, I assume he is, behind the darkness. Let's the imagination do all those spooky things, doesn't it? Quite, I said, nonplussed. Or Ratakafar, matriarch of phages. Before they achieved spaceflight, the Par were preyed upon by the great Tar. The quick and agile Car and the vicious ambush predators, the Far. She who has the body of the Tar and the limbs of the Car, and the head and tail of the Far. She represents the most primal terror of being devoured, as was the fate of nine Par out of ten for most of their recorded history. Even now her temples contain the sacred predators, and miscreants are fed to them, or occasionally the unlucky, when the miscreants are unavailable. A reminder that they were prey, and always shall remain prey. Oh yes, the god nodded. Excellent teeth. Reminds me of Jormungandr. Very impressive. Very frightening. I bet Par absolutely loathe the... No, oh, of course, all great tune, the frequency which kills, who represents the shatter tone for the crystalline. Look, I rather feel as though you're, you're trying to tell me something here. What? It's, it's, exactly. Do you represent, well, uh, said the emissary, quite a few things. Ah, let me see. Uh, there's a phenomenon on Midgard, sorry, the human's world. You see, the atmosphere is somewhat unstable. Heart and cold pressure systems meet. At different levels of humidity can cause water to precipitate. The same situation can cause the electric charge of the atmosphere to become unbalanced. Sufficient imbalances leads to localized transfer of charge, creating a temporary stream of plasma. That's called lightning. The momentarily high energy environment creates a vacuum which implodes. The humans call it thunder. Fearsome, I said, nodding slowly, understanding being. I find divine attribute. Does it kill many people? Uh, well, not really, the god said, chuckling. <laughs> Does a little property damage, uh, starts the occasional fire, but the thunder's largely harmless. Scary, but harmless. The lightning, well, there's a human saying that mentions how unlikely it is to hurt them. Ah, my brow and a log furled. Again, I fear that we are experiencing something of a translation issue. Look. I think I understand where all of this is coming from. My brother talked me through it. He wanted to come along, but something demanded his attention. Now, uh, your government, a uh, theocracy, you have cowed the civilians that gave birth to you, made them into your slaves, all of that. You use them as food source, uh, feeding on their beliefs, demanding things of them, so on and so forth, running quite an impressive little stellar empire. Love the battle fleet, by the way. My question is not meant to offend... Some gods are simply uh, loathe to cooperate. They believe that they can keep their civilization to themselves, act as soul tyrants, rather than benefiting from a mutualistic relationship. You, said Rata Kafar, her voice muffled by many sharp teeth, do not appear to have such an antagonistic attitude. The gods' lips pulled back, revealing sharp enamel fangs, shining a bright white. I was given to understanding it was meant as a friendly gesture in human society. A smile. I tried not to let it get to me. Rata Kafar, 
claws extended, and her own fight and flight reflexes clearly tried to overpower her sapiens to set her into killing frenzy against an unknown predator that was indicating it wanted to eat her. Radha I said warningly. Yes, said the emissary. Broadly correct. We have no interest in going it alone. He tilted his head towards the other human god. This one was similar in appearance, though his hair was cut short, his garments far smaller, covering less of his epidermis, but still white-haired and red-headed. Set, the god of violence and foreigners. He represented a subdivision of the natural order amongst the humans who worshipped his pantheon. Of, of course, he was also the guardian against the darkness. He fought a bep each night in order to protect Ra, part of his penance for murdering his brother Osiris. Set nodded silently, his eyes still fixed on Kachak. He hadn't looked away from the god of darkness for the entire tete-a-tete. No, I see, I said, trying to follow the statement. Look, my point is this. Gods represent the attitude of the universe towards the sapient race. The way they view the universe is the way their gods evolved. In an entropic universe like ours, full of predators, resource shortages, and dangerous natural phenomenon, we represent the things that they fear most. I can't help but notice that you both look quite a lot like humans. Well, uh, th they can be very scary, said Thor cheerfully. But somewhat relatable. You understand the difficulty, don't you? If you look like humans, well, they have something of a tendency to treat you like humans. Do not fear you. Do not respect you as they should. You really should be more, uh, well, inhuman. Terrify them. Ah, I know what you mean. You see, we have plenty of such gods. Well, had. There was this one time, well, precious object that had stolen from me. My brother and I learned that it had been stolen by such a god, who intended to marry one of the most beautiful goddesses. She refused to cooperate with our scheme, so I was forced to dress up as her. We went to the hall of the other god, with me in all the bridal veil and gown, and when we found the precious object, after fooling the other god, I proceeded to beat him to death, and uh, savage the other giants within the hall for their obst obstinance. A shocked silence weighed heavily in the air as I stared blankly at the emissary. The admission of decide. Ah, I'm sorry, the, the joke must not translate well. My kind find great humor in big, strong men dressed in delicate feminine clothing. You killed another god, said the great Tune, beautifully tonal voice fluctuating slightly. Oh, stone dead, I mean... It was hardly the first time. I've killed a fair number of gods in my time. None for quite a long time, of course. Uh, we're all far more civilized now. Anyway, what you're referring to are what the humans might call monsters. And certainly, I have plenty of experience with them. I should hope so, I said, my voice strained. At any rate, I'm sorry. Please allow me to take a moment. I am receiving an urgent message. I stood up, sweeping to the communications suite. Out of sight, Zakuk, the god of bloody invaders, a god who had come about when a foreign civilization had risen on our home world, putting thousands of my worshippers to the sword. He had been my people's god, of course, but he'd never tired of slaughtering them, making him an ideal commander. Zakuk, my good friend, it's good to get away from these gods. They're all difficult. The fleet is out of position, growled Zakuk through the mouthful of blood. They are scattered, going in various directions. They are claiming to act on your orders, Fitzik. What is happening? I cannot countermand an order from you. I stared blankly and struck the frequency modulator, contacting the mortal leader of the invasion fleet. He appeared on the screen, his forehead on the ground, in a position of obeisance. Mortal! I thundered, letting my voice fill the blood and... Oh yes, I liked this new term, thunder, that belonged to the god of sun that burns letting my radiance pour through the communication to burn his skin. He's screaming, filling the air. Return to your position immediately. Instruct the other ships of the fleet to do the same. But my lord, you ordered us to break communications. Only your suite can properly contact us all and provide the counter orders. You contacted me with the orders personally, not an hour ago. I cursed internally. It would take hours. I stepped away from the suite after blasting the cowering mortal into a pillar of salt. Emissary, I'm sorry, something has come up. I must cut this meeting short. Ah, I understand. Please, allow me to offer my gift first. 
He set down a parcel and opened it slowly, tilting it towards me. I frowned. A war hammer? Oh, quite so. He took the war hammer out of the package. It seems rather short. Aren't such weapons meant to be made two-handed? My brother commissioned it for me. In trying to cheat the makers, he wound up introducing a flaw into it, giving it a shorter handle than it was meant to have. The guard's eyes twinkle. He was always a troublesome one. Still, it's a very fine weapon. If the wielder throws it, it'll always return to the hand. I wanted you to have it before I left. Interesting, I said, impressed despite myself. A primitive weapon, not much good in an era of stars and vast fleets, but still the of obvious Poussians. How does it work? The god's teeth shined again, sharp and fearsome. As he slipped his wrist through the strap, letting the heavy metal head fall until it was hung by the strap from his wrist. He casually spun it up twice around his wrist as the partner leaned forward in his chair, eyes fixed on Kachak. Let me demonstrate, said Thor. End of story. Story number one, The New Colleague, written by Wanny91. Marketing Manager's Log, Sill Corporation, Year 2654. 01.05 My friend from the HR department informed me today that I will get a new employee starting next month. It seems that our management has finally heard my plea for more people in order to deal with the heavy influx of work recently. According to the personnel file, the new employee comes from a newly discovered species called Humanity and goes by the name Philip. I'm looking forward to meet him. 01.06 Note to all employees Due to a small incident during the introduction of our newest team member, it is now forbidden for everyone to greet any human with their traditional ritual called handshake. I'm sure that our new colleague didn't intend to break anyone's limb. 02.06 Philip received a pay rise of 20% today because he called our CEO slim and good-looking, even though this isn't true at all. Apparently, it helps your career if you flatter your boss. 05.06 in order to not put too much pressure on Philip, I send him home on the remainder of the week. My only hope is that 13 days are enough time for him to recover from the stress. 18.06 It appears the humans are very fast learners since Philip has already completed his two-week-long training course in just three days. Apparently, humans have, in comparison to other species, a very developed cerebral cortex and thus are capable of adjusting themselves quickly to new situations. Since Philip has already finished his training course and we don't have any work for him planned yet, I send him home again. 25.06 Poor Philip. His first real day at work and he had attended several long and tedious meetings. Still, I have to say that he managed the meetings very well, which, uh, according to him, was thanks to the human technique called napping. It is nice to see Philip working so hard for the benefit of our company. 02.07 Today, Philip accidentally destroyed his office chair after trying to sit on it for the first time. As I was informed, humans come from a planet with high gravity and thus are heavier than they look like. Because Philip can't do any work without his chair, I send him home again. 06.07 Philip accidentally destroyed his computer. It seems like that is his species is prone to short outbursts of anger if their equipment does not work correctly. Since he can't work without a computer, I have to send him home. 12.07. A bulletproof window was installed after Philip threw out his new computer when it didn't work. As a punishment, I forbid him to work for four days. 13.07. It is forbidden for Philip to clap with his hands sarcastically if the computer works as intended. Two colleagues had to go to the hospital since they couldn't hear anything anymore. 15.07. What a busy day. We got swarmed with work, but Philip managed well. He even managed to finish his share of the work before lunch. As a thanks for that, I promised to buy him lunch today. 15.07 Afternoon Note to myself, never buy lunch for Philip again. Despite their look, humans can eat for ten of my kind. My wallet can't afford that much again. 18.07 Philip saved our entire company today. All of our computers suddenly didn't work anymore, but he saved the day by doing something called turning it off and on again. Note to self, suggest Philip for a promotion. 21.07 I'm very fond of Philip. 
Despite the fact that he already does the biggest share of the work in our department, he still offered to help out his colleague whose son had an accident. According to Philip, writing two more business letters wasn't too much to do, even though it takes usually six hours to write one of them. Could it be that humans have a higher metabolic rate than other species and thus have a faster perception of time? Note to self, find out humans' metabolic rate and know if this would affect the economy. 25.07 as a thank you for helping him out, Zok No Lin offered to buy Philip lunch. Unfortunately, I was too late to warn him, and he spent over half of his fortune to buy food for Philip. It seems like the pride of his species prevented Zog No Lin from taking back his offer after finding out how much Philip can eat. 31.07 At the annual meeting of the department managers, it was revealed that the productivity of my department has gone up 300% since Philip had joined my team. 12.07 Because Philip is capable to do most of our department's work alone, three other members of my team were let go. Because of Philip's efficiency, our CEO is considering hiring more humans. 17.08 I finally learned what the word napping means. I rebuked Philip for sleeping during the meeting and submitted an official complaint to the HR department. 18.08 Our CEO has personally torn off my written complaint about Philip. It seems like he helps your career if you are nice to the CEO and go regularly out to drink with him. 24.08 I found out that humans have indeed a faster metabolic rate than other species and thus are able to work so much faster than anyone else. I have also found out that humans compare us to the native animal on their home planet called a sloth. 25.08 Well, I tried to warn the government that our entire economy was at stake due to the fast metabolism of humans. Philip introduced a hot liquid called coffee, which increased the company's overall productivity by 200%. It seems like my worries were unjustified since all the employees are now capable of working as fast as Philip. 31.09. Due to the liquid coffee, productivity in all departments has gone up 300%. 10.10. Automatic log update due to mentioning of company name and press. Name of company was mentioned two times in the following context. The market was shocked today by the announcement that the company Sill Corporation had to permanently close their doors after all their employees had been delivered to the hospital earlier this week. According to the doctors, most staff members suffered complete exhaustion due to ergogenic drug which was found inside a brown liquid. Due to the virulence of said liquid, not only got the CEO of the company arrested, but the whole company had to be put into quarantine. At first, investors of the company were worried about the sudden closure of the company, but the announcement of a newly founded company by one of the Sill Corporation's foreign employees named Philip managed to calm the markets down again. End of story. Story number two. Two more shall take his place, written by British Tea Company. The sergeant stood up from the trenches and walked forward, moving past the charred skeletons and ruined war machines. He continued to move forward towards the titanic creature in the not-so-far distance away from him. The heat became almost unbearable in the area around it, from the gigantic crater it rested in to the countless wreckage and destruction around it. It was also almost impossible to imagine such a thing could exist. The size of a mountain, with legs taller than houses, the sergeant's eyes fell upon Farrakh. The iron dragon glanced down. Perhaps it was slightly amused that there was still one remaining human left, which was why it howled off the incinerating this one. Performing a mock salute with the claws at the sergeant, the dragon stood to its full height, its two eyes malevolent and haughty locked on to the last man standing. Come to join your friends. That's the only thing left for me to do. The big dragon gave a snort in response as it mirthlessly looked down. You survived. You survived me laying waste to this area. Impressive. Indeed, the sergeant had survived the initial attack. Like the star of morning, Farrakh had came crushing down from the skies and leveled an entire city. Most of the division died in the initial attack. Those who didn't either met their end at Farrakh's molten iron breath had either fled or now had been killed in the panic that ensued. The sergeant said nothing as he reached for his sword. His knuckles whitened. He remembered Wilhelm's screams when the fissures opened up and the man fell in. 
he recalled old man Hemming's eyes, the way he closed his eyes so peacefully when the tides of molten iron took him. He recalled his best friend Carl, holding the siege engines to the last of his debris, and molten iron came for him. Instead of making a futile gesture, I have a better idea, Farrakh said as he contemplated deeply at the sight of the insect drawing a half-broken sword. You survived the initial attack, and you chose not to flee. A test of both ability and will. How about uh, you join me? Join me, recruit followers to my cause, and uh, how do you humans say it? You'll get a piece of the pie, yes. Good deal, yes. The sergeant said nothing as he examined his broken weapon. He adopted a fighter's stance as much as his weary body allowed and looked up. So before I crush you, what reasoning do you have to refuse? I can lie down and have a nap here, maybe a few good decades or so, and you'll have passed away from old age before even as much as a splitting a single scale. Join me like I ask, and you will live to reap the rewards. I didn't survive this long just to cast my lot in with the devil, the sergeant said. I didn't watch all my friends die just to be your pawn now. We didn't all bleed and die for me to just be a turncoat. I suppose a sense of honor and loyalty are commendable, if not misplaced. You are mere ants coming from your mounds to try and defend yourself from a torrential storm. The dragon lifted his foot and caused the skies to go dark as the sergeant looked up and closed his eyes, his conscience at peace. When I fall, a hundred more will come to take my place. Mounds today, Farrakh, swept away in a storm of terror. But tomorrow, mountains will rise to defy you. You cannot hope to win! End of story. They did what? Pets, written by Intellectual Golf. Talia inhaled the captivating aroma of a chamomile tea and sighed deeply. There was nothing quite like chamomile tea for soothing your nerves. She couldn't stop a small smile at the thought of how contrary it was to add caffeine to chamomile. But without it, she would have fallen asleep hours before, and so she enjoyed a small sip of her blasphemous beverage. Traditionalists be damned, the ability to add caffeine to literally anything had made coffee a product that rose and fell in popularity like other cultural fads. An odd, high-pitched whistle sound announced the presence of something at the other end of her desk, and she opened her eyes just enough to squint through her lashes at the patron. She quickly closed her eyes again at the slight wave of queasiness coursed through her at the sight of the Utlantaku. Talia considered that perhaps sight was not the correct term. The Utlantaku were a bizarre species that were hard to describe or make comparisons of, simply because they refused to be seen, mostly. Atlantico stood at average human heightish, took up about a human-sized area of space, and looked like a living watercolor painting from their immediate surroundings. Talia knew a fair amount about the cuttlefish, and their color-changing abilities were the closest comparisons she could make. But even that image failed to convey the non-appearance of the Atlantico. Excuse me... I believe this file might have been mislabeled. The noise that Talia heard filtered through her translator, sounded like three wildly pitching train whistles shifting rapidly between the higher ranges of human hearing. The Atlantico spoke exclusively in whistling language, although there were reports that said that actually had two languages, one private language only spoken amongst their own kind, and the public whistling language they used around other species. Talia wasn't sure how, Aside from outright spying, someone would have figured that out. But it wasn't extremely important. What a pleasant surprise. I'm sorry. I think I misunderstood. It is pleasant that a file is mislabeled. Talia blushed slightly in embarrassment as she realized she had spoken aloud. She tried her best to look at the Atlantico's face area as she spoke, although the queasy feeling the shifting colors evoked continued. My apologies. I meant that it was one of the more pleasant introductions I've had this week. Others are unpleasant. Oh, I'm not complaining. They mean well, but some patrons come across a little strong when providing a criticism of the filing system. 
It is not your job to receive feedback, such as a correction that brought me to here. Talia noticed that the translator didn't make the usual neutral tone it adopted when translating angry or negatively charged words. She assumed this meant that the Atlantico was simply stating a fact, which from a human could have come across as inconsiderate or socially awkward at best. Of course, speaking of, why do you believe that the file is mislabeled? The Atlantico paused for a second, and Talia couldn't be sure if this was still trying to figure out the meaning of a slip-up, or if it was doing something else entirely. Finally, one of its watercolor camouflaged appendages waved upwards slightly in a throwing-away gesture. The corner of Talia's mouth twitched upwards slightly in amusement, and yet another nearly an ununiversal gesture. This file is stored under the category Human Pets, and specifically, Adorable. This must be some kind of error. Talia raised her hand and made a come-hither gesture for her point of finger. The video screen popped up on a desk and began playing a video content associated with the file. On the screen, a smiling woman in her mid to late thirties with a vibrant red hair was speaking. Hey pet friends, I'm so excited today because today I have a new pet to show you all. The camera turns around and is pointing at a plastic container approximately three feet wide and two feet tall with no lid. Inside the container is a layer of sand, some small plants of indeterminate species, and a ball of fluffy blue fur about a foot wide and with two black orbs on either side of the ball facing the camera. Talia couldn't help but gasp slightly, and it would have been fair to guess whether the response was in shock or adoration. That's right, my friends, it's a Greekel. Now, for those of you who don't know, these little guys are pretty tough to keep as pets. But if you're an expert like me, there is no problem. And for all your trolls out there, there is nothing illegal about owning a Greekel. You jokes just keep trying to demonetize me and claim that I'm not a responsible pet mom. I am still here, so obviously you are wrong. The camera began moving towards the Greekel, and the woman continued narrating. But the audio was suddenly cut off as the blue furball launched itself at the camera and became 90% teeth. Talia paused the video as she realized she hadn't checked the tags for the video before hitting play, and she chided herself mentally for forgetting once again. She brought up the tags and what she read made her inhale and clench her teeth, creating a hissing sound. The Atlantic had made a sing-songy whistling sound, and the translator informed her that it was laughing. Talia raised an eyebrow at while maintaining a neutral expression. The Atlantico repeated the sing-song whistle and then after a beat explained, I apologize, I found it amusing that your species also has a display associated with false pain. What you might call empathy. My species hisses in response to disaster or potential disaster as well. We also express disbelief, confusion or consternation with a common physical expression. Although I think you must take my word on that given how we appear to others. Talia chuckled in response and then eyed the video screen askance. The tags on the video were pet, adorable, greekel, blood gore, dismemberment, idiot, etc. She wasn't especially surprised as she had seen more than a few videos and photos of the aftermath of a human interaction with greekels. The issue was that the cute little fur ball sitting in the plastic container was essentially made up of three things, fur, teeth, and an insatiable appetite. Greekles had developed on a volcanic planet in the outskirts of their solar system, warm enough thanks to the core and volcanic activity to support life. But so far away from the sun, most of the planet's surface was frozen tundra. The Greekle were the top predator on their planet, indiscriminately consuming any organic material they came across, living or not. The physiology reflected this omnivorous predatory nature as their mouths were filled with hundreds of plate-like teeth that were smooth on the exterior side and serrated on the interior. Whatever went into a Greekle's mouth was not leaving, barring the destruction of the Greekle or the complete separation of the portion lost to the maw of the Greekle. Talia had no intention of watching the rest of the video since she did not enjoy the sight of blood or derive any joy from the pain of others. She didn't quite understand people who did, but she tried not to judge since she certainly had her own faults. So it is incorrectly labeled, correct? Talia sighed heavily and pressed her lips together making a <laughs> sound. Yes and no. How is it both well? 
technically and legally Greekos on pets. So yes, it shouldn't be filed under human pets. But also it is a pet because us humans are um, overly optimistic or more crazy. Obviously, but I do not see what the human propensity for self-endangerment has to do with the correct labeling of media. So, I can retag this and then file it correctly under dangerous animals. However, within a week, the automated filing intelligence, AFI, will put the right back into the pet section. Lots of people are going to retag the video, since that's where they expect to see it. And that's what the media was created under. It should not matter if many incorrect people say a thing that is wrong. The number of incorrect voices does not change the fact that they are incorrect. If only the fact that thing was true was enough to convince people to treat it as a fact, then humans and most other intelligent species wouldn't repeat history. The fact is, it'll get retagged because some very stubborn or dense people believe Greekles can be pets. The Atlantico made a low humming whistle. I must admit, we also suffer from the habit of mass incorrectness, so I am not so dense as to not understand. May I question, though? Of course, like I said, you're the nicest person I've interacted with all week, and I love sharing information. Why would this human female attempt to make a Greekle her pet? Are you humans not the species that discovered the Greekle? I am fairly certain the videos from First Contact were quite popular in the information sharing spaces. Yeah, uh, thing is, they are adorable when their mouths are closed, so uh, people think that they are cute. They can be tamed or, at the very least, sated and made docile. But every encounter with the Greek, hungry or not, ends like this video. Right, uh, um, I can't really explain it. But I can tell you humans are like Greekles, in the same way they eat anything and everything in sight. I can guarantee humans will at some point try to make anything and everything into a pet, especially if it's adorable. The Atlantico was quiet for several moments, and then set the hard disk on the desk. Would it be too much to refile this anyways? <laughs> no problem at all, just don't get cross at me when it's back under pets in a few days. I would not be angry with you. You did not design the AFI. Why would I be angry with you for something you did not do? If I could answer that, I would be a very wealthy psychologist. It looks like I have another patron to assist, but it was very nice interacting with you. You as well. My name is Seven Warbling Whistles, Timothy. Nice to meet you, Timothy. I'm Talia. Have a great day. Talia turned to assist the other patron, Pesita Walken, who had walked into her desk and was literally waving around the hard disk in one of its feathered appendages. It made several very loud squawks, which were even louder than the parrot species from Earth the aliens bore a striking resemblance to. If a parrot had been crossbred with a pterodactyl and a six-limbed mammal. What is animal excrement? Oh, goody. End of story. Story number one, Demons Awoken, written by a lone donut. There is a human saying, to beat your plowshares into swords, your pruning shears into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Our research has missed old religious texts in our scanning of their culture. And how could we not? There was not real need to research archaic beliefs. The Soul Confederacy was easy prey, a species that had focused on science and not war. They built grand research stations in orbit of their planet, colonized their oversized moon, and spread to the fourth planet in their system. The most they had were patrol ships to keep off the odd criminal, but no warships, no soldiers. They focused on rehabilitation and re-education of their worst people. They were pacifists. And they were ripe for enslavement. Our ships had arrived, and they broadcast on all known subspace channels, reaching out to the void to greet us, to welcome us to their home. They assumed that we came in peace, to meet them as equals. They were excited, 
as the first of our cruisers took up orbit. We fired upon their homeworld, launching their space elevators from their moors and pushing them out of orbit. Their capital city was burned from orbit, and their meager defenses were crushed. Our breachhead was built on their home, and their people were enslaved. To strip this spinning blue gem of its resources for our empire, their moon fell next, and we grew complacent. We figured we had them, so why would we push? We were wrong. The first sign of trouble came from a drone carrier, which suddenly went silent. Communication errors happened, so we considered nothing of it. Next, a camp on the surface went blank, so we were sent soldiers to explore. We found our men and women dead, some looking so shocked in their chairs, it was as if the attacker had materialized from nowhere. We now sent boarding troops to the carrier. However, they never made it. Its fighter and bomber complement turned on us. We shut it down, watched it as it crashed to the surface, and we figured, not enough, that this little rebellion would end. Again, we were wrong. Mining and cargo ships from planets called Mars arrived, but they did not carry goods. Their mining drones swarmed the ships, punching holes in their hulls and stripping the atmosphere away. We watched in horror as the bodies of our comrades floated into space. Our losses were now mounting. Even as we destroyed their rigged up attack craft, we paid for every kill with blood. I was on Earth when I saw the horror we had awoken firsthand. A mining exosuit walked down the street, armor strapped to it in an ad hoc way, turning a tool into a weapon, carried in its hands were our weapons, and as a lone assailant advanced towards me, shrugging off energy weapons and ordnance, only a lucky hit brought it down. Still, the rebel climbed from his armor, and I saw his eyes, not those of a captured pacifist, but those of a killer. We learned later the man had been a chemical engineer, never served the patrols, and had built the suit himself in private. We assumed he had snapped. Surely the humans couldn't go from pacifists to warriors. They were a peaceful species. But we dug into their archives. We learned their history, the monsters that we had happened upon. But now they had 300 years of peace and prosperity to build new technologies. And with them, we learned what they could do. It was called a military-industrial complex. The ability to turn any technological marvel into a weapon was no unique. But the way in which they did it was... Most species developed nuclear energy before they developed nuclear weapons. Humanity had done the reverse. Their chemical rockets were not made to deliver them into space, but adapted from weapons to do so. After they had turned those weapons on themselves, they had learned to find peace, quell their demons. We had reawoken those demons and given them more technology than ever before to do it. Their ability to strip materials to energy to convert it back to raw matter had been used to mine without destroying massive areas of land and to build ships of exploration and peace. Now those fleet yards orbiting a planet we thought was an easy picking. They cranked out warships in bulk that we had never seen. Hardware meant for construction and rescue was now used to armored troops to attack. One armored assailant became hundreds, then thousands. Our own ships were captured, reversed engineered, and then turned on us. We watched in horror as our slaves became boogeymen. Our hope had been to glass the planet, to hand them a defeat, but we never got the chance. One by one, our legions fell. Once our ships were controlled by them and our communications with our home severed, we were brought before them. We learned of their rules of war, what they would do to prisoners, and how we would be treated. We didn't expect the mercy we gained, nor do we deserve it, I'm sure. After all, we would not afford them the same. I was treated to a tribunal and told that I was to be held accountable for my crimes and the crimes of my people, and my execution ordered. 
led to a small room. I was hooked up to IVs and promised that it would be painless. As they added the chemicals to my veins, I could only think of my home and hope that they could forgive me for awakening humanity. I could only pray that one day these beasts would return their swords to plowshares and the warriors would rest again. The galaxy can only hope. End of story. Story number two. Tunnel Vision, written by DM of the Tomb. Personal letter translated posthumously from civilian Adark Epai to the 7th Galactic Senator, Apex Lorne Oyen, during the human immigration crisis post-first contact. Have you ever seen a human in person? I don't mean the humans who tiptoe and jump through hoops to appeal to you during negotiations. I mean real humans. Humans out there living in their lives like anyone else. The ones who you lock up. Ever since first contact, you have written out policy after policy with the intent of limiting the humans to brand them as outcasts. They are a very young race, and yet achieved FTL in a fraction of the time it took us. Sure, simple concepts to us are new and advanced to them, but they can learn. And they are learning, even now, just as we did so long ago. But you seem to fear they are too quick to learn. You say the fact they advance so quickly is precisely why they must be segregated. But I believe you are simply afraid of their potential. Because maybe you have realized that they are not fast. We are just slow. But why is that? Why are humans who you seem intent on keeping away so quick to learn, so persistent in their endeavors, so bold risk-takers? I've spent time among the humans, in the camps which you detained them, away from their friends and family. Many crossed into Alliance's space and were caught, so you out them there to rot. But did you ever consider what it took to get that far? These humans told me their stories, told me of their families, goals, their passions, in life. And after it all, I have two words to explain the way humans think. Tunnel vision. To a human, there is no such thing as being content where you are. There is always more to see, more to travel, more to improve, more that they can be. No single human ever stops aspiring for greatness, even if they don't know what their potential greatness is. Once a human has a goal, and they always have a goal, they will stop at nothing to pursue it. They call this tunnel vision. They will set their sights on what they want to do, and everything else around them becomes a blur. This is why the humans are faster than us. We have meandering through innovation, the majority of our population always being content to stay where they are. Meanwhile, the humans are never satisfied. It's not just one or two people working for their future per generation. It is all of them. That's why I, despite all your efforts to bar them from our borders and to brand them as dangerous, they still send envoy after envoy to negotiate with you. That's why, despite your insistence to detain and imprison any human court within our space, they continue to face countless hardships to come here anyway from across the stars. And those who I spoke to within your border detentions have not yet lost their passion. They have not lost sight of their goals. They still have that tunnel vision. You claim that they will invade and replace us, overwrite generations of tradition in an instant. But we are ready for the humans, ready to give them help and accept their help in return. So maybe you're just afraid that you are the one getting replaced and that they'll take away your undeserved paycheck. End of story. Story number one. The Three Golden Rules. Written by Jeremiah Hellrider. In the Galactic Empire, there are three golden rules that each one of the 345 elector species needs to follow if they want to survive. Never fight against the Galactic Emperor alone. Never let your population starve. And always pay your mercenaries. 
Since the day Grand Emperor Dallas I united all nations in the galaxy under the rule of his galactic empire, there had been relative peace across the galaxy. Each one of the sentient species in the empire were considered electors who decided galactic laws in the Grand Assembly held every ten years. They all had a couple systems close to their home planets and were left to themselves to grow as they wished, as long as they did not challenge the power of the Grand Emperor. But of course, sometimes electors did fight each other, then even formed coalitions against the Emperor himself. Of course, the Emperor always had more power than the electors. As the borders of the Empire grew, so did the elector species. In 563 AE, after Emperor, the galactic community welcomed humanity into the Empire as they had finally discovered FTL technology and were very close to the borders of the Empire. Humanity had recently gone through a very large war and they really needed the economic help that the Empire would provide. So they gladly joined as the 346th Elector of the Empire. At first, humanity adapted well to the environment of the Empire. Trade and mining deals were made with companies and other species. Huge amounts of human books, poems, pictures and more were sent to the Imperial Archives to add to the Galactic Collection. Humans even made a name for themselves as great mercenaries since they had been fighting for years before joining the Empire. But humanity was also surrounded by enemies on all sides. Many resources in hand around the human-owned solar systems were still untapped. Resources that some wanted for themselves. In particular, there were large quantities of the ore Dalifos, similar to the Imperial Palace, 3,947 children every year and approximately 4,568 planets. This ore was named after the first emperor, which was used in ship armor building. The problem was the fact that Dalifus was not a very common, and in order to extract it from a planet fast, you needed to destroy large parts of the land and drain huge amounts of fresh water. So, anyone who wants to buy human Dalifus had to wait for long amounts of time before receiving it. At the same time, the Emperor Saslos I was getting ready to put down one of his electors and a couple of other species who were starting to challenge his power through a coalition. So Saslos needed a lot of Dalifus for his battleships. Sadly for him, most of the Empire's Dalifus supply had held by the coalition against him, so he turned to the humans for his needs. After realizing that he could never get enough ore to build his ships and the current production rate, Sassler sent a message to the leading council of Earth known as the UNE, United Nations of Earth. He requested humanity to temporarily abandon their current home planet of Earth, and until the soon-to-be war ends, let it become a planet under the Emperor's direct control. Humanity's population would stay in one of the less populated planets on the Empire until the war ends. The payment for the Empire's quick occupation would be war reparations from the defeated coalition. However, it was not promised that Earth would be the return to the same as it was. Clearly, Earth's surface would be destroyed along with all native life and anything humanity built. The Emperor needed his ore fast. It was clear that his offer was made in a rush and that the Emperor did not really expect humanity to actually refuse, since even though the Emperor's main fleet was not ready for his secondary fleet, could wipe out all of humanity's fleet within hours. And that was when humanity broke the first golden rule. The Emperor waited for two days for humanity to answer, then four more days, then another week. No answer came from Earth. Finally, he ordered his second Imperial fleet to destroy any human opposition that may be present on human systems and take Earth by force if needed. But the Imperial fleet did not need to lift a finger to occupy the space around Earth, because all human fleets were gone. They were expected to be at least 14 corvettes, but none of them would be seen. The commanding officer of the second fleet quickly sent the human leadership a message, demanding that they start abandoning Earth now or the fleet would start a orbital bombardment. Soon after this message was sent back from Earth, stating that the UNE refused the Empire's offer. Just a couple minutes after the message was received, the second fleet opened fire on Earth. They did not really want to genocide humanity, because that would cause too much political problems, 
but they could still destroy farms and factories to ensure that there were no resources to support humanity on Earth. Humanity would surely capitulate soon. Sadly for the Empire, it turns out that humanity had a habit of breaking rules. The fleet expected that humanity would surrender after a week, since no trade and limited production, there would be a massive starvation. But as the second week of Earth's siege passed, it became clear that humanity was not surrendering. Pressured by the Emperor, the commanding officer finally ordered messages to the human cities around Earth to evacuate. The fleet would start bombarding population centers. Few answered, fewer accepted defeat. With it, the cities of Earth started to get destroyed, one by one. But the Empire was once again disappointed. There was no influx of refugees, messages begging them to stop or even reply. Orbital photographs of human cities showed no signs of activity. Soon after that, the fleet's officers realized what was happening. The human fleet had already carried away most of the population from Earth with the 14 lost corvettes. The remaining population was at least 90% less than what it was before the war. Most of the remaining humans were probably underground or in desolate parts of the planet. With that, the Admiralty realized that they needed to land troops on Earth to properly secure the planet. However, the orbital bombardment had destroyed most of the landing sites on Earth, so soldiers were sent with shuttles. After the necessary materials and personnel were brought into orbit, the invasion began. If only they knew how much the humans enjoyed breaking the rules. When the first shock troops landed on Earth, they expected a small, lightly armored, undisciplined human resistant group to attack them. But once again, the humans surprised them. Not only were they all well-equipped human soldiers attacking them, but there were also Klogaris mercenaries amongst the humans. Klogaris were one of the best mercenaries in the galaxy, and they only fought for the highest bidder. How could the humans, with almost no resources or money, afford them? Unknown to the Empire, the humans had spent two weeks before the war digging tunnels and hiring mercenaries to defend Earth, sending the rest of the civilian population to secretly founded colonies, and it was no coincidence that they hired Klogaris mercenaries. The Klogaris were warlike species, and they put honor above all. Joining a group of mercenaries was also considered a rite of passage for them too. And when they saw how humans resisted the Empire, even as their cities and planet was turned to ash, the Klogaris started to respect mankind. Now they were fighting against the Empire with mankind. They even refused to get paid and stayed with the humans, not for money, but for honor, and their hatred for the Empire, who considered them savage brutes. Outside Earth, things were not going great for the Empire either. The Coalition was mobilizing their forces and getting ready to attack the Empire. The invasion of Earth was the main justification for their aggression. The Empire had managed to gather some ships to defeat the Coalition, but half of their fleet was still busy sieging Earth. After another month of ground combat, the dam finally broke. The Coalition concluded that the Empire was breaking intergalactic law by trying to eliminate sentient species. The Emperor decided that Earth could not be taken. But humanity was not done yet. The 14 corvettes and the rest of the human population had not stood idle. With the new founder colonies and some outside donations, they managed to bring up the human fleet size to about half the second imperial fleet. As the last day of the siege began, and the imperial troops were being brought back to their ships, the human fleet attacked them. Because all the Second Fleet ships were busy bombarding Earth. They could not redirect fire now on the new human ships fast enough. Within hours, more than half of the Second Fleet was destroyed, and the rest ran away. After the Battle of Earth concluded, one final fight took place near Empire's capital, which was quickly won by the Coalition, as the Imperial Fleet was outnumbered. The next year, the last of the Emperor's planets fell Empress Saslas was disposed for another new emperor from one of the Coalition species. Many planets and huge amounts of money were also taken from the ex-emperor and given to the UNE as a gift. From that day on, there are four rules that apply to all species in the galaxy, except humanity. Never fight against the Galactic Emperor alone. Never let your population starve and always pay your mercenaries. Never! Invade Earth. End of story. 
Story number one, Ant Farm Earth, written by Dr. Blackjack 21. The streets were filled with screams of terror and madness. What few news stations still functioned were proclaiming it the end of times. People had gathered in their houses of worship. They prayed for the respite from whatever deity or forces they worshipped. But any semblance of divine was absent from the world. All that remained was a face of living nightmares, seared into the minds of all that had beheld it. All hope of heaven or any peaceful afterlife was gone. Something older and worse than the devil was here to claim what was his. As Arthur Holon, the changing, devourer of hope, and the ancient god of unwashed socks, felt his, her, its friend smack him, her, it in the back of the head. Looking back, he, she, it, could see the displaced of Yazelawe, the ever-chosen, bringer of light and champion of the underappreciated moments. Dude, you've shifted to a plane of existence too close to their own. They can sense you. You know they can't perceive and understand infinite beings like ourselves. You're freaking them out. This is going to be worse than the time you caused the Dark Ages. As Zathul Hulun, bringer of despair, the hunger of the dark, and lord of crumbs in the bread, rubbed the back of his, her, its head, and backed a few dimensions of reality away from Earth sheepishly. Sorry, uh, sorry, uh, I didn't mean to. I couldn't help it, though. They're just so cute. I mean, uh... Look at them, they're, they're fine like lives, running around trying to find purpose for existence. They even invented something as pointless, as ridiculous as time. Time! <laughs> the absurdity of it. Yazath the lord of hope, guardian of peace, and guard of perfectly ripe fruit, looked down at his, her, its earth farm with a frown. Nah, man, you freaked them out so bad, they're going to war over it, blaming each other for your existence slash presence. A bunch of their infinite timelines are going to end with nukes if I don't do something. Ezathul Hulun, the hunter of shadows, the essence of hatred, and the lord of mosquito bites, looked at his friend with confusion. But I thought you said that we couldn't interfere with them because of our mere presence drives them insane. What are you going to do? Shaking his head at his friend, Yazeth Wille, bringer of dreams, lord of inspiration, and singer of cheerful tunes, explained. No, they won't like it, but it's kind of like one of them giving their dog unnecessary vaccinations. They might not understand it or enjoy it at the time, but it's for their own good. You just gotta use a soft touch with them. Much what I mean. With that, Yazeth Wille, the father of kindness, guardian of eternity, the giver of lucky breaks, based a few dimensions of reality closer to Earth before speaking to it in a voice surprisingly similar to a person trying to speak with and soothe an extremely stressed animal. Hey there, guys, listen, uh, I don't like to meddle in your affairs too much, but you can't be using nukes like that. You're gonna hurt yourselves if you keep it up. No two people heard the same words spoken that day, but everyone heard them nonetheless, though perhaps it would be more accurate to say they felt the words, seared into their very souls of every man, woman, and child alive. There were many discussions, debates, and even wars fought of the actual phrasing of the words, with entire religions being created or ground into dust accordingly. Though not once were nuclear weapons considered, for fear of drawing the attention of the thing that lurked in the deep cosmos to prey upon the sanity of men. Eventually a truce was struck between several of the more antagonistic factions, an informal ceremony, the newly accepted interpretation of the words was to be read aloud by the prophet of the new religion born from the ashes of an old. Though a third of the world's population had died in the war of the words, yet the healing could finally begin. The dignified elderly man unfurled the scroll with a grand flourish and solemnly read aloud, I, the Lord your God, give unto you this, the eleventh commandment of salvation. Thou shalt not wield a weapon of the atom against thy neighbor, nor thy enemy. Asul Hulun, the laughing god, the champion of smugglers, and the voice of I told you so, looked over at his, her, its friend. A soft touch, ah. Uh. Ya Zathwella, the abashed, lord of regret, and the shaker of heads, looked a little embarrassed, but defiant. It's still better than the Dark Ages were. End of story.
Story number two. Raider, written by Mecha Kid. You call me pirate. I prefer privateer. UNS Mako drifted quietly through space. Engines tamped down to a minimum, all systems operations at the lowest possible settings. She had been fitted out for stealth, with a comprehensive suite of both passive and active systems. Engine baffles called her exhaust systems, and radiation-absorbing materials ensured that she would not be seen. To any observer, Mako was one with the darkness of space. Captain Grace Mahal pulled herself away from the targeting scope, and walked to the plot table. Her XO keyed in the data, and the hollow map displayed the track of the convoy. Optimum firing point is here. The red icon appeared on the map. Target will be in position in uh, 90 seconds. Grace nodded. Thank you, Mr. Morton. Weapons, make ready. Run launchers, one through six. Full spread by mark. Night, Captain. Outside the ship, the cover slid away from six of the ship's ten blisters, revealing a series of tubes. Inside each tube, a nuclear-tipped torpedo came quietly to life. The plot showed the projected position of the ship's drift slowly towards the red marker. Grace went back to the targeting scope, pressing her helmet against the rubber fitting as she swept the targeting array over each ship in the convoy. She pressed a button, feeding the target data to the launchers, bearing, range, speed, shield pattern, all recorded automatically. The seconds ticked down and the convoy plodded on, blissfully unaware that they were being hunted. Ready? Launch! Magnetic induction hurled 36 weapons into space. A second later, the reaction drives on the torpedoes kicked in, and the weapons streaked towards their targets. The weapons crossed half the distance between the ships before they began to react, transports steering wildly to evade. Escorts used both jammers and plasma to try and protect their charges, and even succeeded in shooting down or fooling several of the weapons. It didn't matter. The darkness of space was dispelled violently as weapons found their marks, and twenty-two miniature suns blazed to life. The Krovac escorts searched desperately for their attacker, even going so far as to launch random plasma bolts on a vector that the torpedoes had come from. Grace laughed at the attempt. Mako was long gone. Five days later, UNS Mako drifted near planet Nocturne, deep in the Krovac territory. Quietly, she waited as a Krovac pleasure cruiser climbed out of orbit, heading towards the outer garden worlds. On the bridge, Grace licked her lips and pressed a small red button. Four SETI manufactured EM mines activated, lashing the pleasure cruiser with iron pulses, blowing out electronics and disabling the ship. Quickly, the Mako came to life, sliding towards the Krovac ship and matching up with it. Docking ports were alive. The human marines forced their way through the airlocks. Training behind them, Grace strode with confidence, her red-orange helmet contrasting the green form-fitting armor, mag boots clanking on the floor. Gunfire could be heard up ahead, but resistance was minimal compared to the violence her marines inflicted. In the observation lounge, the marines had gathered the crew and passengers. Two held the door as Grace stepped through, then stopped on the balcony. Who was the captain of the ship? A Krovac stood forward, a black mane framing his scaled face. Insolent human, how dare you think that you can? There was a bang like a crack of thunder, and where the Krovac's head once was, there was now empty space. As the body slumped to the floor, everyone else in the room looked up at Grace, her ancient hand cannon still smoking. They ask again. Who was the captain of the ship? There was silence from the gathered Krovac. Then one of the crew, a junior officer, knelt slowly. You are. The rest of the crew slowly knelt in submission. Congratulations, you get to live a little longer. Slowly, Grace removed her helmet with a free hand, letting her red hair flow into the weightlessness of the disabled ship. I'm Grace Mahal, and this ship now belongs to me. The Krovac destroyer burned hard chasing the black ship through the void, lashing out with its plasma bolts. Behind it, a military convoy lay decimated, with four ships completely destroyed, and another seven seriously damaged. Grace laughed, and a crew cheered as the UNS Mako transitioned to jump space, leaving her pursuers behind. End of story. Story number one. A bit less uncaring, written by Sun Praising. 
the galaxy was a lawless and uncaring place. No unification, every race for themselves. When the Gorgnar came to Earth, they lasered away all things in orbit and outside Earth atmosphere. Then, they demanded the entire population of Earth become their slaves. Earth was too far from their, or anyone's, empire to properly colonize. After China declared war on them and was swiftly annihilated by the technology, the Gorknar had tens of thousands of years more to develop. The rest of the nation sat together to come up with a plan to secure the survival of humanity. After three days of discussion, they asked the Gorknar to give them two Earth years to organize their population for transport and FTR communication equipment to contact them. While this did not happen often, it was not unheard of. The Grognar alone knew about 700 species with worlds they could reach with their FTL engines, and the galaxy had a lot of species with not even a homeworld left, bound to slavery or extinct. They accepted. When they returned to receive their prize, almost half of the population was gone. They were told that they revolted because they would rather die than be enslaved. While they highly doubted this explanation, they did not find much evidence of war or fights. They took what remained of humans on Earth with them, not knowing that the rest of them survived. Humanity used the new FTL communication to contact other races and made them an offer they would not refuse. We pledge 100 people to 10 Earth years of service for one starship each, still functioning and equipped with basic technology needed for longer FTL trips and small weapon systems. After that, they were to be paid. While humans are neither strongest nor their need to sleep aided them to sell themselves as workers, their endurance was quite exceptional, and many found hard work. They also had another advantage for this deal. While slaves were cheap and easy to come by, they were never loyal or motivated. Humans, which expected a payment, were both. With their loyalty, they earned a reputation of honesty and reliability. And so they worked hard for ten long years to come. The galaxy was a lawless and uncaring place, so most of the species they worked for tried to enslave them instead of paying them after ten years, which was expected. The humans simply stopped working, some even refused to eat, and they did not ask for much pay. From the economical standpoint, it made more sense to the aliens just to give them an outdated ship they wanted to scrap anyways and give in to their demands. The Forge Worlds needed their human workers, and they couldn't lose so many at once. So, most species they worked for accepted their demands. Some did not, and executed their workers, but their victims and actions wouldn't be forgotten. Eleven years after first contact, a lot of ships jumped to a point in space half a light year away from the Sol system. All of them human. All of them had planned for this moment since old nations released their plan. They exchanged information on where they lived, how to contact them, and how they made their money to survive the lawless void. The Grognar knew they were up to something, but were unable to catch them. The exchange was automated and didn't last even a minute. All those ships jumping off in different directions made it impossible to trace the warp of a single ship back to origin or destination on return. Most humans used their ships to ship goods from one system to another. Now they had finally had the way to contact each other. They formed a mix of corporations, army and government, the Terran Void Fleet. They sent money from richer human settlements to shippers to those to the poor to survive alone, and released the shipper codex. Since the codex, not one shipment of goods was just stolen by the human shippers. Something that happened with all other shippers, be it due to greed or desperation. No species individualistic enough to man small freighters outside their own systems had enough empathy to finance their kind in mass like the humans did. This reputation, while not making them rich, gave them a solid income, and a monopoly over inter-system transports, which turned out to be even more important. Sixteen years after first contact, the Terran fleet declared war on the Grognar. No more than two minutes later, the first Battle of Sol began. 
A wild mix of armed freighters, outdated military spaceships, and a few human-built ships with all kinds of reverse-engineered technology from many species jumped right next to the cradle world of humanity. The initial Gognar warships had long left, leaving only a small outpost to mine for resources. While being heavily guarded for an outpost, they were no match with the human fleet. After destroying all military installations and ships of the Gorgnar, all of the fleet jumped off, facing the Gorgnar territories. The Gorgnar first laughed at the declaration of war. Humans had no way to capture a system of theirs with more than a small outpost, let alone hold a system against their navy. They sent a big fleet to the Sol system to show the galaxy what happened to those offending them. They didn't find the humans. Later, the Grognar High Commander received requests for escorts from all across the Empire. The freighters they owned, as well as any other freighter on their payroll, got attacked and destroyed by space pirates. The humans responsible called themselves freebooters, but the Grognar did not care. While the Gorgnar Empire had a big enough navy, it wasn't able to send enough ships to every freighter they needed to send out. Humans picked their targets with the fleet size they chose to bring and usually recovered the cargo to finance their war. Their enemies spent more and more for less and less freighters to come through. It wasn't clear at first, but the Empire was collapsing. The worlds with smaller populations are not self-sufficient and more or less surrendered to the humans by paying their horrendous prices for basic supplies. Bigger worlds were somewhat more stable, but far from immune. The elite did barely receive any luxury goods, and the plummeting economy and lack of resources racked the lower classes. Tension on those worlds rose to open revolution from the Empire, something unheard of before. Over the course of four earthen years, the Grognar lost half their worlds to independence, and twenty-four small as well as three city worlds to other races, half of those humans. Earth, of course, among them. It was only then when peace was signed with the humans, which no longer were organized as the Void Fleet, but as the Terran Republic, the Void Fleet being the military not bound to local systems. The humans demanded their enemies, the worlds they already conquered. Not much to the Empire, but a good start for the humans, as well as all humans they've ever taken. A very big fee for everyone who didn't make it. Half as reparations, half to prevent them from slaughtering them instead of turning them over. With those refreed and small surplus of money, they re-inhabited Earth. The worlds they've taken over, by every other species' surprise, haven't been cleared of any Grognar. But they instead integrated them into their empire. They now paid their tribute to Earth, from the Grognar officials, the more stubborn, imperialist, unfit, or unpopular among lower Grognar classes were replaced. Mostly by humans, but also by Grognar. Their damages rebuilt, or at least reimbursed, their culture and values introduced and spread. The worlds are now open to any race, ship, and individual which wants to enter and respects their laws. They quickly outpaced other species in technology, not only because of their own thirst for knowledge and ingenuity, but also because they have so many non-humans in their republic. They all have a different view of the world and come up with new ideas unthought of others. Most of them have been enslaved on first contact and escaped or freed by their laws. Any slave entering Terran space is free by their law, and they enforce their laws. They are the only race once enslaved but able to rescue themselves, the only species known to make peace with the enemies and survive so far, and the only species which accepts others and most importantly, my offspring. The only ones who gave shelter to refugees whose homeworlds had been taken. Those like us. The galaxy is a bit less lawless and uncaring, now that they are here. End of story. The Orphan Fleet, written by Timpanzee writes. The Sound of Rain droned on in Theo Marquis's head. 
heralded by rolling black clouds blocking out the sun. The downpour started earlier that morning. He didn't like rain, but would he miss it? Placing a hand on his chest, he felt his heart beating through his button-up. He tried to focus on slow, deep breaths. Can't let anyone see him. The rain hurt his joints and forced him to constantly adjust his stance. Shifting his feet, the rough concrete grabbed the soles of his shoes. He stumbled. It was always his feet that betrayed him. Why did today have to come? Admiral Marquis, said an aide from the dark navy raincoat. You're on in 30 seconds. Marquis barely had a chance to look up before they turned and headed back up the metal great stairs. The whole staircase shifted and changed with each step. The age job was to get him on stage at the right time. Nothing more. Not that it mattered. He had to give his speech. That was why everyone was here. Why anyone wanted to waste their time listening to some old admiral was beyond him. There was nothing new to say, and so little time left. A hand on his shoulder snapped him back. He'd been drifting off into thought a lot lately. Too much to think about. Too many unpleasant thoughts he didn't enjoy having. Looking to the owner of the hand, he saw her dull blue eyes looking back. They used to be bright and filled with life. Now, they were cold like. A wet spot erupted on his cheek. He wiped it away and glanced up at the side in relief. The rain had leaked through a seam in the tent roof. It wasn't even shot craftsmanship. It was just raining that hard. Marky paused himself to look back into her dull blue eyes. He hated that she felt the same way he did, but mostly he hated that it was his fault. Well, at least partially. She put on a smile, not one that was pained in an obvious way, but one that hid pain in support of another. This is the job now, Theo, she said. We just have to focus and get it done. She looked away towards the others behind her. Some were better at hiding the pain than Clara. Some were worse. All five of them shared a kinship that no other human shared. The world was on their shoulders, and they couldn't fail. Everything was at stake. Theo nodded. This is the job now, he said, turning to meet the gaze of the aide returning from the metal great stairs. Neither of them had to say anything. Marquise headed towards the stairs. It was time. At the top of the stairs, he could see some of the crowd standing in the pouring rain. He reached in his jacket and took out a stiff fold of paper. It felt expensive. The aide gave the signal, but before he could head out, the sound of the other four opening their umbrellas behind him gave him pause. Don't cover me, he said. This is a speech that should be delivered in the rain. Whether by his tone or expression, they knew not to question the request. He stepped out into the rain and went behind the podium. Two of his companions placed themselves on one side and two on the other. Large droplets wrapped against the umbrellas, sending small sprays his way. He looked up to the largest crowd he'd ever seen, struggling to pull his eyes away. He feigned a cough and peered down at his papers. The raindrops made heavy splashes on the thick paper before soaking in. Marquis took a deep breath. In this... Humanity's darkest hour, we must focus on the light. Never before in our collective history have so many, from so many different cultures come together to strive and work towards a singular purpose, the continuation of our species. It was not our hubris that brought us to the brink of annihilation, but a cosmic roll of the dice. The odds were stacked against us, and we had a job to do. Marquis willed his face to look resolute, despite the weather's determination to wash it away, like words in rain. Blue ink streaks were running down the page as he folded the soaked papers and put them in his jacket pocket. He'd memorized the speech a long time ago. In 1969, we went to the moon. Not because it was easy, but because it was hard. Now, in 2042, we must leave our native star system. Not because we want to, but because we have to. Twenty-three years ago, our scientists detected fifty-seven stellar mass black holes approaching our solar system on a collision course. The riots, death, and calamity were widespread for three long years. 
Those were truly sad days. We fought each other when we should have worked together. We hated when we should have loved. The worst of all, we wasted our most precious commodity. Time. Time to be together. Time to enjoy life. Time to find a solution. Fortunately, in the end, reason and compassion won out over our baser instincts, and we emerged from the ashes stronger and more unified than before. He looked out into the crowd. The people in the back were invisible to him through the sheets of rain, but he knew they stood still and silent like statues. The wet air chilled him to the bones. This was the birth of Project Ark. The world over, ideas were sorted and catalogued, plans were made and tested, and a final strategy chosen. We would leave Earth, our home, in search of a safe haven amongst the stars. Our first interstellar trip would be fraught with danger and would require all we, Earth, and the entire solar system had to give. We were going to save humanity at all required costs. Marquis shuddered as the crowd chanted the words in unison. They had become a mantra for everyone, the project that would save them. Not even the cold rain could drown out the cry. We strip mine the mother that gave us life for all she was worth. We drained her lakes, ripped out her forests, and stole the very earth from whence she got her name. This was her last gift to us. Anything we needed to survive. We started a massive conservation campaign, storing as many animals and insects as we could, and gene sequencing those that we couldn't. Next, we struck out in the rest of the solar system, gathering more raw resources and performing test flights. A lot of brave souls chose to sacrifice what little time they had left on Earth to go out and ensure our valiant effort succeeded. We were racing against the clock, and many people died as a result. Accidents happened, and mistakes were made. Never forget the lives lost in the Asteroid 8 disaster. He trailed off and lowered his head. Water poured down from the sky, dripped off his hair and over his face. The sound of rain soaked the moment of silence, and those that observed it. At all required costs, said Theo softly. At all required costs, the crowd chanted back. And we've paid that cost time and time again. We've ravaged the earth and left her barren and polluted. We've sent our sons and daughters to die in the coldest space. But now, he said, slamming his fist in the podium, now it is time to reap the reward. Humanity will live on. Those of us chosen and trained will live on, he said, gesturing to his four companions. Those of you who've won the genetic lottery will live on. One hundred million humans will live on in humanity's new home for the next seven years. Four counter-rotating O'Neill cylinders escorted by asteroid-based support ships. On these ships, we will travel to the closest planet, Proxima Centauri B, and make it our home. If it cannot be made suitable for human habitation, then it will journey on until we have found a planet that we can call home. Marquis took a deep breath and steeled himself for the next part. To those of you who we are leaving behind, I sincerely wish that we did not have to. The crowd started to chant at all required costs, but Marquis raised a hand to silence them. Confused looks and murmurs were exchanged, but Theo waited for them to die down. I chose not to opt in my family on my chosen status. Instead, I elected for them to have the same chances that everyone else did in the genetic lottery. Following my example, he said, looking to the people on either side of him, my executive officers have done the same. Only one of our family members won the lottery. Each and every one of us leaving tomorrow is experiencing loss. We will carry this burden, this sorrow, this cost for the rest of our lives, regardless of whether or not it was required. Humanity will live on, but you and Mother Earth will not be forgotten. Thank you. Thunderous applause. Admiral Theo Marquis leaned in his head. He looked at the dark grey sky as the rain washed it all away. Now the real job started.
End of story. Story number one. Humans use what? Written by Steel Blue 8. You use what kind of engines? Cries the second disaster response commissioner in a shocked and deeply confused tone. The haphazardly dressed human at one end of the table nods in response to the shot. I'm not joking. We found them cheaper and more reliable. They simply have less parts. About five hours earlier. Disaster response call. Commissioner Kurska was not having a good time of things. At 4.24 a.m., the Terran Freight spacecraft, Crosco, number C2276-HL, had entered an orbit around Ares's second smallest moon on a routine refuel stop. Engines flared with the characteristic orange-white of human sublight engines. When the entire ship went up, a violent blast shredded the blocky freight vessel into orbital debris that was now raining down on the barren mock below. Almost immediately, the finely tuned machinery of the Disaster Response Corps sprung into action, and the Volpine Commissioner had been dragged out of his comfortable sleep and straight into the offices. Within an hour, an investigation team assembled and underway with Kurska as the leader. The secretary finishes explaining the start to finish of what they know so far, and the commissioner chewing on the stick of plant-based stimulant similar to the usage of coffee, a common habit as demonstrated by the teal tint of her teeth, before staring blankly at her neatly filed report in front of her, and stating in a monotone foreign voice, that's impossible. Before the unfortunate secretary, even less pleased to be here than she is, can answer, she continues. You tell me the first response team thinks the explosion started in the engines and moved up to the ship. That is impossible. A rocket engine can't do that. They can overheat. They can melt the exhaust cone. They can shatter. They will melt the reactor plates. They can corrode themselves to dust or gimbal right out of their mountings and a million other faults. But unless you're in an atmosphere with oxygen, a rocket engine will not explode. She's right, of course. Such things is entirely unheard of. Since the JDSP, human spirit, arrived in Eris space and heralded the modern age, there has only been one single rocket explosion, one in the upper atmosphere of their whole world, and the direct result of an attack by godforsaken idiots. So, sabotage. The debate rages on. All the while, more information steadily arrives. The absurdity, streamlined bureaucracy of the Arisk putting any Terran disaster response to shame. The cleanup operation complete just four hours after the incident. Half the parts are catalogued and laid out for investigation, and already, a sabotage ruled out. There's no motive, no bomb. The ship was hauling mostly empty containers with the same crew that have staffed it for the past six years. Finally, on a full stomach and empty platter in the middle of the table, Kurska's mind had moved to other matters. What about the secondary fuel tank? Prompted nods of agreement from five other response team commissioners around the table. True, it has an entirely different geometry. And reinforcements, they can handle much denser gases than the primary. Do we have access to the schematics for the class? Not within five days. Humans administrators move slower than native flower species, known to move towards brighter areas. Devil rising again as theories of half-baked ideas fly around the table, centered on that mysterious extra fuel tank seen in not a single Erisk ship design, the secretary sharply cutting in and silencing things for a moment with a statement of, Can't we just ask the exchange mechanic? An awkward pause as all eyes turn towards them. The exchange mechanic is the nearest available human. Everyone in the room knows that, sent by the cultural integration program. That one of their nations is running, bringing human engineering principles to Arisk problems. The secretary stupidly continues, All of our ships use a, uh, a set of basic parts. They that are the same purpose between models. If the same holds true for human, uh, Terran craft, we don't need schematics, we just ask one. A human, I mean. Once the furless, flimsy-looking mechanic had been summoned to the team office, it takes him mere moments to glance at the photos of the destroyed secondary fuel tanks and give them an answer. It says right here, there on the warning sign, that's an oxidizer tank. It takes a bit more probing from the officials and the incredulous shot of, You use what kind of engines? 
before they can decipher what the tired human means. Chemical fired rocket engines, humans in the modern age, use chemical fired rocket engines, Kurska states in a tired tone of voice. Of course they do. Sure, traveling to the stars on a godforsaken bomb, despite the alternatives they invented themselves, are very, uh, human. Ultimately, the disaster was filed away with only a brief investigation needed. A result of an overworked maintenance staff by human corporations, and for the Arisk, the only policy change. A human engineer joining the permanent roster of the Disaster Response Corps, on call to consult on matters of the absurd engineering practices of the Terran populace. Translator's note, while the term translates most easily as godforsaken, it is analogous with barbarous or uncivilized or anti-science, and most literally translates as outside the domain of advancement, advancement being both the term used in English and the name of one of their deities. End of story. Story number two. Prove me wrong, written by I am the hype, TFS. The human ambassador slowly stood to his feet, all eyes of the Galactic Union representatives turning their gaze upon him. All the media drones from the various news outlets focused on his face. There were bags under his eyes, and he kept a hand on the table in front of him, as if worried that he might not be able to stand firmly with the support. This gathering had not been scheduled, and the members only assembled at the behest of the human. The request was simple and polite. It merely asked for a short time to address the representatives, and assured the recipients that the matter was not dire, and if they could not attend, there would be no issue. But they had all come. They had all come because they had been reminded time and time again that if you ignored humanity's whispered words, you would not be able to block out its roar. I apologize. I am not quite as eloquent as I usually am. But the last few days have brought sleepless nights in their wake. As much as I am here as a representative for my species, I must confess that my next words come from me as an individual, though I sincerely hope that they resonate with the collective consciousness of my people. He took a deep breath and released an even deeper sigh before continuing as if what he had to say was physically straining and the weight pressing him down would only be lifted when he said what he needed to. I am afraid, not of conflict, not of destruction. These concepts have been with my kind since the beginning, and they will continue to be our faithful companions until we cease to be. I am afraid, not of tyrants, not of atrocities. We have seen and rooted out despots and sought to protect and afflicted with all we have, no matter who is suffering, as many of my colleagues could attest, but will refuse to do so out of self-interest. His eyes sweep across the room as he pauses, noticeably stopping on the ambassadors of several warmongering species who keep their place in the Union through legal loopholes and technicalities. Many of them winced at his words, having felt humanity's wrath in the past, not eager to feel that sting again, but also unwilling to voice their anger and humiliation, lest they be further condemned for actions that prompted such a painful response to begin with. Others, who had yet to test the limits of humanity's patience, or personally experienced the breadth of their vengeance, simply glared back at him in silent defiance. I am afraid of being right. I am afraid of every time another report crosses my desk that suggests the suffering of others because I desperately want to be wrong. I am afraid because every time I am right, a rage burns so deeply within me that I can scarcely believe that I am the same person when justice is dispensed and the rage is cooled. Something stirs within the collective heart of humanity when we see wrongs being committed be it amongst ourselves or by those around us. It is something that runs deeper than our genes and I suspect goes even beyond the bonds of our very souls. It is a primal urge, an eternal discontent at even the notion of injustice. It has driven us since the beginning and with the reason we stand proudly amongst your civilization today. 
but it hurts. God, it hurts. During these past few sleepless nights, I've even toyed with the idea that maybe the only reason we fight injustice is to selfishly soothe our own pain. It horrifies me to consider that maybe in the earlier stages of my species' existence, we could ignore the ache and turn a blind eye to the wrongs around us. That the only reason we finally stopped to help our fellow man or beast was because we let the pain grow until it became unbearable. And that is why I have asked you all here today to make a plea, to beg of you that the next time a report crosses my desk, the next time I feel the deep rage stir at the thought of injustice, he let his back bend as his other hand joined the other to support the weight of his upper body as he leaned heavily upon them as he trailed off mid-sentence. His head bowed as if the weight he felt before he spoke had somehow gotten even heavier. He was silent for a moment that seemed to stretch on for minutes, when in reality perhaps thirty seconds had passed. When he finally lifted his head, the Union Hall, the most secure room in the known universe, was flooded with such a concentrated hostility from a single human that fear responses ran rampant. The ambassador of the various prey species huddled together and desperately tried to force down the urge to bolt for the doors. The predators bared their fangs, bared their frills, and raised their hackles as they felt the instinct to defend themselves flood their minds. What stood before them didn't feel like a human. It felt old, as if a predator from the dawn of time itself had inhabited the body of a man before them, staring out at them from an ancient past. Nothing had physically changed about the human ambassador. His hands weren't balled into tight fists. His lips didn't curl into a snarl. Nothing about him displayed any intent of a threat. Nothing except his eyes. The beast that stirred within humanity's heart stared out through those eyes. The beast whose hunger knew no end. The beast who knew no mercy for those it turned its fangs against. The beast stared out at the media drones and the ambassadors and spoke with a human voice. Prove me wrong. End of story. Story number one. Glory. Written by Echoing Cascade. 224 had trained for five years, six months, two weeks, four days, and approximately three hours for this moment. The human known as 224 was going over everything that had led to this moment. Today, the UNA would be shown the power of the human mind. They had invaded Earth one afternoon some six years ago, unimpeded by the Terran fleet or ground forces. Not because they wouldn't fight or found such a venture pointless, but because they simply couldn't. The Una, a race of powerful telepaths that targeted the young spacefaring race, the fight lasted until their colony ships entered the solar system. After that, the Terrans' defenders found their will to fight gone. They had known the Una were on their way thanks to the slot a nomadic race of traders and sometimes pirates who risked what little they had left after a costly war with humanity to warn them. Humanity had left Sol with as many civilians as they could fit into ships. Throughout the known galaxy, the Una were known for conquering inhabited systems, doing horrible testing and medical procedures to the local populace, and then leaving when they failed to find what they were looking for or got bored. Two to four had been one of the many unlucky ones left behind. On that day, 2 to 4 had been caught, tested, and unlike many others who were directed to walk into the colony ship to never return, was given a white room, food, water, and an injection that inflicted blinding pain that only subsided with unconsciousness. Upon waking, 2 to 4 was in a larger room with three other children. They all received the same mental command. Kill. The children did not use fists, feet, knives, elbows, or teeth, however. New abilities manifested instead. One produced electricity from his hands, but another seemed to blur in and out of existence. Two to four had a headache, with which resulted in three other children's heads popping like overripe grapefruits, crushed in a vice. Two to four was then ordered to return to the tiny white room. This went on every day for a month. 
That first two to four would try to control this power, refusing to kill for the masters, but the struggle was futile. Worse, the fights were increasing in intensity, and if two to four's concentration wavered for even a second, death would be inevitable. 224 slowly mastered these new mental powers, becoming able to see into the minds of the other children, devised strategies to defeat them, and by ignoring every feeling, forgetting every semblance of self, 224 became powerful, more so than even the Una knew. One day, 224 had been sent to kill again, but this time, rather than simply following orders, 224 tried to trace the signal back to its origin. 224 learned what the Una wanted, and how he was of great interest to them. It was a great shock to see himself the way the Una saw him. He had forgotten so much of himself to survive these last two years that he had forgotten almost everything that made him, well, him. The Una wanted to create a sentient creature who could wield their powers but new emotions. They weren't cruel entities deriving pleasure from others' suffering, they didn't do this to satisfy some perverse curiosity. They were organic machines wanting to learn to feel. Two to four saw something else, a crystal of some sort they used to send the telepathic commands. These crystals were present on every Una colony ship, and it was there that he would strike. Two to four spent the following years sharpening his powers to perfect blade. He would destroy these crystals and shatter the Una's minds. To do so, he had to increase each training to beyond anything he had done before. He would not simply forget anything that could have hindered his control. He would remove it from his mind, his past, his aspirations, his family, and even his name. All that was left was the number he had been given by the Una, 224, and the goal of destroying them. It was now the day of reckoning. Two to four had gone to the very limits of the powers that Una had cursed him with. He could now see them in their astral forms and how the crystals linked them all. He could even enter this realm himself, but not for long for fear of being found. When the orders to leave his room and enter the battle arena was given, the Una received a single whispered response, heard by every Una in the galaxy. No. Two to four then poured every ounce of power into the crystal of the Una, who had given him the order to little effect. So he went beyond what he knew was his limits. Blood began to flow from every orifice. Pain, like nothing he had ever felt, assailed every cell in his body. And the crystal, the crystal, barely shook. He had failed. He had given his all, and he'd failed still. For a moment, his memory drifted back to a girl that he had liked. Her smile as she passed revived feelings of guilt and shame he didn't know he still had. The astral eyes of every Una snapped back to look at him, and the crystal showed a tiny, insignificant crack. Tutu Four saw this and redoubled his efforts, but he couldn't remember anything else. When thinking of his parents, he couldn't see them as anything other than blurred outlines. He felt so little by this point. Then, he remembered he was not alone in this building. He reached into the minds of the other's test subjects. He channeled anything he could into the crystal. A song from an old game that always resonated with a young man. A picture of a family a young girl recreated in her mind every night before going to bed. A pet long dead who would protect its owner from the dreaded vacuum cleaner. He let loose these memories, and more importantly, the emotions they represented to the Una. By this point, his body had begun to give. His flesh and bones were burning from the effort and power he wielded, his own astral shape being the only thing keeping him alive. One of the Uda, a warden of the arena, snapped out of his emotional attack long enough to warn Tutu Four that if he continued, he would cease to exist. Tutu Four looked into another mind, that of a young boy. The boy looked up to his older brother. He was his hero. He collected these tiny little figurines he liked to paint. He had told him the law behind all of them and gave him his favorite unit before going to war. Tutu Four smiled at this memory, and to answer the Una Warden, he quoted from that boy's mind, For those we cherish, we die in glory! 
Two to four's astral form leapt into the crystal, and for a fraction of a second, the own new love, hate, obsession, indifference, love, revulsion, happiness, sadness, and a myriad of other emotions. And then, when the crystal shattered, they knew no more. After this, a few things changed in the galaxy. Humanity returned to Sol and brought the Slon with them, and insulting, or worse, attacking a Slon in the presence of a human, became a synonym with death. The destruction of the Una brought a new era of exploration for the races. They no longer lived in fear of encountering them. And on the place where once stood a white Una building, there was a large humanoid hologram with a small gold plaque that reads... 224 The Lamenter End of story Story number two Ring of Soul written by British Tea Company Larango The Emperor nodded in acknowledgement as his view screen displayed the short grey alien on his view screen. It did not look pleased to see him. The Emperor of Soul, the alien said, as his massive eyes slitted at the sight of the human emperor. Not any more Emperor Sephriel smirked slightly. I am Emperor of the Galaxy now. Perhaps the information you keep on the rest of the galaxy is not nearly as good as you imagined it to be. Nonetheless, those working in Imperial Intelligence still remain second to none. The alien's eyes blazed for a moment as it stared back at the Emperor. How did you find us? Your workmanship was shoddy. It clearly didn't last. The Emperor chuckled as he leaned back at his throne. The draconic visage upon the chest plate leered in through the view screen with a fierce grin. However, my engineers and archaeologists were still able to work with what was left of your technology. A lesser race would have mistaken your ruins for simple space dust. We discovered telltale clues of your origins, and of course, your own world. To be situated at a system so close to the galactic core must make you feel like you're all at the center of the universe, doesn't it? Tread carefully, human, while people are conquered the stars while you were still gathering wheat in a field. That time has long passed, alien, said Empress Sephiro, drawing dismissively. If there was one thing, however, I find still redeeming upon your dead civilization, it is your world, your sanctuary. It tired many of the brightest minds I had, but regardless, we still found it, your own world. The color drained from the gray alien's face as he looked quite pale, even for his species standards. His side of the view screen soon displayed a massive ring world that surrounded the entire star. It was, unmistakably, the very world he was sitting on at this moment. I am impressed, the Emperor nodded approvingly. It takes quite the civilization to create such a fascinating structure, to garner the resources for a construction the size of a planetary orbit. I am fascinated. Then by all means, you should remain fascinated. This ring is a testament to our people's power. Your people's former power. It's shameful that this is the last ring world still existing in the galaxy, all the others having long failed and crumbled from your people's fall. This ring, a testament of power and prestige, is not worthy to be held in the hands of your race. You would not dare take it from us. Why wouldn't I? I am the Emperor of the Galaxy. You are keepers of decaying and dying artifact, ruined by your people's fall. As this galaxy is mine, your ring world will be mine too. And I do not intend to keep such an item hidden away at the galactic core. After I'm done wiping you out, I do not care if it takes me a hundred million ships to drag that baggage back to our capital. Your ring will do nicely. In the soul system, where I will restore it to the glory of a race who is worthy of having such a jewel. End of story. Story number one. An honorary troll, written by Ben Babylon, they wept. Breaker paused for a moment, taking in the sight of the mage in front of him. The robes, the beard, the aloof expression, they were all typical. The staff was not. You cast with that? He asked, half impressed. 
The mage swung the thing off his shoulders, overhand, and planted its blade into the dirt. It was the first truly threatening staff breaker I'd ever seen. The blade on its end was almost as long as the haft itself, counterbalanced at the end by a polished lump of amber larger than a goose's egg. The damn thing looked more like a pole arm than a casting aid. Breaker waited a few moments to see if the human was going to respond to his question. He didn't. Part of him, the proud part, was happy to finally be taken seriously. The smart part of him suspected that he was going to miss the advantage of being underestimated. Breaker unslung his massive war hammer from his shoulders, its half-slowed fall still weighty enough to be felt here through the boots of the Major's thick work boots, loud enough to be felt in both of their chests. Then he blitzed the length of the bridge. The Major's eyes wide, his wizened hands began to twitch out a ward. Breaker knew there wasn't time, the gap stood short. He was already beginning to overhead swing of the hammer, half falling the full weight of the speed, strength and weight poured into one crashing blow. He knew the secret to hitting a mage was giving them everything you had, as hard as possible, as fast as possible, as close as possible. The more time they had to think and react, the more dangerous they'd become, and the more time he needed to chase and smash, the more tired he'd get. Thank the gods this was going to work. Extended fights were... The wizard grinned. A spell went off. Not a ward, simpler. A small jet of flame shot out of the amber orb, rotating the blade to vertical in a fraction of a second. The wizard half relaxed as he planted the staff in the gravel and looked forward to the huntsman versus the charging boar. Breaker knew he couldn't slow down. He couldn't dodge. The one mercy that he could see was the tip was aimed at his chest, not his gut. He'd rather choke on blood than rot from the inside. He closed his eyes before impact, not wanting to see the blade sink into him. It didn't. He heard a crunch of gravel, a giveaway, and the crunch of his nose as the mage threw a haymaker into the sidestep. Star moved helplessly to the side. He was half glad for the blow because it helped him get his center of balance back under him. He knew he wasn't going to be able to get the blow in with the hammer again. They needed too much time to build the momentum, but he still turned to face the wizard. Every instinct, insisting that he couldn't take his eyes off the little man for more than a moment. He turned out to be right. If he turned his head half as fast, he wouldn't have had the time to dodge the cudgel end of the staff, swung like a bat at the back of his skull. If he hadn't been outmaneuvered at every step of this fight, he'd have assumed that swinging from that direction his bad eye was on was just luck. The fact that he knew it was intentional did nothing to assuage his nerves. With no space to use his hammer, he used the next best weapon in his arsenal, his body. His leg snapped out with his massive height, letting him connect the blow easily with the old man's chest. He felt something give and watched with some small satisfaction as the human went bouncing down the bridge to center path. Well, he didn't need an invitation. He couldn't move quite as fast as he'd launched the mage away, but it was a close thing. The pause gave him time to get the momentum he needed to swing the hammer. He felt like an ox behind a cart, the weight behind building into something unblockable, undodgeable, un... unbelievable. The little man ended his tumble on all fours, splayed like a damn frog. The hammer was already bearing down on him, too late in the swing for Breaker to change course. Even as he watched the final twitch that signaled the ward was cast, the hammer slammed into the Major's hunched back harmlessly, the force of the blow charging the ward like a magical battery. The maniacal grin on the little man had worn ever since the first blitz widened half a step further silver molars and full display. And then, he flew. Rather than directing the force into some sort of attack, rather than buying himself time and space, the two classical friends of all natures, the silly bastard, directed all of his stored up energy downwards, the blast launching him up, bringing him from all falls to chin height, to eye level in a fraction of a second. He probably wouldn't have headed up another six or seven feet if he hadn't grabbed a hold of the breaker's left horn. 
His upward momentum swung him full circle around it, his journey ending abruptly as he drove the armored soles of the boot of his decidedly unwizardly boots into the back of Breaker's skull. If he'd been an ogre or a nightkin or even a giant, he would have been out cold. But Breaker was a full-blooded troll, and the horns on his head weren't just for ornamentation. If he charged a brick wall, there was a coin flip's chance that he'd be the winner. The boots never stood a chance. The wizard managed to get two more vicious, though slightly panicked kicks in before Breaker's fist managed to catch up. They grabbed him by the collar of his coarse green robe and yanked him forward over his shoulder. The old man looked slightly sheepish, dangling from his inhumanly large hand of his opponent. Breaker cut to the chase. You could have killed me on that first charge. The mage nodded. There wasn't a whole lot else he could do. His robes were caught so tightly, then the trolls grasped that they acted like a straitjacket. Why didn't you? The wizard went for earnestness. He'd been told it was his saving grace. You do not deserve death. This is your bridge. I just could not afford the toll. The robe tightened further as the troll's fist clenched. Do you wish that you killed me when you had the chance? The wizard snorted. Murder you? For the price of a goat? No. If I could make a wish, I'd wish I could swim. The troll let go of one fist and the thumb trading back to his mouth. A large, sharp tooth clamped down on the meaty pad of his digit, drawing a thick bead of green blood. The wizard's confused blossom into disgust as the ichor was smeared on his forehead to his chin. The fuck? He cursed, with the interrupted by the troll. I have decided to make you kin, and my first gift to you, great kin, is to grant your wish. The second fist, the one still gripping the front side of the wizard's robes, flung itself forward. The wizard barely had a moment to curse before plummeting in the water below. Several seconds later, Breaker waited. The wizard arose, spluttering from the depths. He turned, tumbling from the cold, the rage, and the sheer disbelief of what he was experiencing. It's four feet deep! Breaker nodded. Yes. It was almost heartwarming the way the wizard laughed as he began wading his way towards the far shore. Breaker's hands gingerly roamed over the goose eggs growing from the back of his head, larger than his own horns that had been when he'd passed the trials of manhood. If nobody gave you headaches like Kin, that little man was troll enough for a small army. End of story. Story number two. Gatling got it right. We just made it bigger. Written by Random 3X. Hugh and Hugo, we must prepare the station's defenses. The Hrongja swarm are already in the system. Malcolm, a large reptilian alien, begged as he looked at the human head of security for the Earthling space station. Don't worry, Marka. We have this, Hugo replied, opening a defense chest and taking out a piece of machinery with multiple pipes connecting to a strange mechanism. Is that a weapon of some kind? Marka asked hopefully. Indeed it is, dear Marka. This is known as a minigun, Hugo explained as he tested the rotation of the pipes. It is an updated version of a very old weapon. How old, human Hugo? Mako asked. The original gun was made in the 1860s, so several centuries already. You are using such primitive weapons? Please. This design was already successful when it was first invented all those centuries ago. We just stuck an electric engine onto the mechanism to make it go even faster. Hugo reassured and hooked the minigun onto a mount and linked the metallic belt. But the swarm are endless. You need to rate a fire that is so absurd just to meet them head on as you are, Mako protested. Please, Mako, this little baby can manage about 50 rounds per second. 50? Yes, the old gun was nowhere near as fast, but we ramped it up to even faster, he replied, giving the gun an affectionate pat. Still human, Hugo. Even with the whole station security forces using such weapons, it may not be enough. Please, we did more than make a go faster, Marco, Hugo replied, trying to reassure his friend. Go to that panel and look up the file labeled It Go Burr. Marco followed the suggestion and went up to the wall-mounted terminal and searched for the file. Opening the document, 
he was shocked to see the same design, but far larger. Firing rounds that were significantly larger than the ones he could see being fed into the minigun. These may be able to take on the Hive Knight, Maka muttered, looking at the design. The station has several hundred of those babies as point defense weapons. These miniguns are just for the scraps that make it through, Hugo explained, giving a playful wink. But human Mako, this gun has an even higher rate of fire. Mako pointed out as the holographic display of the weapon appeared, displaying its statistics. Used to get put on fighter jets with the intent of strafing tanks and uh, rendering them to scrap, Hugo explained. These may still not be enough, human Hugo. The swarm's numbers may still survive even these. Hugo, in response, only began to chuckle. Marka, tell me the name of the station. Well, uh, it is known as uh, Gatling Station, Maka replied, unsure of Hugo's point. Look at the design of the overall station. Maka complied and brought up the schematic of the entire station, and only then did he understand. He had always wondered why the station needed such powerful engines when its mass was not anywhere near high enough to warrant them. But to counter the recoil of the gun the size of the station itself, the Gatling gun with the station built around it, well, then you'd need a pretty good engine just to overcome the constant recoil. We have enough full rounds for the station to fire into the swarm for two minutes. Then the point defenses will take over for what little survives. Finally, the few barely living scraps we get, how minis, still think that we can't hold out against the swarm. To be honest, Human Hugo, I now kind of pity the creatures as they don't know the storm that they are approaching. End of story. Story number one. Titans, written by Maurice Thett. The Intergalactic Cooperative Defense League, commonly shortened to Incodel, was fairly young on the Universal stage, created by the noble Karatla, the first race to discover polaric gravity interface travel, the League's choice of FTL method. Incodel was the primary state holding sovereignty over the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies. With 730,000 systems and 2,316 member races with a quite literally uncountable population, mostly due to the 30% of races classifying as hive minds, in Cadell is magnificent for age. This is the story of the first war they ever fought. Read closely. In Cadell was famous on the Universal stage for a variety of goods, art, and technologies pioneered by the member races, along with a massive cultural export in the form of their ingenious system of government. But no small margin, the most numerous races were the Karat La at 30%, the Zianata. 23%, and the one mind, Karelti, 15%. And with the exception of the Karelti, as they went through two generations of workers a week, this was in order of age. The Karatla were known for their scientific might, standing at a gargantuan average of 42 centimeters in height. The Zayantal were renowned artists, a respectable 35 centimeters on average. The Kuralti's largest worker form was around 7 centimeters in length, and they were the most efficient workforce known to date. But there remained rumors within the races of the universe, rumors of titans hailing from fringe worlds in the greatest darkness. These titans were said to stand nearly two full meters tall, could withstand the harsh environments of terrestrial, rocky planets, as opposed to the gas giant moons and if word of mouth was to be believed, it could lift up to 100 kilograms. Most dismissed these titans as propaganda, so that the big three could fend off dissent. The idea that any race with just ten of their members could lift a ton was simply preposterous. These rumors should have been a warning, though, for the Karnaxi Imperium. The Imperium had been rapidly expanding, nearly 100 galaxies under their fold, Incodel remained a strategic target for a less advanced, though large, empire. Andromeda did not survive the assault. The passionate defense of the galaxy, a story for another day, perhaps. But the Imperium was not prepared for the next target. The general theme of the offense is best known by the following log. Opening log, 
Captain Zaijan Cha of the 38th Star Brigade of the Karatla on the defense of Imperium. When I was initially assigned to the 38th, I was concerned. Our transport ship, which should have been around a kilometer long to support the brigade, was closer to a hundred kilometers at the beam. I had pondered the necessity of doing so unimaginably large. Why would we dedicate the resources, and for what possible reason would we create such a behemoth? Then I saw them. The Titans, or uh, humans as they called themselves, were truly something to behold. Mammals. Humans were the only instance of a sapient species of megafauna, Earth being the only Gaia world in Incadel space. The Karatla had long since solved natural mortality by the time their discovery, but their gargantuan size had afforded them long lives before then, and in them exists a majesty that's difficult to describe. In an effort to assimilate the Titans into my command, I assigned the eldest of them, Sergeant James William Daw, to my personal command. He was 283 standard cycles old, 25 human years, which was apparently rather young for a human, but barely reaching mental maturity. On our first deployment, garrisoning the Forward World Imperium, a brutal death world is not unlike Daw's home, though only a Class II as opposed to Earth Gaia's 13 designation. The gravity of 3.6 meters per second squared made most of the squad uncomfortable, but Sergeant Daw laughed uproariously as he bounded across the plains when off duty. His very steps shaked the ground near us. Most of the battalion resented this. When the Imperium landed, the resentment died. The Imperium weapons did virtually nothing to Daw's personal shields and armor. It took coordinated artillery strikes to break the shield, and it took thousands of rifles to cause any real damage. Daw's rifle, a heavy coil repeater, had a similar effect on the enemy as one of our warship batteries would have. When Daw ran out of ammo, he simply charged the enemy and punched through their cover. His mass and enhancement suit enough to crush even the strongest shields and armor. Enemy vehicles were crushed in his palms, entire emplacements flattened under his boot, and when he finally started to become overwhelmed, when they started to resort to orbital bombardment and our position became overrun, I assumed that we were doomed. But we were not. In an act of defiance against the guards, he told the entire battalion to cluster together, to grab onto each other tightly and fit inside his locker, a locker that could fit several of our group transports with ease. In the end, he simply lifted the locker with all of his comrades inside, left the now damaged beyond repair enchantment suit behind, our remaining foot stalls and his sword strung across his back. He ran, across fields, through forests, over the rivers and hills he ran. Forty kilometers ran that day, fifty the next. He just kept running. Eventually, he found a cave, one large enough for him to sleep, and he set up camp. When finally he rested, his battalion wept for him, for his saving them all. The next day, when he awoke, he asked us to stay at the cave and prepare a defense, and he went forth into the forest. Night after night, he'd return with wood and food, more than enough for us all. With the sheer amount of resources he could gather for us, we quickly created a settlement, then a fortress. Eventually, he started coming back with more and more groups of our soldiers he found across the world, being gone for days at a time when he did so. And the others had similar stories of their humans, though many of theirs had died getting them to safety, not as well trained for the wilderness as Sergeant Daw. Under the support of a single man, we grew a resistance, and when the Imperium finally descended upon us, Daw made his last stand. In that final battle, Daw pulled aircraft down from the sky. His sword went through enemy assault lines like plasma through paper. His bare skin took every fire like it was merely an inconvenience. That battle lasted three days of him retreating to the trees. Three days of enemy suffering as Incadal reinforcements made their way to us. And the third day, though, disaster struck. The cave, our shelter, began to falter. The great cavern began to crumble. But Dor would not see us doomed. He stood in the cave as collapsed, taking the weight, allowing us time to leave as it crumbled around him. When I turned back to face him one last time, 
Nearly 300 kilograms of rock already on his back. He saluted me and said his last words. It was an honor to serve. We had to leave Imperium. Every human soldier station had died in its defense. But we ended that battle with a kill ratio of 130,000 to one. One man for 130,000. My first son was named Zai Tar Dor in his honor. My good friend Tai Lok Fa named her daughter Tai Fa Warren in honor of of Lieutenant Diana Warren, who single-handedly eliminated an Imperium fleet with a plasma rifle and a hastily constructed EVA suit. Make no mistake, any individual who might read this, this war was won on the blood of Titans. And we must never forget that. End log. Many in Inkadel space, like the Captain, attribute our victory to humanity. I am inclined to agree with them. In this history, you will come to agree with me as well. End of story. Story number two. A perfect solution written by the missing think. This is not war. A war has at least two participants. And right now these invaders barely register our existence. The general shouted. In all the times we have been fighting them, we've drawn blood once. His voice became grim. I don't need to remind you the cost of that victory, the lives sacrificed, the equipment destroyed. That's why you'll all have been brought here. Scientists, engineers, creative thinkers, we need something, anything to make them notice us. Maybe then they'll accept our surrender, stop the slaughter, and leave us the hell alone. You've been assigned groups. Talk to each other and find us something we can use. No ideas will be dismissed. So get to work. The lecture hall broke out into a confused babble as the hundred delegates talked to and sometimes over each other. A few groups headed to the whiteboards that had been prepared, some rapidly filling them with arcane symbols of advanced science, others with seemingly nonsensical words and phrases that nevertheless captured the thoughts of the particular group. As the hours passed, the noise level slowly dropped as each group was forced to discard their theories as they proved unworkable or simply impossible. Eventually, there was a single group still working, their board surrounded by everyone else in attendance, making comments and throwing out suggestions. Their growing excitement and enthusiasm became steadily more pronounced. Sir, I think we have something. The group's spokesman finally called out. We'll need to run some tests, of course, but this theory and design are sound. Well, wild with it. What is your grand idea to save the human race? The general replied, the harshness tinged with the barest beginnings of hope. A virus, sir, but very special virus. We believe that we can make the invaders think that we're, um, uh, cute. The spokesman's embarrassment was palpable. Cute! Cute! The general roared. What good would it be if they think that we are cute? Well, sir, uh, what do you think about cats? End of story. Story number one. A handful of minutes written by Echoing Cascade. In a small station in the middle of nowhere, Crowless, a Mysorian worker, was eating while waiting for his commanding officer. It was his first outing into the station that served as a refueling stop for the ship he now served. Everyone had stayed well out of his way, and he sat down on an empty bench near the exit of a cafeteria. It had struck him as odd that no one else was seated there already, since most of the other available spots were occupied. The same people who had avoided his gaze had started to look at him angrily as he messily began to eat the meal he had brought, but he didn't care. He was a proud Mysorean worker, seven feet tall, reptilian, man with claws that could flay anyone who actually tried to fight him. After finishing eating the rather well-cooked meat on a stick, he was able to leave when something peculiar happened. An Angmorak, four feet tall, grey-skinned and with big black eyes, was floating in front of his feet. What the hell do you want? The Immorak floated closer to the large warrior until he was mere inches from his face. Clean that up. The small grey man pointed at the bench. The Mysorean had expected many things. This was not one of them. 
Before he could say anything, however, his commanding officer had entered the cafeteria. The man was large, even by Mysorean standards, and had a labyrinth of scars on his face. He quickly noticed the strange atmosphere as more people had stopped eating and were moving towards the Mysoreans, holding eating utensils as makeshift weapons. Explain! He had asked for this for his subordinate, but the Imorak answered first. Look! He pointed at the bench. The officer's eyes went wide, and without a word, he backhanded Crowless, who crashed into the wall. The man then took off his cape, knelt down, and asked for some water, as he proceeded to clean the bench with zeal that would have shocked the Crowless, were he still conscious. Crowless woke up in the ship's infirmary. The last thing he remembered was a large fist rapidly getting closer to his face. Then it hit him. Commander Solaris knocked me out. Why? While still confused, he tried to lift himself from the bed when a clawed hand stopped him. It was his commander. Crowless was equal parts panicked and confused. What? Did I do something to displease you, sir? The large Mysoran officer looked at him with a mix of rage and pity. I would like to tell you a story. Crowless nodded, not that he had a lot of options. Sorolus stood over Crowless, who remained flat in his bed. Only three years ago, a scourge incursion happened on that station. Crowless shivered. Scourge, powerful, undead, and relentless. A nightmare to face on the battlefield. Sorolus continued. Tell me how fast you can run from a cafeteria back to our vessel. Crowless was confused, but he was trained to answer when the officer asked the question. I don't know, sir. Two minutes, maybe less. He was a warrior. He was in great shape, so a turnaround speed was expected. Sorolus nodded. Good. Now how long to finish pre-launch procedures? Uh, 30 seconds. Sorolus nodded. Now, how long could you hold a hundred or so scourge infested trying to get through the cafeteria doors into the landing bay? Crowless flexed his claws in fear and contemplation. Oh, I, I don't, uh, I don't know, sir. Sorolus moved closer to his subordinate. Could you hold them long enough for your fellow warriors to run into the ship and launch into the safety of space? Crowless was about to answer when he was cut off. Without weapons, without armor, without claws, without vans. Crowless had felt intimidated by the story until that point. Now he was positively terrified. Well, oh, no, sir. Sorolus moved back, grabbed a nearby chair and sat next to the bed. All sense of irritation gone from his demeanor. He did that. Crowless sat up and looked at his commander. Oh, and why do we not sing of his heroics? A human... An elderly vagrant. Sorolus turned to look at Crowless in the eyes. Keep in mind that this was long before they integrated into galactic society. Humans stuck mostly to themselves at the time, but some became stowaways looking for adventure or a better life elsewhere. Anywhere. This man was a stowaway? Yes, he lived off the unsold food given by the restaurant owners of the station, in exchange for odd jobs. Shall we eld off the ord of scourge for scraps of food? Solaris bolted out of the chair and grabbed Crowless by the neck and lifted him off the bed, one-handed. No! He did it for the respect they showed him! The respect that they continued to show him by keeping the bench he called home after closing hours, free of even a speck's dust! Solaris put him down, not too gently. Crowless understood his mistake, and he felt many things. Chief amongst them, shame. He should have asked for more information before venturing into the station. He had disrespected an honorable warrior who had died in the protection of others. What was his name? I, I need to make a proper amends. Sorinus looked pleased at Crowless, but the look faded into sadness. No one knows his true name, but he had no family. And no record was found by the Terran Alliance when they investigated. Crowless was crestfallen. A hero of that caliber, and no song could be made to honor him. Not without his true name. All we know is that he held the doors closed for over seven minutes. Without weapons. Without armor. Without claws. Without fangs. Without hope of survival. And maybe that is enough.
Krolos got up and looked himself in the mirror. Could I ever do such a thing? He looked at himself and made a vow to be better than this. He lifted his hand to his face, and under his right eye, he carved the number seven with his own claw. Thirty years later, in the middle of Solus in human conflict, as a Terran alliance colony was about to be overrun by an overwhelming number of Solus ships, a small fleet of Mysoran vessels interposed themselves. When the colony asked why they were doing so, as they were not allies or even on amicable terms, the Mysoran fleet commander, a warrior sporting the number seven under his right eye, responded, I stood alone for seven minutes without weapons, without armor, without claws, without fangs. The Mysoran fleet will stand for seven days and seven nights. This marked the turning point in the Mysoran slash human relationship, from barely tolerating one another to fast friends. Cronus, the hero of the twelve day siege of Asheron VI, was immortalized in song, and many young Mysoran, awed by his tale, wondered who the man who stood alone was. They would all eventually make their way into a small refueling station in the outskirts of the Mysoran slash Terran territory, where a bench is kept immaculate to this day. End of story. Story number two. Death Wolves, Not As Bad As You Think, written by Fred Lowe. Beginning playback. Title screen. Death Wolves, Not As Bad As You Think. Title screen fades to show a sweeping shot along the beach of a body of water, before settling on a human wearing tan pants, colorful shirt, and a necklace of flowers. Beautiful, isn't it? Liquid water under the bright and sunny sky. Hello, I'm William Smith. You may remember me from such informational films, such as A Predator's Concern and Coupling. Can you do the do with you-know-who? As most of us know, there are three primary kinds of worlds that commonly sustain life. These designated are paradise worlds, ambivalent worlds, and uh, death worlds. Today, I'm here to discuss the third category, death worlds. Most species have their own classifications for death worlds, depending on the species. Where I am right now, Earth, can range from a class 3 death world to one species declaring Earth as a class 37 death world. To understand the reason why classifications can vary so much due to the inherent dangers the world can expose you to. The fact that we have actual liquid water covering the vast majority of our planet already makes us a death world in the eyes of at least four species. A great many things can cause the classification number to tick upward. The sun bathing the planet with not only visible light, but infrared and ultraviolet light is an issue to some. Poisonous plants, venomous animals, natural predatory beasts still skulking about, and even the fact that prey can be just as dangerous as their predators can scare other species. Atmospheric gases, active volcanoes, tectonic shifts, severe weathers, you name it. If it is cause an issue, it adds to the death world classification. On Earth, here, the biggest threat to almost every species is the gravity. We are rated at an astounding 9.8 meters per second per second. The agreed gravity on most galactic installations is about 2.6 meters per second per second to accommodate the vast majority of known species. That alone makes us a death world to almost everybody. But there are still ways that can be handled. Some species have developed powerful exoskeletons or buoyancy providing environmental suits for short-term use in high gravity worlds, such as ours. The atmosphere itself is a fairly large issue. The atmosphere of Earth is about 78% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, and 0.22% carbon dioxide, and the rest are trace gases. The fact the concentration of oxygen is so low often means supplemental breathing equipment must be included in your travel itinerary if you wish to visit here. Figure fades out and is replaced by videos of some kind of tribal dancing, vast jungles, barren deserts, sprawling cities, and a blue sky with birds of flight. However, a trip to a death world can be enlightening. It allows you to view other cultures, explore vast biomes, amazing architecture, and see the creatures that you may never have known existed. Video switches back to the man now laying in a chair with some kind of drink with a tiny umbrella in it. 
A death world may seem like a scary place on paper, but in reality, if you can work around some of the more uh, pressing issues, it can be quite a nice vacation destination. I hope that you can change your mind about visiting some other places you may never have gone. Join me next time for Pray Not Always Harmless. The man takes a drink as the screen fades to white. The logo that included a facsimile of Earth appears in the words, Brought to you by in part with the Terran Tourism Bureau, before fading to black. End playback. End of story. Story number one. How It's Made, Strike Drones, written by C-SPAN. Today on How It's Made, Falcon Biomechanical Strike Drones, Shoelaces, Vintage Electrical Switches, and Paper Books. Once considered a lesser alternative to human-operated fighters, the Terran Falcon Biomechanical Strike Drone is now the backbone of the human fleet. Formidable fighting machines, even on their own, the real strength of the Falcon is in numbers. Not having to worry about the safety of your fighters allows tacticians to utilize bolder, more aggressive strategies. The assembly process begins with spiders. A worker inserts a carefully calibrated blend of proteins into a tank full of golden or weaving spiders. These spiders have been genetically modified to produce silk many times stronger than their natural counterparts. The spiders eat the protein mixture and almost immediately begin spinning. Several days later, the spiders are transferred into another tank, and a worker collects the webs and a specialized scraping tool. The webs are placed into a machine that shreds them into short, even segments. The shredded webs are then transferred into a vat, where a worker slowly adds a binding agent while raising the temperature. The mixture is stirred throughout the process in order to prevent coagulation. After five hours, the webs and binding agent have been transformed into a composite resin, the resin is a thick and viscous liquid now, but when cooled it transforms into a lightweight material which is stronger than steel. The hot resin is drained through a valve at the bottom of the vat into a tank. From there, high pressure pumps force the resin into various molds, which are then flash cooled in order to harden the resin and prevent bubbles from forming. A worker removes the parts from the mold and carefully trims the excess composite left over by the forming process. The parts are then placed on a conveyor, where the parts are gradually heated and cooled to reduce thermal stress in the composite. Once the molded parts are out of the oven, another work resembles them into a frame for the fighter. The parts are designed to snap together, with no need for adhesion. A skilled worker can assemble a frame in minutes. The worker then carefully places the genetically modified embryo into a special compartment of the frame. The assembled frame is then attached to a wire rack and lowered into a vat with nutrient broth. The exact specifics of the growth of the biomechanical strike drones are highly classified. However, we do know that it does take a month for the process to complete. With the embryo slowly growing over the frame as it extracts nutrients from the surrounding liquid. What emerges from the vat bears little resemblance to what went in. In place of a skeleton-like composite frame is now a sleek and aerodynamic body. A technician carefully checks both the physical structure and genetic makeup of the drone to ensure that the growth process functioned as intended. Acceptable units are sent to the next stage of assembly, while failed units are recycled. The fully grown drone hulls are then transported to another part of the factory. The engines and weapon systems are too mechanically complex to grow and are manufactured with various alloys and ceramics off site. After being transported to the factory, a worker loosely fits them into slots on the hull of the drone. The final component of the strike drone is their brain, despite their name. The brains of the Falcon strike drones are actually derived from crow brains. A 3D printer creates a substrate for the brain to grow on. A worker places a small amount of Cape Crow neurons on the substrate before placing it into an incubator. Over the course of several weeks, the neurons consume and replace the substrate, leaving the exact replica of a crow brain. A worker removes the brain from the incubator and places it in a machine, which inserts electrodes into specific places in the tissue. The worker then attaches a small chip to the electrode mesh. This allows the drone to communicate wirelessly and receive outside commands. A technician then tests the brain for reaction time and stimulus response using the electrode mesh. Now properly prepared, the brains are transported to the waiting drone bodies. A worker places the brain into the counterpart near the center of the drone. 
The drone is once again attached to the wire mesh and lowered into a nutrient vat. This time, however, the drone only stays in the vat for a few hours, long enough for the connections between the body, brain, engines, weapons to properly form. After being removed from the bath, the now-completed drones are subjected to a thorough cleaning and final round of quality control. After leaving the factory, the drones are transported to a combat zone all across the galaxy. They help the Terran military maintain peace, order, and security throughout the galaxy. Story number two, Sharpstick, written by British Tea Company. Prized for their strength and resilience overall, the Sogoth would make a fine additions to the new Empire's motley collection of client races in their civil war with their brothers. Though the unfathomable age and superior technology had left many races eagerly lapping at the back and call of the humans, the Sogoth, as proud as they were strong, had refused to bend the knee so easily. Normally, the humans would forget such a defiant race easily, and leave them to fend for themselves against their much more genocidal brethren. But the ability of the Shogoth's strength and martial history had left them to be desired amongst the new empire. They would play this little game. The Sogoth had a tradition within their culture that violence was the solution to most problems. Now, many would probably argue that a race that thought this way about quite literally any large-scale problem could never make it into space. Though the Shogoth continuously insisted that their most intelligent scientists were likely smart and most importantly good fighters as well when it came to be their time to defend their research and personal honor against any critics to their work. How true this is is anybody's guess, but that of course wasn't the part of the humans cared about. You see, Political issues could be solved with violence, and this included things like who got to run the state. A large-scale war which would leave the Sogoth battered and broken wasn't what the humans wanted. They wanted an army of powerful Xena warriors, and they wanted them now. So, what both parties settled for was an honorable duel. The leaders of both civilizations would have a trial by combat, and if the humans won, the Sogoth would swear allegiance to them. If not... The death of only one legitimate ruler in the imperial throne would probably be terrible, to say the least. President Sakra, like most rulers of the Sogoth, was an apex warrior. Physically imposing at eight feet, and her gigantic lizard strength was matched only by the cunning and tactical guile. Coupled with a charismatic and gun-ho warrior spirit, the former emperor Valreth Shalrock probably would have liked the company of such a creature if only he was human. Given that Valroth had been born from generations of conquerors and warriors and had reapplied to the best gene therapy to himself to mold himself into the perfect warlord, it was no surprise that Sakra would be eager to face the last living heir of such a fighter. Sakra was perhaps a bit let down when he finally saw the new empire's current ruler, Emperor Tia Sharlak wasn't someone that most people wouldn't expect with the only heir of an eight-foot-tall juggernaut from an elder race that predated the evolution of most current species. Where Valroth had been bullish, Tia was quiet. Her lack of impassioned yelling and boasting before the fight had lent most of the believers that she wasn't a fighter. Truth was, she wasn't. There wasn't a single human who was a fighter. Every human was a killer. What's that human holding? A sharp stick? How bad could it be? Flexing his armored gauntlet to a more comfortable position, Balrain Alrak watched this sandy arena as he took his position by his empress. Standing over twelve feet tall, the captain of the Imperial Guard looked more like a small mech more than a flesh and blood being. His aging features gave a confident smile underneath his ornate helmet as two other Imperial Guardsmen arrived to greet the empress outside. As unintimidating as Tia looked by herself, there was a subtle hint of unease in the ranks of the aliens at the way the two juggernauts bowed so low in front of such a tiny creature. Leveling her spear against Sakra before pointing it at the ground, there was a few wows and a few snickers. The human empress was wearing a dress of all things to wear to a fight. Even though powered armor was banned, at least she could have worn anything else besides a goddamned dress. A careful observer would note the ornate nature of the spear, how valuable it looked, but for an emperor with its painstaking attention to detail, one must wonder what arcane secrets went into the creation of such a pretty thing. 
while Rain took a glance at the reaction of the Xenos in the crowd, looking at his empress with a level of confidence one would consider arrogant. He calmly sat back and watched the offspring of Valroth show the creature human metal. Where the Sargoth had naturally strong race, certainly, was Chakra a powerful fighter, easily. Yet, to even the most ordinary human, Sakra's movements appeared in slow motion. What this meant to someone like Sharlak, who could count the passage of time in microseconds, or Balrain, who could count the nanoseconds passing by. Before the eyes of most Xenos could even see what happened, Sakra was bent over, a spear stuck straight in his chest as he looked down in disbelief as Tier moved in a blur. With one powerful hoist, the Emperor sent Sakra's body smashing against the ground, the incredible force of hundreds of thousands of years of gene therapy, and perfection splattered the alien into a broken wreck. To his species' credit, Sakra was still alive. He stared straight at Tier's spear. The crowd watched as it began to glow. A powerful beam shot straight from the tip, reducing the fallen alien into ash. A few of the human onlookers watched with satisfaction as the Xenos pledged loyalty to their new overlord. Others wondered why exactly they even needed them to begin with. End of story. I would quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and Patreons. Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Lord Azrakal, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Dragzoon WRE, Holly's Sister, Arcadian. Thank you very much.